Section thirteen of nineteen sixteen first chapters collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Nineteen sixteen first chapters collection by various. Section thirteen. The Brook Careth, a Syrian story by George Moore it was at the end of a summer evening long after his usual bedtime that joseph sitting on his grandmother's knee heard her tell that kish having lost his asses sent saul his son to seek them in the land of the benjamites and the land of cilicia whither they might have strayed but they were not in these lands son she continued nor in zulp whither saul went afterwards and being then tired out with looking for them he said to the servant we shall do well to forget the asses lest my father should ask what has become of us but the servant being of a mind that kish would not care to see them without the asses said to young saul let us go up into yon city for a great seer lives there and he will be able to put us in the right way to come upon the asses but we have little in our wallet to recompense him saul answered only half a loaf and a little wine at the end of the bottle we have more than that the servant replied and opening his hand he showed a quarter of a shekel of silver to saul who said he will take that in payment whereupon they walked into arimathea casting their eyes about for somebody to direct them to the seer's house and seeing some maidens at the well come to draw water they asked them if the seer had been in the city that day and were answered that he had been seen and would offer sacrifice that morning as had been announced he must be on his way now to the high rock one of the maidens cried after them and they pressed through the people till none was in front of them but an old man walking alone likewise in the direction of the rock and overtaking him they asked if he could point out the seer's house to them to which he answered sharply i am the seer and fell at once to gazing on saul as if he saw in him the one that had been revealed to him for you see son seers have foresight and the seer had been warned overnight that the lord would send a young man to him so the moment he saw saul he knew him to be the one the lord had promised and he said thou art he whom the lord has promised to send me for anointment but more than that i cannot tell thee being on my way to offer sacrifice but afterwards we will eat together and all that has been revealed to me i will tell you understand me son the old woman crooned the lord had been with samuel before times and had promised to send the king of israel to him for anointment and the moment he laid eyes on saul he knew him to be the king and that was why he asked him to eat with him after sacrifice yes granny i understand but did the lord set the asses astray that saul might follow them and come to samuel to be made a king i dare say there was something like that at the bottom of it the old woman answered and continued her story till her knees ached under the boy's weight the child's asleep she said and on the instant he awoke crying no granny i wasn't asleep i heard all you said and would like to be a prophet a prophet joseph and to anoint a king but there are no more prophets or kings in israel and now joseph my little prophet tis bedtime and past it come i didn't say i wanted to anoint kings he answered and refused to go to bed though manifestly he could hardly keep awake i'll wait up for father now what can the child want his father for at this hour she muttered as she went about the room not guessing that he was angry and resentful that her words had wounded him deeply and that he was asking himself in his corner if she thought him too stupid to be a prophet i'll tell thee no more stories she said to him but he answered that he did not want to hear her stories and betwixt feelings of anger and shame his head drooped and he slept in his chair till the door opened and his father's footsteps crossed the threshold now he said to himself granny will tell father that i said i'd like to be a prophet and feigning sleep he listened 
determined to hear the worst that could be said of him but they did not speak about him but of the barrels of salt fish that were to go to beth shemis on the morrow which was their usual talk so he slipped from his chair and bade his father good night a resentful good night it was and his good night to his grandmother was still more resentful but she found an excuse for his rudeness saying that his head was full of sleep a remark that annoyed him considerably and sent him upstairs wishing that women would not talk about things they did not understand i'll ask father in the morning why granny laughed at me for saying i'd like to be a prophet but as morning seemed still a long way ahead he tried to find a reason but could find no better one than that prophets were usually old men but i shall be old in time to come and have a beard father has a beard and they can't tell that i won't have a beard and a white one too so why should they his senses were numbing and he must have fallen asleep soon after for when he awoke it seemed to him that he had been asleep a long time several hours at least so many things had happened or seemed to have happened but as he recovered his mind all the dream happenings melted away and he could remember only his mother she had been dead four years but in his dream she looked as she had always looked and had scolded granny for laughing at him he tried to remember what else she had said but her words faded out of his mind and he fell asleep again in this second sleep an old man rose up by his bedside and told him that he was the prophet samuel who though he had been dead a thousand years had heard him say he would like to be a prophet but shall i be a prophet joseph asked and as samuel did not answer he cried out as loudly as he could shall i shall i what ails thee son he heard his grandmother calling to him and he answered an old man an old man ye are dreaming she mumbled between sleeping and waking go to sleep like a good boy and don't dream any more i will granny and don't be getting up the bedclothes don't want settling i am well tucked in he pleaded and fell asleep praying that granny had not heard him ask samuel if he would be a prophet a memory of his dream of samuel came upon him while she dressed him and he hoped she had forgotten all about it but his father mentioned at breakfast that he had been awakened by cries it was joseph crying out in his dream dan disturbed thee last night such cries shall i shall i and when i asked what ails thee the only answer i got was an old man dan joseph's father wondered why joseph should seem so disheartened and why he should murmur so perfunctorily that he could not remember his dream but if he had forgotten it why trouble him further if we are to forget anything it were well that we should choose our dreams at which piece of incredulity his mother shook her head being firm in the belief that there was much sense in dreams and that they could be interpreted to the advantage of everybody dan said if that be so let him tell thee his dream but joseph hung his head and pushed his plate away and seeing him so morose they left him to his sulks and fell to talking of dreams that had come true joseph had never heard them speak of anything so interesting before and though he suspected that they were making fun of him he could not do else than listen till becoming convinced suddenly that they were talking in good earnest without intention of fooling him he began to regret that he had said he had forgotten his dream and rapped out he was the prophet samuel now what are you saying joseph his father asked joseph would not say any more but it pleased him to observe that neither his father nor his granny laughed at his admission and seeing how interested they were in his dream he said if you want to know all samuel said he had heard me say that i'd like to be a prophet that was why he came back from the dead but father is it true that we are his descendants he said that i was a most extraordinary dream his father answered for it has always been held in the family that we are descended from him do you really mean joseph that the old man you saw in your dream told you he was samuel and that you were his descendant how should i have known if he hadn't told me joseph looked from one to the other and wondered why they had kept the secret of his ancestor from him 
You laughed at me yesterday, Granny, when I said I'd like to be a prophet. Now what do you say? Answer me that. And he continued to look from one to the other for an answer, but neither had the wit to find an answer. So amazed were they at the news that the prophet Samuel had visited Joseph in a dream, and satisfied at the impression he had made, and a little frightened by their silence, Joseph stole out of the room, leaving his parents to place whatever interpretation they pleased on his dream. Nor did he care whether they believed he had spoken the truth. He was more concerned with himself than with them, and conscious that something of great importance had happened to him. He ascended the stairs, pausing at every step, uncertain if he should return to ask for the whole of the story of Saul's anointment. It seemed to him to lack courtesy to return to the room in which he had seen the prophet till he knew these things, but he could not return to ask questions. Later he would learn what had happened to Samuel and Saul, and he entered the room, henceforth to him a sacred room, and stood looking through it, having all the circumstances of his dream well in mind. He was lying on his left side when Samuel had risen up before him, and it was there upon that spot, in that space, he had seen Samuel. His ancestor had seemed to fade away from the waist downwards, but his face was extraordinarily clear in the darkness, and Joseph tried to recall it. But he could only remember it as a face that a spirit might wear, for it was not made up of flesh, but of some glowing matter, or stuff such as glow-worms are made of, nor could he call it ugly or beautiful, for it was not of this world. He had drawn the bedclothes over his head, but, impelled he knew not why, for he was nearly dead with fright, he had poked his head out to see if the face was still there. The lips did not move, but he had heard a voice. The tones were not like any he heard before, but he had listened to them all the same, and if he had not lost his wits again in an excess of fear, he would have put questions to Samuel. He would have put questions if his tongue had not been tied back somewhere in the roof of his mouth. But the next time he would not be frightened and pull the bedclothes over his head. And convinced of his own courage, he lay night after night, thinking of all the great things he would ask the old man, and of the benefit he would derive from his teaching. But Samuel did not appear again, perhaps because the nights were so dark. Joseph was told the moon would become full again, but sleep closed his eyes when he should have been waking, and in the morning he was full of fear that perhaps Samuel had come and gone away, disappointed at not finding him awake. But that could not be for if the prophet had come, he would have awakened him, as he had done before. His ancestor had not come again, a reasonable thing to suppose, for when the dead return to the earth, they do so with much pain and difficulty, and if the living whom they come to instruct cannot keep their eyes open, the poor dead wander back and do not try to come between their descendants and their fate again. But I will keep awake, he said, and resorted to all sorts of devices, keeping up a repetition of a little phrase, he will come to-night when the moon is full, and lying with one leg hanging out of bed, and these proving unavailing, he strewed his bed with crumbs, but no ancestor appeared, and little by little he relinquished hope of ever being able to summon Samuel to his bedside, and accepted as an explanation of his persistent absence that Samuel had performed his duty by coming once to visit him, and would not come again unless some new necessity should arise. It was then that the conviction began to mount into his brain that he must learn all that his grandmother could tell him about Saul and David, and learning from her that they had been a great trouble to Samuel, he resolved never to allow a thought into his mind that the prophet would deem unworthy. To become worthy of his ancestor was now his aim, and when he heard that Samuel was the author of two sacred books, it seemed to him that his education had been neglected, for he had not yet been taught to read. Another step in his advancement was the discovery that the language his father, his granny, and himself spoke was not the language spoken by Samuel, and every day he pressed his grandmother to tell him why the Jews had lost their language in Babylon, till he exhausted the old woman's knowledge, and she said, Well now, son, if you want to hear any more about Babylon, you must 
ask your father, for I have told you all I know. And Joseph waited eagerly for his father to come home and plagued him to tell him a story. But after a long day spent in the counting house, his father was often too tired to take him on his knee and instruct him, for Joseph's curiosity was unceasing and very often wearisome. Now, Joseph, his father said, you will learn more about these things when you are older. And why not now, he asked. And his grandmother answered that it was change of air that he wanted and not books and they began to speak of the fierce summer that had taken the health out of all of them and of how necessary it was for a child of that age to be sent up to the hills dan looked into his son's face and rachel seemed to be right a thin wan little face that the air of the hills will brighten he said and he began at once to make arrangements for joseph's departure for a hill village saying that the pastoral life of the hills would take his mind off samuel hebrew and babylon rachel was doubtful if the shepherds would absorb joseph's mind as completely as his father thought she hoped however that they would as soon as he hears the sound of the pipe his father answered a prophecy this was for while joseph was resting after the fatigue of the journey he was awakened suddenly by a sound he had never heard before and one that interested him strangely his nurse told him that the sound he was hearing was a shepherd's pipe the shepherd plays and the flock follows she said and when may i see the flock coming home with the shepherd he asked to-morrow evening she answered and the time seemed to him to loiter so eager was he to see the flocks returning and to watch the she-goat milked and in the spring as his strength came back he followed the shepherds and heard from them many stories of wolves and dogs and from a shepherd lad whom he had chosen as a companion he acquired knowledge of the plumage and the cries and the habits of birds and whither he was to seek their nests it had become his ambition to possess all the wild bird's eggs one that was easily satisfied till he came to the egg of the cuckoo which he sought in vain hearing of it often now here now there till at last he and the shepherd lad ventured into a dangerous country in search of it and remained there till news of their absence reached magdala and dan set out in great alarm with an armed escort to recover his son he was very angry when he came upon him but the trouble he had been put to and the ransom he had had to pay were very soon forgotten so great was his pleasure at the strong healthy boy he brought back with him and whose first question to rachel was are there cuckoos in magdala father doesn't know his grandmother could not tell him but she was willing to make inquiries but before any news of the egg had been gotten the hope to possess it seemed to have drifted out of joseph's mind and to seem even a little foolish when he looked into his box for many of his eggshells had been broken on the journey see granny he said but on second thoughts he refused to show his chipped possessions but thou wast once as eager to learn hebrew his grandmother said and the chance words spoken as she left the room awakened his suspended interests as soon as she returned she was beset by questions and the same evening his father had to promise that the best scribe in galilee should be engaged to teach him a discussion began between dan and rachel as to the most notable and trustworthy and it was followed by joseph so eagerly that they could not help laughing the questions he put to them regarding the different accomplishments of the scribes were very minute and the phrase but this one is a greek scholar stirred his curiosity why should he be denied me because he knows greek he asked and his father could only answer that no one can learn two languages at the same time but if he knows two languages joseph insisted i cannot tell thee more his father answered than that the scribe i have chosen is a great hebrew scholar he was no doubt a great scholar but he was not the man that joseph wished for thin and tall and of gentle appearance and demeanour he did not stir up a flame for work in joseph who as soon as the novelty of learning hebrew had worn off began to hide himself in the garden his father caught him one day sitting in a convenient bough 
looking down upon his preceptor fairly asleep on a bench and after this adventure he began to make a mocking stock of his preceptor inventing all kinds of cruelties and his truancy became so constant that his father was forced to choose another this time a younger man was chosen but he succeeded with joseph not very much better than the first after the second there came a third and when joseph began to complain of his ignorance his father said well joseph you said you wanted to learn hebrew and you have shown no application and three of the most learned scribes in galilee have been called in to teach you joseph felt the reproof bitterly but he did not know how to answer his father and he was grateful to his grandmother for her answer joseph isn't an idle boy dan but his nature is such that he cannot learn from a man he doesn't like why don't ye give him azariah as an instructor has he been speaking to thee about azariah dan asked maybe she said and dan's face clouded end of chapter thirteen the Brook Careth, A Syrian Story, Chapter 1, by George Moore. Section 14 of 1916, First Chapters Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. 1916 first chapters collection by various section 14 leatherface by baroness orsi prologue mon september 1572 it lacked two hours before the dawn on this sultry night early in september the crescent moon had long ago sunk behind a bank of clouds in the west and not a sound stirred in the low-lying land around the besieged city. To the south the Bouviac fires of Alva's camp had died out one by one, and here the measured tread of the sentinels on their beat alone broke the silence of the night. To the north, where valorous Orange, with a handful of men, undisciplined, unpaid, and rebellious, vainly tried to provoke his powerful foe into a pitched battle, relying on God for the result, there was greater silence still. The sentinels, wearied and indifferent, had dropped to sleep at their post. The troops, already mutinous, only held to their duty by the powerful personality of the prince, slept as soundly as total indifference to the cause for which they were paid to fight could possibly allow. In his tent even Orange, tired out with ceaseless watching, had gone to rest. His guards were in a profound sleep. Then it was that from the south there came a stir, and from Alva's entrenchments waves of something alive that breathed in the darkness of the night were set in motion, like when the sea rolls inward to the shore. Whispered words set this living mass on its way, and anon it was crawling along, swiftly and silently, more silently than incoming waves on a flat shore, on and on, always northward in the direction of the Prince of Orange's camp, like some gigantic snake that creeps with belly close to the ground." Don Ramon, whispered a voice in the darkness, let Captain Romero deal with the sentinels and lead the surprise attack, whilst you yourself make straight for the prince's tent. Overpower his guard first, then seize his person. Two hundred ducats will be your reward, remember, if you bring Orange back here, a prisoner, and a ducat for each of your men. These were the orders, and Don Ramon de Ligné, sped forward with six hundred arquebusiers, all picked men. They wore their shirts over their armor, so that in the melee which was to come they might recognize one another in the gloom. Less than a league of flat pasture-land lay between Alva's entrenchments at St. Florian, near the gates of the beleaguered Mon, and Orange's camp at Ermangier. But at St. Florian men stirred and planned and threatened, whilst at Ermangier even the sentinel slept. Noble-hearted Orange had raised the standard of revolt against the most inexorable oppression of an entire people which the world had ever known, and he could not get more than a handful of patriots to fight for their own freedom against the tyranny and the might of Spain, whilst mercenary troops were left to guard the precious life of the indomitable champion of religious and civil liberties. 
the moving mass of Delignes arquebusiers had covered half a league of the intervening ground. Their white shirts, only just distinguishable in the gloom, made them look like ghosts. Only another half league, less perhaps, separated them from their goal, and still no one stirred in Orange's camp. Then it was that something roused the sentinels from their sleep. A rough hand shook first one then the other by the shoulder, and out of the gloom a peremptory voice whispered hurriedly, Quick! Awake! Sound the alarm! An encampasada is upon you! You will all be murdered in your sleep! And even before the drowsy sentinels had time to rouse themselves or to rub their eyes, the same rough hand had shaken the prince's guard. The same peremptory voice had called, Awake! The Spaniards are upon you! In the prince's tent a faint light was glimmering. He himself was lying fully dressed and armed upon a couch. At the sound of the voice of his guards stirring and of the noise and bustle of awakening camp, he sat up just in time to see a tall figure in the entrance of his tent. The feeble light threw but into a dim relief this tall figure of a man, clad in dark, shapeless woolen clothes, wearing a hood of the same dark stuff over his head and a leather mask over his face. Leatherface exclaimed the prince as he jumped to his feet. "'What is it?' "'A night attack,' replied a muffled voice behind the mask. Six hundred arquebusiers. They are but half a league away. I would have been here sooner, only the night is so infernally dark. I caught my foot in a rabbit hole and nearly broke my ankle. I am as lame as a Jew's horse. But still in time,' he added, as he hastily helped the prince to adjust his armor and straighten out his clothes.' The camp was alive now, with call to arms and rattle of steel, horses snorting and words of command flying to and fro. Don Ramon de Lignier, a quarter of a league away, heard these signs of troops, well on the alert, and knew that the surprise attack had failed. Six hundred arquebusiers, though they be picked men, were not sufficient for a formal attack on the Prince of Orange's entire cavalry. Even mercenary and undisciplined troops will fight valiantly when their lives depend upon their valor. De Lignier thought it best to give the order to return to camp. And the waves of living men, which had been set in motion an hour ago, now swiftly and silently went back the way they came. Don Ramon, when he came once more in the camp at St. Florian and in the presence of Alva's captain-in-chief, had to report the failure of the night attack which had been so admirably planned. The whole camp at Hermenier was astir, he said, as he chawed the ends of his heavy mustache, for he was sorely disappointed. I could not risk an attack under those conditions. Our only chance of winning was by surprise. Who gave the alarm? queried Don Frederic de Toledo, who took no pains to smother the curses that rose to his lips. The devil, I suppose, growled Don Ramon de Lignier, savagely. And out at Hermenier, in Orange's tent, the man who is called Leatherface was preparing to go as quietly and mysteriously as he had come. "'They won't be on you, Monseigneur,' he said, "'now that they know your troops are astir. But if I were you,' he added grimly, "'I would have every one of those sentinels shot at dawn. They were all of them fast asleep when I arrived.' He gave the military salute, and would have turned to go without another word, but that the prince caught him peremptorily by the arm. "'In the meanwhile, Messire,' "'How shall I thank you again?' he asked. "'By guarding your precious life, Monseigneur,' replied the man simply. "'The cause of freedom in the Low Countries would never survive your loss.' "'Well,' retorted the Prince of Orange with a winning smile, "'if that be so, then the cause of our freedom owes as much to you as it does to me. "'Is it the tenth time, or the twelfth, that you have saved my life? "'Since you will not let me fight with you, "'I'll let you do anything you wish, Messire,' for you would be as fine a soldier as you are a loyal friend. But are you not content with the splendid services which you are rendering to us now? Putting aside mine own life, which mayhap is not worthless, how many times has your warning saved mine and my brother's troops from surprise attacks? How many times have Nur Carme or Don Frederick's urgent appeals for reinforcements failed, through your intervention, to reach the Duke of Alva until our own troops were able to rally? Ah, Messire, believe me, God himself has chosen you for this work. The work of a spy, Monseigneur, said the other, not without a touch of bitterness. Nay, if you call yourself a spire, Messire, then shall the name of spy be henceforth a name of glory to its wearer, synonymous with the loftiest patriotism and the noblest self-sacrifice. 
he held out his hand to the man with the mask, who bent his tall figure over in dutiful respect. "'You see how well I keep to my share of the compact, Messire. Never once, even whilst we were alone, hath your name escaped my lips. For which act of graciousness, Monseigneur, I do offer you my humble thanks. May God guard your highness through every peril. The cause of justice and of liberty rests in your hands.' After another deeply respectful bow, he finally turned to go. He had reached the entrance of the tent, when once more the prince spoke to him. "'When shall I see you again, Leatherface?' he asked cheerily. "'When your highness's precious life or the safety of your army are in danger,' replied the man. "'God reward you,' murmured Orange fervently, as the man with the mask disappeared into the night. Book One, Brussels, Chapter One the Blood Council. 1. Less than a month later, and tyranny is once more triumphant. Mons has capitulated. Orange has withdrawn his handful of mutinous troops into Holland. Valenciennes has been destroyed, and Mechlin, beautiful, gracious, august Mechlin, with her cathedrals and her trade halls, her ancient monuments of art and civilization, has been given over for three days to the lust and rapine of Spanish soldiery. Three whole days. E'en now we think on those days and shudder. Shudder at what we know, at what the chroniclers have told us, the sacking of churches, the pillaging of monasteries, the massacre of peaceful, harmless citizens. Three whole days during which the worst demons that infest hell itself, the worst demons that inspire the hideous passions of men, greed, revenge, and cruelty, were let loose upon the stately city whose sole office had been that she had for twenty-four hours harbored Orange and his troops within her gates and closed them against the tyrant's soldiery. Less than a month and Orange is a fugitive, and all the bright hopes for the cause of religious and civil freedom are once more dashed to the ground. It seems as if God himself hath set his face against the holy cause. Mon has fallen, and Mechlin is reduced to ashes, and over across the borders the King of France has caused ten thousand of his subjects to be massacred, one holy day, the Feast of St. Bartholomew, ten thousand of them, just because their religious beliefs did not coincide with his own. The appalling news drove Orange and his small army to flight. He had reckoned on help from the King of France, instead of that promised help the news of the massacre of ten thousand Protestants. Catholic Europe was horror-stricken at the crime committed in the name of religion, but in the Low Countries, Spanish tyranny had scored a victory. The ignoble Duke of Alva triumphed, and the cause of freedom, in Flanders, in Hainault, and Brabant, received a blow from which it did not again recover for over three hundred years. 2. Outwardly the house where the Duke of Alva lodged in Brussels was no different to many of the same size in the city. It was built of red brick, with stone base and finely carved cornice, and had a high slate roof with picturesque dormer windows therein. The windows on the street level were solidly grilled and were ornamented with richly carved pediments, as was the massive doorway, too. The door itself was of heavy oak, and above it there was a beautifully wrought niche which held a statue of the Virgin. On the whole it looked a well-constructed, solid and roomy house, and Mademoiselle de Jassy, its owner, had placed it at the disposal of the lieutenant governor when he first arrived in Brussels, and he had occupied it ever since. The idler, as he strolled past the house, would hardly pause to look at it, if he did not happen to know that behind these brick walls and grilled windows, a work of oppression more heinous than this world had ever known before, was being planned and carried out by a set of cruel and inexorable tyrants against an independent country and a freedom-loving people. Here in the dining hall, the Duke of Alva would preside at the meetings of the Grand Council, the Council of Blood, sitting in a high-backed chair, which had the arms of Spain emblazoned upon it. Juan de Vargas and Alberic de Rio usually sat to the right and left of him. Del Rio, indolent and yielding, a mere tool for the carrying out of every outrage, every infamy which the fiendish brain of those tyrants could devise, wherewith to crush the indomitable spirit of a proud nation, jealous of its honor and of its liberties, and of Varga, Alva's double and worthy lieutenant, no tool he, but a terrible reality, active and resourceful in the invention of new forms of tyranny, new fetters for the curbing of stiff-necked Flemish and Dutch burghers, 
new methods for wringing rivers of gold out of a living stream of tears and blood. De Vargas, the very name stinks in the nostrils of honest men even after the lapse of centuries. It conjures up the hideous image of a human bloodhound, lean and sallow of visage, with drooping, heavy-lidded eyes and a flaccid mouth, a mouth that sneered and jested when men, women, and children were tortured and butchered, eyes that gloated at sight of stake and scaffold and gibbet, and within the inner man a mind intent on the science of murder and rapine and bloodshed. Alva the will that commanded, Vargas the brain that devised, Del Rio the hand that accomplished. Men sent by Philip the Second of Spain, the most fanatical tyrant the world has ever known, to establish the abhorrent methods of the Spanish Inquisition in the Low Countries in order to consolidate Spanish rule there and wrest from prosperous Flanders and Barbant and Hainault, from Holland and the Dutch provinces, enough gold to irrigate the thirsty soil of Spain. The river of gold which will flow from the Netherlands to Madrid shall be a yard deep, so had Alva boasted when his infamous master sent him to quell the revolt which had noble-hearted Orange for its leader, a revolt born of righteous indignation and an inconquerable love of freedom and justice. To mold the Netherlands into abject vassals of Spain, to break their independence of spirit by terrorism and by outrage, to force Spanish ideas, Spanish culture, Spanish manners, Spanish religion upon these people of the North, who loathe tyranny and worship their ancient charters and privileges, that was the task which the Duke of Alva set himself to do, a task for which he needed the help of men as tyrannical and unscrupulous as himself. Granville had begun the work. Alva was completing it. The stake, the scaffold, the gibbet, for all who had one thought of justice, one desire for freedom. Mon raised to the ground, Valenciennes, a heap of ruins and ashes, Mechlin, a hecatomb, men, women, and children outraged and murdered, whole families put to the torture to wring gold from unwilling givers, churches destroyed, monasteries ransacked. That was the work of the Grand Council, the odious Council of Blood, the members of which have put to shame the very name of religion, for they dared to pretend that they acted in its name. Alva, de Vargas, del Rio, a trinity of fiends whose deeds would shame the demons in hell. But there were others, too, and, O oh, ye gods, were they not infinitely more vile, since their hands reeked with blood of their own kith and kin? Alva and his two bloodhounds were strangers in a strange land, owing allegiance to Spain alone. But Councillor Hessels sat on the same infamous board, and he was a patrician of Barbant, and there was Pierre Arsen, president of Artois. There was Berlaymont and Vigloui and Hopper, gentlemen, save the mark, and burghers of Flanders or Hainault or the Dutch provinces. And who can name such creatures without a shudder of loathing? 3. As for Don Ramon de Ligny, he was just the usual type of Spanish soldier, a grandee of Spain, direct descendant of the Cid, so he averred, yet disdained to prove it. For in him there was no sense of chivalry, just personal bravery and no more, the same kind of bravery you would meet in a tiger or in a jaguar. In truth, there was much in common between Don Ramon and the wild feline tribes that devastated the deserts. He had the sinuous movements, the languorous gestures of those creatures, and his eyes, dark and velvety at times, at others almost of an orange tint, had all the cruel glitter which comes into the eyes of the leopard when he is out to kill. Otherwise Don Ramon was a fine-looking man, dark-skinned and dark-eyed, a son of the South, with all those cajoling ways about him which please and so often deceive the women. He it was who had been in command at Mechlin, entrusted by General de Norcarme with the hideous task of destroying the stately city, and he had done it with a will. Overproud of his achievements, he had obtained leave to make personal report of them to the lieutenant governor, and thus it was that on the second day of October, 1572, he was present at the council board, talking with easy grace and no little satisfaction of all that he had done, of churches which he had raised to the ground, the houses which he had sacked, of the men, women, and children whom he had turned out naked and starving into the streets. We labored hard for three days, he said, and the troops worked with a will, 
for there were heavy arrears of pay due to them, and we told them to make up those arrears in Mechlin, since they wouldn't get any money from headquarters. Oh, Mechlin got all that she deserved. Her accursed citizens can now repent at leisure of their haste in harboring Orange and his rebel troops. His voice was deep and mellow, and even the guttural Spanish consonants sounded quite soft when he spoke them. Through half-closed lids his glance swept from time to time over the eager faces around the board, and his slender hands emphasized the hideous narrative with a few graceful gestures. He looked just the true type of grand seigneur telling a tale of mild adventure and of sport, and now and then he laughed, displaying his teeth, sharp and white like the fangs of a leopard's cub. No one interrupted him, and Councillor Hessels fell gradually, as was his wont, into a gentle doze from which he roused himself now and again in order to murmur drowsily, to the gallows with the mole. Figlouis and Hopper and de Berlemont tried hard to repress a shudder. They were slaves of Spain, these gentlemen of the Low Countries, but not Spanish-born, and were not accustomed from earliest childhood to listen, not only unmoved, but with a certain measure of delight, to these tales of horror. But there was nothing in what Don Ramon said of which they disapproved. They were, all of them, loyal subjects of the king, and the very thought of rebellion was abhorrent to them. But it was passing strange that the Duke of Alva made no comment on the young captain's report. There he sat, at the head of the table, silent and moody, with one bony fist clenched above a letter which lay open beneath his hand, and which bore a large red seal with the royal arms of Spain impressed upon it. Not a word of praise or blame did he speak. His heavy brows were contracted in a sullen frown, and his protruding eyes were veiled beneath the drooping lids. De Vargas, too, was silent. De Vargas, who loved to gloat over such tales as Don Ramon had to tell. De Vargas, who believed that these rebellious low countries could only be brought into subjection by such acts of demoniacal outrage as the Spanish soldiery had just perpetrated in Mons and in Mechlin. He, too, appeared moody today, and the story of a sick woman and young children being dragged out of their beds and driven out to perish in the streets while their homes were being pillaged and devastated left him taciturn and unmoved. Don Ramon made vain pretense not to notice the lieutenant governor's moodiness, nor yet de Vargas's silence, but those who knew him best, and de Vargas was among these, plainly saw that irritation had seized upon his nerves. He was talking more volubly, and his voice had lost its smoothness, whilst the languor of his gestures had given place to sharp, febrile movements of hands and shoulders which he tried vainly to disguise. Our soldiers, he was saying loudly, did not leave a loaf of bread in the bakeries or a bushel of wheat in the stores of Mechlin. The rich citizens we hanged at a rate of twenty a day, and I drew orders for the confiscation of their estates to the benefit of our most gracious king and Caesarian lord. I tell you, we made quick work of all the rebels. Stone no longer stands on stone in Mechlin today. Its patricians are beggars, its citizens are scattered. We have put to the torture and burned at the stake those who refused to give us their all. A month ago Mechlin was a prosperous city. She gave of her wealth and of her hospitality to the rebel troops of Orange. Today she and her children have ceased to be. Are you not satisfied? He brought his clenched fist crashing down upon the table, surely a very unusual loss of restraint in a grandee of Spain, but obviously he found it more and more difficult to keep his temper under control and those dark eyes of his were now fixed with a kind of fierce resentment upon the impassive face of the duke. Councillor Hessels, only half awake, reiterated with drowsy emphasis, to the gallows with them. Send them all to the gallows. Still the duke of Alva was silent, and de Vargas did not speak. Yet it was the duke himself who had given the order for the destruction of Mechlin, as a warning to other cities, he had said. And now he sat at the head of the table, sullen, moody and frowning, and Don Ramon felt an icy pang of fear gripping him by the throat. The thought that censure of his conduct was brewing in the lieutenant governor's mind caused him to lose the last vestige of self-control, for he knew that censure could have but one sequel, quick judgment and the headman's axe. "'Are you not satisfied?' he cried hoarsely. "'What more did you expect? What more ought we to have done? What other proof of zeal does King Philip ask of me?' Thus directly challenged, the duke raised his head and looked the young man sternly in the face. 
"'What you have done, Messiah,' he said slowly, and the cold glitter in his steely eyes held it in more real and calculating cruelty than the feline savagery of the other men. "'What you have done is good, but it is not enough. What use is there in laying low an entire city, when the one man whose personality holds the whole of this abominable rebellion together still remains unscathed?' "'You hanged twenty noted citizens a day in Mechlin, you say,' he added, with a cynical shrug of his shoulders. I would gladly see every one of them spared, so long as Orange's head fell on the scaffold. Orange has disbanded his army and has fled almost alone into Holland, said Don Ramon sullenly. My orders were to punish Mechlin and not to run after the Prince of Orange. The order to bring the Prince of Orange alive or dead to Brussels and to me takes precedence of every other order, as you well know, Messire, retorted Alva roughly. We decided on that unanimously at the meeting of the Grand Council on the day that I sent Egmont and Horn to the scaffolds and Orange refused to walk into the trap which I had set for him. He always escapes from traps which are set before him, now broke in de Vargas in his calm, even expressionless voice. During the siege of Mon, according to Don Frederick's report, no fewer than six surprise night attacks, all admirably planned, failed because Orange appeared to have received timely warning. "'Who should know that better than I, senor?' queried Don Ramon, hotly. "'Seeing that I led most of those attacks myself. "'They were splendidly planned, our men as silent as ghosts, the night darker than hell. "'Not a word of the plan was breathed until I gave the order to start. "'Yet someone gave the alarm. "'We found Orange's camp astir every time we had to retire. "'Who but the devil could have given the warning?' "'A spy more astute than yourselves,' quoth Alva dryly. Nay, here interposed del Rio blandly, I am of the same opinion as Don Ramon de Nunez. There is a subtle agency at work which appears to guard the life of the Prince of Orange. I myself was foiled many a time when I was on his track, with Ribiras, who wields a dagger in the dark more deftly than any man I know. I also employed Lorenzo, who graduated in Venice in the art of poisons, but invariably the prince slipped through our fingers, just as if he had been put on his guard by some mysterious emissary. The loyalists in Flanders, quoth President Viguerie under his breath, declare that the agency which works for the safety of the Prince of Orange is a supernatural one. They speak of a tall, man-like figure whose face is hidden by a mask, and who invariably appears whenever the Prince of Orange's life is in danger. Some people call this mysterious being Leatherface, but no one seems actually to have seen him. It sounds as if he were truly an emissary of the devil. And as the president spoke, a strange silence fell around the council board. Every cheek had become pale, every lip quivered. De Vargas made a quick sign of the cross over his chest. Alva drew a small medal from the inside of his doublet and kissed it devoutly. These men who talked airily of rapine and of violence perpetrated against innocent people— who gloated over torture and misery, which they loved to inflict, were held in the cold grip of superstitious fear, and their trembling lips uttered abject prayers for mercy to the God whom they outraged by every act of their infamous lives. 4. When the Duke of Alva spoke again, his voice was still unsteady. Devil or no devil, he said with an attempt at dignified composure, his majesty's latest orders are quite peremptory. He desires the death of Orange. He will have no more cities destroyed, and no more wholesale massacres, until that great object is attained. Pressure has been brought to bear upon him. The emperor, it seems, has spoken authoritatively and with no uncertain voice. It seems that the destruction of Flemish cities is abhorrent to the rest of Europe. Rebel cities, ejaculated de Berlaymont hotly. Aye, we know well enough that they are rebel cities, quoth Alva fiercely. But what can we do? when a milk-livered weakling wears the imperial crown. Our gracious king himself dares not disregard the emperor's protests, and in his last letter to me he commands that we should hold our hand and neither massacre a population nor destroy a town unless we have proof positive that both are seething with rebellion. Seething with rebellion, exclaimed Don Ramon. Then what of Ghent, which is a very nest of rebels? Ah, retorted Alva, Ghent by the mass, Seniors, all of you who know that accursed city, bring me proof that she harbors Orange or his troops. Bring me proof that she gives him money. 
bring me proof that plots against our government are hatched within her walls. I have moral proofs that Orange has been in Ghent lately, that he is levying troops within her very walls. I know that he has received promises of support from some of her most influential citizens. Nay, then, let your highness but give the order, broke in Don Ramon once more. My soldiers would spend three fruitful days in Ghent. As I pointed out to his highness yesterday, rejoined de Vargas, in mellifluous tones, we should reduce Ghent to ashes before she hatches further mischief against us. Once a city hath ceased to be, it can no longer be a source of danger to the state. And, he added blandly, there is more money in Ghent than in any other city of Flanders. And more rebellion in one family there than in the whole population of Brabant, assented Councillor Arsens. I have lived in that accursed city all my life, he continued savagely, and I say that Ghent ought not to be allowed to exist a day longer than is necessary for massing together two or three regiments of unpaid soldiery and turning them loose into the town, just as we did in Mechlin. The others nodded approval. And by the mass, resumed Don Ramon. Enough, Messire, broke in the Duke peremptorily. Who are you, I pray? Who are you all to be thus discussing the orders of His Majesty the King? I have transmitted to you His Majesty's orders just as I received them from Madrid yesterday. It is for you, for us all, to show our zeal and devotion at this critical moment in our nation's history, by obeying blindly, wholeheartedly, those gracious commands. Do we want our king to be further embarrassed by a quarrel with the emperor? And what are those orders, I ask you? Wise and Christian-like, as usual. His Majesty doth not forbid the punishment of rebel cities. No, all he asks is that we deliver Orange unto him, Orange, the arch-traitor, and that in future we prove conclusively to Europe and to Maximilian that when we punish a Flemish city, we do so with unquestioned justice. He paused, and his prominent, heavy-lidded eyes wandered somewhat contemptuously on the sullen faces around the board. Proof, senors, he said, with a light shrug of the shoulders. Proofs are not difficult to obtain. All you want is a good friend inside the city to keep you well informed. The paid spy is not sufficient. Oft times he is clumsy and himself an object of suspicion. Orange has been in Ghent, seniors. He will go again. He has disbanded his army, but at his call another will spring up. In Ghent, mayhap, where he has so many friends, where money is plentiful and rebellion rife. We must strike at Ghent before she becomes an open menace. You'll never strike at Orange, broke in Councillor Arsens obstinately, while that creature Leatherface is at large. He is said to hail from Ghent, added Viglui, with conviction. Then by the mass, seniors, interposed Alva fiercely, the matter is even more simple than I had supposed, and all this talk and these murmuring savor of treason, meseems. Are you fools and dolts to imagine that when His Majesty's orders were known to me, I did not at once set at work to fulfill them? We want to strike at Ghent, seniors, and want proofs of her rebellion. His Majesty wants those proofs, and he wants the death of Orange. We all desire to raise Ghent to the ground. Then will you give me your close attention, and I will e'en tell you of my plans for attaining all these objects and earning the approval of our gracious king and recognition from the rest of Europe. Then should not Don Ramon de Ligny retire? questioned President Vigli. Surely his highness's decision can only be disclosed to members of his council. Let Don Ramon stay, interposed de Vargas, with unanswerable authority, even as the young man was preparing to take his leave. The matter is one that in a measure will concern him, seeing that it involves the destinies of the city of Ghent, and that his highness is pleased to give him the command of our troops stationed in that city. 5. Don Ramon de Ligny glanced up at Vargas with a look of agreeable surprise. The command of the troops in Ghent. Of a truth, this was news to him, and happy news indeed. Rumor was current that the Duke of Alva, lieutenant governor of the Low Countries and captain general of the forces, was about to visit Ghent, and the captain in command there would thus be in a position of doing useful work, mayhap of rendering valuable services, and in any case of being well before the eyes of the captain general. All the young man's elegant, languid manner had come back to him. He had had a fright, but nothing more, and commendation, in the shape of this important promotion, had allayed all his fears. 
his being allowed to be present at a deliberation of the grand council was also a signal mark of favor granted to him no doubt in recognition of his zeal and loyalty whilst destroying the noble city of mechlin for the glory of king philip of spain he now resumed his seat at the board selecting with becoming modesty a place at the bottom of the table and feeling not the least disconcerted by the wrathful envious looks which president Viglui and one or two other netherlanders directed against him the plan seigneurs which i have in my mind resumed the duke after a slight pause could never have come to maturity but for the loyal cooperation of seigneur juan de vargas and of his equally loyal daughter let me explain he continued seeing the look of astonishment which spread over most of the faces around the board it is necessary in view of all that we have said just now that i should have a means a tool i might say for the working out of a project which has both the death of orange and the punishment of ghent for its aim i have told you that i am morally certain that orange is operating in ghent at the present moment is it likely that he would leave such a storehouse of wealth and rebellion untouched heresy is rampant in ghent and treachery goes hand in hand with it our spies unfortunately have been unable to obtain very reliable information the inhabitants are astute and wary they hatch their plots with devilish cunning and secrecy obviously therefore what we want is a loyal worker an efficient and devoted servant of the king in the very heart of the civic life of the town if only we can get to know what goes on in the intimate family circles of those townsfolk i feel sure that we shall get all the proofs that the king desires of the treachery of ghent he paused for a moment in order to draw breath absolute silence the silence of tense expectation hung around the council board the netherlanders hung obsequiously on the tyrant's lips del rio leaned back in his chair seemingly indifferent and de vargas was closely watching don ramon de ligny the young man who was trying to appear calmly interested but the restless look in his eyes and a slight tremor of his hand betrayed inward agitation some of you revered seigneurs continued the duke of alva after a while in powerful compelling tones will perhaps have guessed by now what connection there is in my mind between that vast project which i have just put before you and the daughter of my loyal coadjutor don juan de vargas i have arranged that she shall marry a man of influence and position in ghent so that she can not only keep me informed of all the intrigues which are brewing in that city against the government of our gracious king but also become the means whereby we can lure orange to his doom capture that mysterious leatherface and then deliver ghent over to don ramon's soldiery he struck the table repeatedly with his fist as he spoke there was no doubting the power of the man to accomplish what he wanted as well as the cruelty and vindictiveness wherewith he would pursue any one who dared to attempt to thwart him in his projects no one thought of interrupting him don ramon kept his agitation under control as best he could for he felt that de vargas's eyes still watched him closely a very admirable idea now murmured Viglieu obsequiously as usual on these occasions it was obvious that he and the other netherlanders were mere figureheads at the council board alva was directing planning commanding de vargas had been the confidant and del rio would always be the ready tool when needed but viglier de berlimont hessels and the others were mere servile listeners ready to give the approbation which was expected of them and withholding every word of criticism six and doth donna lenora de vargas enter into all these far-reaching schemes now asked don ramon coldly Meseems they are above a woman's comprehension. De Vargas's persistent glance was irritating his nerves. He threw a challenging look, wholly defiant, across the table at the older man. My daughter, Messire, said the latter loftily, is above all a true Spaniard. She has been brought up to obey and not to discuss. She is old enough now to forget all past youthful follies, he added, answering Don Ramon's defiant glance with one that conveyed a threat her devotion to her church her king and her country and her hatred of orange and all rebels will influence her actions in the way the lieutenant governor desires don ramon was silent he had understood the threat which de vargas's glance had expressed and he knew what the other meant when he spoke of past youthful follies it meant the breaking off of a pleasing romance a farewell to many an ambitious dream don ramon suppressed a sigh of anger and of disappointment Donna Lenora de Vargas was beautiful and wealthy. 
but it were not wise to let her father see how hard he, Ramon, had been hit. He took no further part in the discussion, and after a while he succeeded in appearing wholly indifferent to its sentimental side. But he listened attentively to all that was said, and when he met de Vargas's glance, which now and then was fixed mockingly upon him, he answered it with a careless shrug of his shoulders. And now, rejoined Pierre Arsens, who was president of Artois and a patrician of Hainault, may we ask if his highness has already chosen the happy man who is to become the husband of such a pattern of womanhood? My choice has naturally fallen on the son of Minheer Charles van Rick, the high bailiff of Ghent, replied Alva curtly. A family of traitors, if ever there was one, growled Alberic del Rio savagely. I know them. The father is all right. So is the younger son, Mark. Younger, I believe, by only a couple of hours. A wastrel and something of a drunkard, so I understand. But the mother and the other son are impudent adherents of Orange. They have more than once drawn the attention of the chief inquisitor on themselves, and if I had my way with such cattle... I would have had the men hanged and the women burned long before this. Van Rick, said Alva coolly, is high bailiff of Ghent. He is a good Catholic, and so is his wife. He is a man of great consideration in the city, and his sons are popular. It has not been thought expedient to interfere with them up till now. But, bearing my schemes in mind, I have caused the man to be severely warned once or twice. These warnings have reduced him to a state of panic, and lately, when my scheme had matured, I told him that my desire was that one of his sons should wend Don Juan de Vargas's daughter. He had no thought of refusal. In fact, his acceptance was positively abject. And on what grounds was the marriage suggested to him? questioned President Arsens. Grounds, Messire, retorted the Duke. We give no grounds or reasons for our commands to our Flemish subjects. We give an order and they obey. I told Minheer van Rick that I desired the marriage, and that was enough. Then, interposed President Viglui, with an attempt at jocularity, we shall soon be able to congratulate two young people on a happy event. You will be able to do that tomorrow, Messire, quoth the Duke. Signor de Vargas goes to Ghent for the purpose of affiancing the two young people together. The marriage ceremony will take place within the week. His Majesty hath approved of my scheme. He desires that we should expedite the marriage. Signor de Vargas is willing. Messer de Reich would not think of objecting. Don Lenora is heart-free. Why should we delay? Why, indeed, murmured Don Ramon under his breath. Donna Lenora, resumed Alva sententiously, is indeed lucky in that, unlike most women, she will be able to work personally for the glory of her king and country, if through her instrumentality we can bring Orange to the block and Ghent to her knees, there is no favor which her father could not ask of us. As he said this, he turned to de Vargas and stretched out his hand to him. De Vargas took the hand respectfully and bent over it in dutiful obedience. Now, signors, resumed the duke more gaily, and once more addressing the full council board, you know the full reason of my projected journey to Ghent. I go up sensibly in order to inaugurate the statue of our sovereign king erected by my orders in the marketplace, but also in order to ascertain how our loyal worker will have progressed in that time. Donna Lenora de Vargas will have been the wife of Messire van Rijk for over a cent night by then. She will, and I mistake not, have much to tell us. In the meanwhile, Signor de Vargas will take up his residence in the city as vicarious criminalis, he will begin his functions tomorrow by presiding over the engagement of his daughter to the son of the high bailiff. There will be much public rejoicing and many entertainments during the week, and on the day of the wedding ceremony. To these, signors, you are graciously bidden. I pray you go and mingle as far as you can with the crowd of uncouth and vulgar burghers, whose treachery seems to pierce even through their ill-fitting doublets. I pray you also to keep your eyes and ears open. If my conjectures are correct, much goes on in Ghent of which the Holy Inquisition should have cognizance. We are out on a special campaign against cunning traitors, and Ghent is our first objective. When we turn our soldiery loose into the city, yours, signors, will be the first spoils. Ghent is rich in treasure and money. Those first spoils will be worth winning. Until that happy day, I bid you au revoir, gentle sirs, and let your toast be at every banquet. To the destruction of Ghent, and to the death of Orange. 
after which long peroration the lieutenant governor intimated with a casual wave of his beringed hand that the sitting of the grand council was at an end the illustrious councillors rose with alacrity they were now in rare good humour the parting speech of his highness tickled their cupidity the first spoils at the sacking of ghent should mean a fortune for every member of the board general de norcarme had made a huge one at the sacking of mons and even younger officers like don ramon de ligny had vastly enriched themselves when mechlin was given over to the soldiers one by one now the grave seigneurs withdrew having taken respectful leave of his highness to the salute of the netherlanders of vigli and hessels of berlaymont and the others the duke responded with a curt bow to de vargas and del rio and also to don ramon he nodded with easy familiarity however obsequious the netherlanders might be however proven their zeal their spanish masters never allowed them to forget that there was a world of social distinction between a grandee of spain and the uncouth burghers and even patricians of this semi-civilized land seven having made his last obeisance before the duke of alva and taken leave of the grave seigneurs of the grand council don ramon de ligny bowed himself out of the room with all the ceremony which spanish etiquette prescribed as he did so he noticed that at a significant sign from alva de vargas and alberic del rio remained behind in the council chamber even while all the netherlanders were being dismissed he watched these latter gentlemen as one by one they filed quickly out of the house loath even to exchange a few friendly words with one another on the doorstep in this place where every wall had ears and every nook and cranny concealed a spy he watched them with an air of supercilious contempt oblivious of the fact that he himself had been not a little scared by the black looks cast on him by the all-powerful tyrant and merciless autocrat the scare had been unpleasant but it was all over now fate that ever fickle jade seemed inclined to smile on him the penniless scion of a noble race he seemed at last on the high road to fortune the command of the troops in ghent was an unexpected gift of the goddess whilst the sacking and looting of mechlin had amply filled his pockets but it was a pity about donna lenora don ramon paused in the vast panelled hall and instinctively his eyes wandered to the mirror framed in rich flemish carved wood which hung upon the wall by our lady he had well-nigh lost his self-control just now under de vargas's mocking gaze and also that air of high breeding and sang-froid which became him so well the thought of donna lenora even in connection with her approaching marriage caused him to readjust the set of his doublet and the stiff folds of his ruffle and his well-shaped hand wandered lovingly up to his silky moustache a sound immediately behind him caused him to start and turn an elderly woman wrapped in a dark shawl and wearing a black veil right over her face and head was standing close to his elbow inez he exclaimed what is it yes, i beg of you senor whispered the woman i am well nigh dead with terror at thought that i might be seen the senorita knew that you would be here to-day she saw you from the gallery above and sent me down to ask you to come to her at once the senorita broke in don ramon impatiently and with a puzzled frown is she here? Senor de Vargas won't let her out of his sight now. When he hath audience of the lieutenant governor or business with the council, he makes the senorita come with him. The Duke of Alva hath given her a room in this house, where she can sit while her father is at the council. By heavens above, why all this mystery? The senorita will tell your graciousness, said the woman. I beg of you to come at once. If I stay longer down here, I shall die of fright. And like a scared hen, old inez trotted across the hall without waiting to see if don ramon followed her the young man seemed to hesitate for a moment the call was a peremptory one coming as it did from a beautiful woman whom he loved at the same time all that he had heard in the council chamber was a warning to him to keep out of de vargas's way the latter if inez spoke the truth was keeping his daughter almost a prisoner and it was never good at any time to run counter to senor de vargas the house was very still the netherlanders had all gone two serving men appeared to be asleep on the porch otherwise there came no sign of life from any part of the building the heavy oak doors which gave on the anteroom of the council chamber effectually deadened every sound which might have come from there don ramon smiled to himself and shrugged his shoulders after all he was a fool to be so easily scared a beautiful woman beckoned 
and he had not been forbidden to see her, so, after that one brief moment of hesitation, he turned to follow Inez up the stairs. The woman led the way round the gallery, then up another flight of stairs along a narrow corridor, till she came to a low door beside which she stopped. "'Go in, I pray you, senor,' she said. "'The senorita expects you.' The young man walked unannounced into the small room beyond. There came a little cry of happy surprise out of the recess of a wide dormer window, and the next moment Don Ramon held Lenora de Vargas in his arms. 8. Lenora, with the golden hair and the dark velvety eyes, thus do the chroniclers of the time speak of her, notably the Sierra de Varnwick, who knew her intimately. Thus, too, did Velasquez paint her, a few years after these notable events, all in white, for she seldom wore colored gowns, very stately, with the small head slightly thrown back, the fringe of dark lashes veiling the luster of her luminous eyes. But just at this moment there was no stateliness about Donna Lenora. She clung to Don Ramon, just like a loving child that had been rather scared and knows where to find protection, and he accepted her caresses with an easy, somewhat supercilious air of condescension. The child was so pretty and so very much in love. He patted her hair with gentle, soothing gesture and thanked kind fate for this pleasing gift of a beautiful woman's love. "'I did not know that you were in Brussels,' he said after a while, and when he had led her to a seat in the window and sat down beside her. "'All this while I thought you were still in Segovia.' His glance was searching hers, and his vanity was pleasantly stirred by the fact that she was pale and thin, and that those wonderful, luminous eyes of hers looked as if they had shed many tears of late. "'Ramon,' she whispered, "'you know.' "'The Duke of Alva,' he replied dryly, "'gave me official information.' Then, seeing that she remained silent and dejected, he added peremptorily, "'Lenora, how long is it since you have known of this proposed marriage?' "'Only three days,' she replied tonelessly. "'My father sent for me about a month ago. The Duchess of Medina Collier was coming over to the Netherlands on a visit to her lord, and I was told that I must accompany her.' We started from Laredo in the Esperanza on the 10th of last month, and we landed at Flushing a week ago. Oh, at first I was so happy to come. It is nine months and more since you left Spain, and my heart was aching for a sight of you. Then, when did you first hear? Three days since, when we arrived in Brussels, the Duchess herself took me to my father's house, and then he told me that he had bade me come because the lieutenant governor had arranged a marriage for me, with another lender. Don Ramon muttered an angry oath. Did he, your father, I mean, never hint at it before, he asked. Never. A month ago he still spoke of you in his letters to me. Had you no suspicions, Ramon? None, he replied. It was he, of course, who obtained for you that command under Don Frederick, who took you out of Spain. It was a fine position, and I accepted it gladly and unsuspectingly. It must have been the beginning. He wanted you out of my way already then, though he went on pretending all this while that he favored your attentions to me. He thought that I would soon forget you. How little he knows me. And now he has forbidden me to think of you again. Since I am in Brussels, he hardly lets me out of his sight. He only leaves the house in order to attend on the Duke, and when he does, he brings me here with him. Inis and I are sent up to this room, and I am virtually a prisoner." It all seems like an ugly dream, Lenora, he murmured sullenly. Aye, an ugly dream, she sighed. Oft times since my father told me this awful thing, I have thought that it could not be true. God would not allow anything so monstrous and so wicked. I thought that I must be dreaming, and must presently wake up and find myself in the dear old convent at Segovia, with your farewell letter to me under my pillow. She was gazing straight out before her, not at him, for she felt that if she looked on him, all her fortitude would give way and she would cry like a child. This she would not do, for her woman's instinct had already told her that all the courage in this terrible emergency must come from her. He sat there, moody and taciturn, all the while that she longed for him to take her in his arms and to swear to her that never would he give her up, never would he allow reasons of state to come between him and his love. There are political reasons, it seems, she continued, and the utter wretchedness and hopelessness with which she spoke were a pathetic contrast to his own mere sullen resentment. My father has not condescended to say much. He sent for me, and I came. 
as soon as i arrived in brussels he told me that i must no longer think of you that childish folly he said must now come to an end then he advised me that the lieutenant governor had arranged a marriage for me with the son of messire von rick high bailiff of ghent that we were to be affianced to-morrow and married within the week i cried i implored i knelt to my father and begged him not to break my heart my life i told him that to part me from you was to condemn me to worse than death well and he queried you know my father ramon she said with a slight shudder almost as well as i do do you believe that any tears would move him he made no reply indeed what could he say he did know that juan de vargas knew that such a man would sacrifice without pity or remorse everything that stood in the way of his schemes or his ambition i was not even told that you would be in brussels to-day inez only heard of it through the duke of alva's serving men then she and i watched for you because i felt that i must at least be the first to tell you the awful awful news oh she exclaimed with sudden vehemence the misery of it all ramon can you not think of something can you not think are we going to be parted like this as if our love had never been as if our love were not sweet and sacred and holy the blessing of god which no man should have the power to take away from us she was on the point of breaking down and don ramon with one ear alert to every sound outside had much ado to soothe and calm her this he tried to do for selfish as he was he loved this beautiful woman with that passionate if shallow ardour which is characteristic in men of his temperament lenora he said after a while it is impossible for me to say anything for the moment fate and your father's cruelty have dealt me a blow which has half stunned me as you say i must think i am not going to give up hope quite as readily as your father seems to think by our lady i am not just an old glove that can be so lightly cast aside i must think i must devise but in the meanwhile he paused and something of that same look of fear came into his eyes which had been there when in the council chamber he had dreaded the duke of alva's censure in the meanwhile my sweet he added hastily you must pretend to obey you cannot openly defy your father nor yet the duke of alva you know them both they are men who know neither pity nor mercy your father would punish you if you disobeyed him he has the means of compelling you to obey but the duke's wrath would fall with deathly violence upon me you know as well as i do that he would sacrifice me ruthlessly if he felt that i was likely to interfere with any of his projects and your marriage with the netherlander is part of one of his vast schemes the look of terror became more marked upon his face his dark skin had become almost livid in hue and lenora clung to him trembling for she knew that everything he said was true they were like two birds caught in the net of a remorseless fowler to struggle for freedom were worse than useless de vargas was a man who had attained supreme power beside the most absolute tyrant the world had ever known every human being around him even his only child was a mere pawn in his hands for the great political game in which the duke of alva was the chief player a mere tool for the fashioning of that monstrous chain which was destined to bind the low countries to the chariot wheels of spain a useless tool a superfluous pawn he would throw away without a pang of remorse this don ramon knew and so did lenora but in ramon that knowledge reigned supreme and went hand in hand with terror whilst in the young girl there was all the desire to defy that knowledge and to make a supreme fight for love and happiness i must not stay any longer now my sweet he said after a while if your father has so absolutely forbidden you to see me then i have tarried here too long already he rose and gently disengaged himself from the tender hands which clung so pathetically to him i cannot let you go ramon she implored it seems as if you were going right out of my life and that my life would go with you if you went sweetheart he said a little impatiently it is dangerous for me to stay a moment longer try and be brave i'll not say farewell we'll meet again how let inez be at the corner of the broodhuis this evening i'll give her a letter for you in the meanwhile i shall have seen your father who knows his decision may not be irrevocable after all you are the one being in the world he has to love and care for he cannot wilfully break your heart and destroy your happiness she shook her head dejectedly but the next moment she looked up trying to seem hopeful 
she believed that he suffered just as acutely as she did and womanlike did not want to add to his sorrow by letting him guess too much of her own she contrived to keep back her tears she had shed so many of late that their wellspring had mayhap run dry he folded her in his arms for she was exquisitely beautiful and he really loved her marriage with her would have been both blissful and advantageous and his pride was sorely wounded at the casual treatment meted out to him by de vargas at the same time the thought of defiance never once entered his head for defiance could only end in death and don ramon felt quite sure that even if he lost his beautiful fiancee life still held many compensations for him in the future therefore he was able to part from lenora with a light heart whilst hers was overweighted with sorrow he kissed her eyes her hair her lips and murmured protestations of deathless love which only enhanced her grief and inflamed all that selfless ardour of which her passionate nature was capable never had she loved don ramon de ligne as she loved him at this hour of parting never perhaps would she love as fondly again and he with a last tender kiss airily bade her to be brave and trustful and finally waved her a cheery farewell End of section 14. Leatherface by Baroness Orsi. Section 15 of 1916 First Chapters Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1916 First Chapters Collection by Various, Section 15, Tasker Jevons, The Real Story by May Sinclair. Chapter 1 Of course this story can't be published as it stands just yet, not if I'm to be decent for another generation, because, thank heaven, they're still alive. They've had me there, as they've always had me everywhere. How they managed it, I can't think. I don't mean merely at the end, though that was stupendous, but how they ever managed it. It seems to me they must have taken all the risks, always. I suppose if you asked him, he'd say, that's how. It was certainly the way they managed the business of living, Perhaps it's why they managed it on the whole so well. I remember how when I was shilly-shallying about that last job of mine, he said, Take it, take it. If you can risk living at all, my dear fellow, you can risk that. And he added, If I'd only your luck. Well, that's exactly what he did have. He had my luck. I mean, the luck I ought to have had all the time, from the beginning to the very end. But there is one thing he can't take from me, and that is the telling of this story. He can hold it up as long as he lives, as long as she lives, as he has held up pretty nearly everything where I was concerned. But he can't take it from me. He doesn't want it. Even he, with his infernal talent, couldn't do anything with it. Unscrupulous as he was, and I assure you he'd stick at nothing, he'd take his mother's last agony if he wanted it badly enough. Indecent as he was, he'd stick at that. I don't mean he couldn't take his wife, part of her, anyhow, at a pinch, and I don't mean he couldn't take himself, his own emotions, his own eccentricities if he happened to want them, and his own meannesses if nobody else's, so to speak, would do. But he couldn't and wouldn't take his own big things, particularly not that last thing. When I say that I can't publish this story yet as it stands, I'm not forgetting that I have published the end of it already, but only in the way of business. To publish that sort of thing was what I went out for. It was all part of my special correspondence job. And when you think that it was just touch and go, why, if I hadn't bucked up and taken that job when he told me to, I might have missed him. No amount of hearing about him would have been the same thing. I had to see him. What I wrote then doesn't count. I had to tell what I saw just after I had seen it. I had to take it as I saw it, a fragment snapped off from the rest of him and dated October eleventh, 1914, as if it didn't belong to him, as if he were only another splendid instance 
and of course i had to leave her out told like that it didn't amount to much this is the real telling i must get away from the end right back to the beginning i suppose to be accurate the very beginning was the day i first met him in nineteen six no nineteen five it must have been it was at blackheath football ground the last match of the season when woolrich arsenal played east kent and beat them by two goals and a try he was there as a representative of the press doing the match for some sporting paper he held me up at the barrier yes he held me up in the first moment of our acquaintance while he fumbled for his pass he had given the word press with an exaggerated aplomb that showed he was young to his job and the gatekeeper challenged him it was in fact the exquisite self-consciousness of the little man that made me look at him and he caught me looking at him he blushed caught himself blushing and smiled to himself with the most delicious appreciation of his own absurdity and as he stood there fumbling and holding me up while he argued with the gatekeeper who didn't know him i got his engaging twinkle it was as if he looked at me and said see me swank just then funny wasn't it he hung about on the edge of the crowd for a while with his hands in his pockets sucking his little blonde moustache and looking dreamy and rather incompetent i was a full-blown journalist even then and i remember feeling a sort of pity for his youth he was so obviously on his maiden trip and obviously i fancied doomed never to arrive in any port well well i came upon him afterwards at a crisis in the game he was taking notes in shorthand with a sort of savagery between his tense and concentrated glares at the scrimmage that was then massed in the centre of the field woolrich arsenal and east kent locked in each other's bodies now struggled and writhed and butted like two immense beasts welded together by the impact of their battle now swayed and quivered and snorted as one beast torn by a solitary and mysterious rage self-consciousness had vanished from my man he stood leaning forward with his legs a little apart his boyish face was deeply flushed he had sucked and bitten his blond moustache into a wisp he was breathing heavily with his mouth ajar his very large and conspicuous blue eyes glittered with a sort of passion he wore those eyes in his odd little ugly face like some inappropriate decoration all these symptoms declared that he was on they made up a look that i was soon to know him by i remember marvelling at his excitement i remember also discussing the match with him as we went back to town it must have been then that he began to tell me about himself that his name was james tasker jevons that he lived or hoped to live by going about the country and reporting the big cricket and football matches at least he called it reporting i shouldn't think there has ever been any reporting like it before or since i told him i was out for my paper the morning standard too not exactly reporting in his sense i little knew what his sense was when i put it that way and there i left it you see i didn't want to rub it into the poor chap that the stranger he had been unfolding himself to so quaintly was a cut above his job but he saw through it i don't know how he managed to convey to me that my delicacy needn't suffer anyhow he must have had some scruples of his own since he waited for another context before remarking quietly that what i was doing now he would be doing in another six months and he was these things he said took time and he gave himself six months yes in less than six months he was holding me up again in my own paper i had to wait till he was out before i could get in he didn't seem to boast so much as to trace for my benefit the path of some natural force some upward tending indestructible energy that happened to be him all this i remember but i cannot remember by what stages we arrived at dining together as we did that night in a little restaurant in soho perhaps there was no stages we may have simply leaped by one bound at that consummation he had swung himself into my compartment as the train was leaving the platform at blackheath so i suppose it was destiny after that i was tempted to conceive that he fastened on me on something that he had need of but i think it was rather that i fell to his mysterious attraction 
while we dined he informed me further that he had been reporting football matches for six weeks before that he had been proofreader for a firm of printers for about a year before that he had been a compositor and before that again he had worked in an office with his father who was registrar of births marriages and deaths for some parish down in hertfordshire he chucked that because he found that the registration of births marriages and deaths was spoiling his handwriting quite as much as his handwriting was spoiling the registration of births marriages and deaths he was he said cultivating a careless scholarly hand he liked his present job because it took him out pretty often into the open air also he liked looking on at football matches and prize fights he said it made him feel manly you should have seen him sitting there and telling me these things in a gentle throaty and rather thick voice with a cockney accent and a sort of tenor ring in it and a queer humorous intonation that was like an audible twinkle as if he saw himself as he thought i must see him mainly in the light of absurdity you should have seen his face its thin cheeks its vivid flush its queer inquisitive contradictory nose that showed a slender high bridge and a tilted pointed end in profile and three-quarters and turned suddenly all broad and blunt in a full view and his mouth that stood ajar with excitement and even in moments of quiescence failed to hide the tips of two rather prominent white teeth pressed down on the lower lip i don't say there was anything unmanly about jevons's figure he wasn't noticeably undersized or about his mouth and jaw i knew a great general with a mouth and jaw like that and he was one of the handsomest figures in the service i'm not hinting at anything like effeminacy in jevons only at a certain oddity that really saved him if he'd been handsome he'd have been dreadful his flush his decorative eyes his dark eyebrows and eyelashes his sleek light brown hair would have made him vulgar as it was his queerness gave them a sort of point i dwell on these physical details because afterwards i found myself continually looking at him as if to see where his charm lay to see i suppose what she saw in him if anybody had asked me that night what i saw in him myself beyond an ordinary little journalist on the make i don't suppose i could have told them but there's no doubt that i felt his charm or that night would have been the end instead of the beginning we sat in the restaurant when he had done telling me about himself i remember we sat quite a long time discussing an english writer our contemporary whom i rather considered i had discovered in those days i used to apply him as an infallible test jevons had read every word of him it was he in fact who brought him into the conversation he confessed afterwards that he had done it on purpose he had been testing me even so our acquaintance might have lapsed but for the thing that happened when the waiter came up with the bill my share of it was three and tuppence and i found myself with only ninepence in my pocket i had to borrow half a crown from jevons you mayn't see anything very dreadful in that i didn't at the time and there wasn't the dreadful thing was that i forgot to pay him back yes something happened that put jevons and his half-crown out of my head for long enough i forgot to pay him and he had to go without his dinner for three nights in consequence it was his last half-crown he told me this as an immense joke long afterwards and viola thesiger cried that crying of hers that childlike softening and breaking down under him in itself so unexpected i didn't know she could do it that sudden and innocent catastrophe was the first sign to me that i was done for wiped out there wasn't any violence or any hysteria about it only grief only pity it was an entirely simple gentle and beautiful performance and it took place in my rooms after jevons had left us but as i say this was long afterwards the agony of my undoing was a horribly protracted affair i needn't say that what happened i mean the thing that made me forget all about jevons and his half-crown was viola thesiger i had his address but the next day the day after the match was sunday so i couldn't get the postal order i had meant to send him and on monday she walked into my rooms at ten in the morning the appointment i may remark was for nine thirty 
I had fixed that early hour for it because I wanted to get it done with. I wasn't going to have my morning murdered with violence when it was two hours old. Neither did I intend it to be poisoned by the thought of this interview hanging over me at the end. I had just sent for Pavitt, my man, and told him that if Miss Thesiger called, he was on no account to let her in. He was to say that the appointment was for 9.30 and that Mr. Furnival was now engaged. She would have to call again at 3 if she wished to see him. When engaging a typist, it is as well to begin as you mean to go on, and I was anxious to let Miss Thesiger know at once that I was not a man who would stand any nonsense. I was abominably busy that morning. And Pavitt let her in. It was the first time he had failed in this way. He never explained or apologized for it afterwards. He seemed to think that when I had seen Miss Thesiger, I would see even more vividly than he did how impossible it was to do otherwise, unless he had relinquished all claim to manhood and to chivalry. The look he sent me from the threshold as he retreated backwards, drawing the door upon himself like a screen, and shutting me in alone with her, said very plainly, You may curse, sir, and you may swear, but if you think you'll get out of it any better than I have, you're mistaken. Yes, it was something more than her appearance and her manner, though they, in all conscience, were enough. I do not know what appearance and what manner, if any, are proper to a young woman calling on a young man at his rooms to seek employment. The mere situation may, for all I know, bristle with embarrassments. Anyhow, I can imagine that in some hands it might have moments, let us say, of extreme difficulty on either side. Miss Thesiger's appearance and her manner were perfect but they didn't suggest by any sign or shade that she was a young woman seeking employment, that she was a young woman seeking anything, but rather that she was a young woman to whom all things naturally came. She approached me very slowly. Her adorable little salutation, with all its maturity, its gravity, was somehow essentially young. She was rather tall, and her figure had the same serious maturity in youth. She carried her small head high and held her shoulders well back so that she got a sort of squareness into the divine slope of them. People hadn't begun to slouch forward from the hips in those days, a squareness that agreed somehow with the character of her small face. I didn't know then whether it was a pretty face or not. I dare say it was a bit too odd and square for prettiness, and as for beauty, that had all gone into the lines of her body, which was beautiful, if you like. When you looked carefully, you got a little square white forehead and straight eyebrows of the same darkness as her hair, and very distinct on the white, and eyes also very dark and distinct, and fairly crystalline with youth, and a little white and very young nose that started straight and ended absurdly in a little soft knob that had a sort of kink in it and a mouth which would have been too large for her face if it hadn't made room for itself by tilting up at the corners, and then a little square white chin and jaw. They were thrust forward, but so lightly and slenderly that it didn't matter. It doesn't sound, does it, as if she could have been pretty, let alone beautiful, and yet, and yet she managed that little head of hers and that little odd face so as to give an impression of beauty or of prettiness. It was partly the oddness of the face and head coming on the top of all that symmetry, that perfection, that made the total effect of her so bewildering. I can't find words for the total effect. I don't know that you ever got it all at once, and I certainly didn't get it then. And if I were to tell you that what struck me first about her was something perverse and willful and defiant, this would be misleading. She smiled in her mature, perfunctory manner as she took the chair I gave her. She cast out her muff over my writing table and flung back the furs that covered her breast and shoulders, as if she had come to stay, as if it were four o'clock in the afternoon, and I had asked her to tea for the first time. I remember saying, that's right, I'm afraid this room is a bit warm, isn't it? as if she had done something uninvited and a little unexpected, and I wished to reassure her, as if, too, I desired to assert my position as the giver of assurances. And it was I who needed them, not she. She hadn't been in that room five minutes before she had created a situation. 
a situation that bristled with difficulty and danger to begin with she was so young she couldn't have been then a day or older than one and twenty my first instinct at least i suppose it was my first was to send her away to tell her that i was afraid she wouldn't do that she was too unpunctual and that i had found between nine thirty and ten o'clock somebody who would suit me rather better any lie i could think of so long as i got out of it so long as i got her out of it i don't know how it was she so contrived to impress me as being in for something some impetuous adventure some enterprise of enormous uncertainty it may have been because she looked so well cared for and expensive i do not understand these matters but her furs and her tailor-made suit of dark cloth and the little black velvet hat with the fur tail in it were not the sort of clothes i had hitherto seen worn by typists seeking for employment so that i doubted whether financial necessity could have driven her to my door or else i had a premonition she herself had none she was guileless and unaware of taking any risks and that i think was what disturbed me the situation bristled because she so ignored all difficulty or danger please don't imagine that i regarded myself as dangerous or even difficult or her as being in any vulgar sense out for adventure or as balancing herself even for amusement on any perilous edge it was not what she was out for it was as i say what she might possibly be in for and what she would in consequence let me in for too she made me feel responsible let me see i said it's typing isn't it i began raking through drawers and pigeonholes pretending to find her letter and the sample of her work that she had sent me though i knew all the time that they lay under my hand hidden by the blotter i wanted to give myself time i wanted to create the impression that i was old at this game that i had to do with scores and scores of young women seeking employment to make her realize the grim fact of competition to saturate her with the idea that she was only one of scores and scores all docketed and pigeonholed any one of whom might have superior qualities when it would be easy enough to say i'm sorry but the fact is i rather think i've engaged somebody already yes she said it's typing i can't do anything else but if you want shorthand i could learn it this gave me an opening well i'm sorry but the fact is did you like what i sent you that staggered me i hadn't allowed for her voice for a moment i wondered wildly what had she sent me oh yes i liked it but i began again she leaned forward this time peering under my elbow the minx i'm convinced she knew the infernal thing was there i see she said you've lost it don't bother i can do another as long as you liked it that's all right i remember thinking violently it isn't all right it's all wrong and the more i like it if i do like it the worse it's going to be but all i said was you wrote from canterbury didn't you yes it was as if she challenged me with why not why shouldn't one write from canterbury and she stuck out her little chin as her eyes opened fire on me at close range do you live there i said yes she corrected herself my people live there oh because in that case i'm sorry but the fact is i'm afraid i floundered and she watched me floundering then i plunged i must have a typist who lives in london and i might have added a typist who won't open fire on me at close range but she said i do at least i'm going to tomorrow evening I must have sat staring then quite a long time, not at her, but at one of Roland Simpson's sketches on the wall in front of me. She followed, but not quite accurately, the direction of my thoughts. If you want references, I can give you heaps. General Thesiger's my uncle. Why, do you know him? I had ceased staring. He was not the general I knew, but she had spoken a sufficiently distinguished name. I said as much of course lots of people know him she went on with a sort of radiant rapidity and he knows lots of people but i wouldn't write to him if i were you he'll only be rude and ask you who the devil you are there's my father canon thesiger it's no good writing to him either it'll worry him and there's no you mustn't bother the archbishop 
but there's the dean you might write to him and there's colonel braithwaite and mrs braithwaite they're all dears you might write to any of them only i'd much rather you didn't why i said i thought i was entitled to ask why because she said it, it'll only mean a lot more bother for me i believe i meditated on this before i asked her why should it because it isn't easy to get away and earn your own living in this country and they'll try poor dears to stop me and they can't if they don't i said are you sure it won't mean a lot of bother for them not she said gravely if they're left alone and not worried it will of course if you go and write and stir them all up again i see for the moment then they are placated rather i wondered on what grounds we settled that last night then i said forgive my asking so many questions your people know you had this appointment with me her eyebrows took a little tortured twist in her pity for my stupidity oh no that would have upset them all for nothing it doesn't do to worry them with silly details you see they don't know anything about you it was exquisite the innocence with which she brought it out but i insisted that's rather my point you don't know anything about me either do you yes i do i knew she said the minute i came into the room if it comes to that you don't know anything about me i said i did i knew the minute she came into the room and she faced me with well then you see as if that settled it i suppose it did settle it i must have decided that since nobody could stop her and i wasn't after all a villain if she insisted on being somebody's typist she had very much better be mine you see she was so young i wanted to protect her not that there was anything helpless and pathetic about her anything except her innocence that appealed to me for protection on the contrary she struck me as a creature of high courage and defiance that of course was what constituted the danger she would insist on taking risks presently i heard myself saying yes the close canterbury i've got that but where am i to find you here she gave me an address that made me whistle i asked her if she knew anything anything whatever about the people of the house she said she didn't she had chosen it because it had a nice green door and there was an angora cat on the doorstep a large orange cat with green eyes had she actually taken rooms there no but she had chosen them i think she said because they had pretty chintz curtains she was going to take them now she had her hand on the door she was eager like a child that has got off at last after irritating delay i closed the door against her precipitate flight i said i thought we could settle that here over the telephone and i settled it having settled it i sent pavitt my man to get rooms for her that afternoon in hampstead with his sister-in-law in a house overlooking the heath i said i couldn't promise her chintz curtains and a green door and an orange angora cat with green eyes but i thought she would be fairly comfortable with mrs pavitt she was she told me a week later that the hampstead rooms had chintz curtains and there was a persian kitten too a blue persian with yellow eyes there was but i didn't tell her who put them there the kitten alone it was a purebred persian cost me three guineas and to this day she thinks that pavitt who brought it to her found it on the heath yet with all my precautions there was trouble when canterbury heard about my typist she had become my typist though i had never said a word about engaging her this of course was owing to the criminal secrecy with which viola conducted her affairs the minor canon wrote to me as if i had seduced or was about to seduce his daughter he had upset himself by rushing up to take her back to canterbury and finding that she wouldn't go with him i think in his excitement he ordered me to give her up he was a guileless and indeed a holy man and it's always the guileless and the holy people who raise the uncleanest scandals and mrs fessager wrote and the general and the dean and i've no doubt the archbishop would have written too if i hadn't unearthed my general at his club and asked him if he knew the thesigers and found out that he did and employed him to arrange the horrid business for me as best he could i said he might tell them that if the girl had been left to them to look after her she would have got into rooms in i named the street and testified to the sinister character of the house and my general wrote and explained to the other general and to the minor canon what a thoroughly nice chap i was 
and how lamentably they had misunderstood what i believed he was pleased to call my relations with miss thesiger i'm not at all sure that he didn't even go farther and stick in a lot about my family and suggest that i was eligible to the extent that though my fortunes were still to make i had besides private means that enabled me to live in spite of journalism considerable expectations he knew an aunt of mine better it would seem than i did in short that i was a thoroughly nice chap and that the father of seven daughters five unmarried might do far worse than cultivate my acquaintance he must have gone quite as far as that or farther otherwise i couldn't account for the peculiarly tender note that the minor canon put into the letter of apology that he wrote me still less for the invitation i received by the same post from mrs thesiger to spend whitsuntide with them at canterbury viola had said she was going home for whitsuntide dear lady she was herself the daughter of a canon and she had lived all her life in a cathedral close and the atmosphere of a cathedral close may foster innocence but i cannot think it could have been entirely responsible for the kind of indiscretion mrs thesiger was guilty of neither do i think mrs thesiger was entirely responsible herself she is a nice woman and i am sure she couldn't have written as she did unless my friend the general had led her to believe that there was some sort of an understanding between me and viola but still for all she knew about me i might have been a villain not perhaps the gross villain the minor canon took me for but a villain in some profound and subtle way inappreciable to my friend the general well of course i didn't spend whitsuntime with the thesigers at canterbury it would have been sheer waste of viola for the worst of all this confounded rumpus was that it made me put off proposing to viola till she had forgotten all about it she would never have listened to me while the trail of the scandal still lingered in fact it was only the marked coldness of my manner to her just then that saved me it saved me to suffer i didn't know it was possible to suffer as she made me suffer i mean as they made me between them it didn't begin all at once it didn't begin really for another three months the end of those six months that jevons had given himself not even then not you may say for a whole year because he gave himself another six months as soon as he saw her he was always giving himself these periods of time as if with his mania for taking risks he was always having some prodigious bet on himself i never knew a man back his own enterprises as he did but until he turned up again i was happy i say i not we i don't know whether viola was happy or not though she looked it i had enough sense to see that her happiness if she was happy had nothing to do with me except in so far as i was the humble means under providence of the definite escape from canterbury for i very soon saw what had been the matter with her she was one of nine the youngest but one of seven daughters the minor canon had only been able to educate one of the seven properly because he had had a son at sandhurst and the other was still reading for the bar which is pretty expensive too if you're as amiably stupid as bertie thesiger i mention bertie because though he doesn't come into the story his stupidity and his amiability combined to tighten the situation considerably for viola and mrs thesiger had only been able to marry off two of her seven daughters of the others one the one who had been to girton was a high school teacher in canterbury and she lived at home one was a trained nurse and lived at home between cases that left three girls living continually at home and as viola put it eating their heads off these were the circumstances which viola with some omissions recited by way of justification for her revolt the fact being that she would have revolted anyway she was as i have said a creature of high courage and vitality and she was tied up much too tight in that cathedral close besides being much too well fed and she longed to do things to do them with her hands and with her head she was tired of playing tennis on the velvet lawns of the canon's gardens she was tired of calling on the canon's wives and talking to their daughters i am aware that canterbury is a garrison town and that other resources and other prospects i suppose were open to viola but viola was tired of talking to the garrison i think she would have been tired in any case even if the garrison hadn't been bespoken as it were by her unmarried sisters it is humanly speaking impossible that even in a garrison town seven sisters will all marry into the service as i fatuously suppose mrs thesiger must have realized when she asked me to canterbury it always bored viola to do what her family did and what her family just because they did it expected her to do 
and somehow in the long hours spent in the cathedral close she had acquired a taste for what she called literature what she innocently believed to be literature she was of an engaging innocence in this respect so that typing authors manuscripts appealed to her as a vocation that combined one of the highest forms of cerebral activity with i don't know what glamour of romantic adventure her enthusiasm her veneration for the written word made her an admirable typist but not all at once to say that she brought to her really horrible task a respect a meticulous devotion would give you no idea of the child's attitude it was a blind savage superstition that would have been exasperating if it had not been so heart-rending it cleared gradually until it became intelligent cooperation i trained her for six months i don't suppose i ever worked harder than i did in that first half year of her i mean my output was never greater for every blessed thing i wrote was an excuse for going to see her or for her coming to see me it was a perpetual journeying between my rooms in brunswick square and her rooms in hampstead overlooking the heath the more i wrote the more i saw of her i trained her for six months until jevons was ready for her when i tell you that she reverenced my performances you may imagine in what spirit she approached his for their meeting as for what happened afterwards i alone am responsible i brought it on myself by sheer quixotic fuss and interference with what after all wasn't my affair for little jevons most decidedly was not i might easily have let that sleeping dog lie he certainly did sleep in some obscure kennel of london he had slept ever since i had left him at the door of that restaurant in soho he slept almost for the six months he had then given himself and then before according to his own schedule he was quite due he appeared in the columns in my columns of the morning standard i had almost forgotten his existence but when i saw his name james tasker jevons stick out familiarly under the big headlines i remembered that that name on a card with an address had been lying in my left-hand writing-table drawer all this time i remembered that it was there because he had lent me half a crown and that i had never paid him then he came back to me he lived again i sent him a postal order and an apology i referred very handsomely as i thought to his cuckoos nesting in my paper i informed him in fact that he did it better than i did and because i had worked myself up to a pitch of affability and generosity i asked him to come and see me at such time as he should be free and because also i was indifferent and lazy and didn't want to be seriously bothered with him instead of asking him to lunch or dine with me i said i was generally free myself between four and five between four and five was an hour when viola was very apt to come in in the instant that followed the posting of that letter i saw what i had done and i wrote to him the next day asking him to dinner in order that he should not come in between four and five for some weeks whenever i fancied he was about due at four o'clock i wrote and asked him to dinner that was how i fastened him to me there wasn't any sense in which he fastened on me i wasn't by any means his only hope i may say at once i was prostrated as any slave before his conversation i shall never forget the radiance of his twinkle when he told me he had been sacked three weeks ago from the sporting paper that had provided him with his sole visible means of subsistence it was his blessed only he didn't call it blessed style that had dished him the suicidal elan that he brought to the business he was warned he said he was aware that his existence as a reporter hung by the bare thread of statement wearing thinner and thinner on which he weaved his fantastic web his editor told him he was engaged to report football not to play it with the paper but he couldn't help it he had got he said the ensanguined habit still i was not to imagine that he bungled things he jolly well knew his way about in his wildest flights there was a homing impulse he was preparing a place for himself all the time that it happened to be my place didn't seem to afflict him in the least like st paul he knew how to abound and he knew how to abstain his abstinence in fact gave the measure of his abundance he held himself in for five perilous weeks and when he let himself rip again it was with a burst that landed him in the front page of the morning standard what he sketched for me had no resemblance to the career of a peaceful man of letters it was a hot race 
a combat as bloody his own word as those contests of which he was the delighted eye-witness he had come thin and worn out of the struggle but you gathered that he had borne himself in it with coolness and deliberate caution his phrases produced a false effect of vehemence and excitement you saw that he had simply followed out a calculated scheme not one step of which had miscarried and you felt that his most passionate affairs would be conducted with the same formidable precision i ought to have felt it for we were precious soon in the thick of it of his most passionate affair i had dined him i suppose about three times and i had lunched him twice and i had had tea with him once in his bedroom he was living in one room in a street off the euston road and he called it his bedroom because it looked so much more that than anything else i might have let it go at that but i didn't i had seen his bedroom i took the liberty of inquiring into his finances they were he said as yet undeveloped he had a scheme of his own for improving them but while it was maturing he was he certainly was open to offers of work i got him some translation he was a fairly good french scholar then it was the fatality of the proceedings that impressed them on my memory then i forgot to say that at that time i was reader to a firm of publishers these things are in themselves so inessential to the story i turned over to him any books that came more into his province than mine his promise i can tell you was pretty extensive too he began by doing me the honour to consult me about any instances that seemed doubtful and so you see how carefully i had prepared his path for him one afternoon he turned up at my rooms uninvited between four and five he said he remembered i had told him i should be free at that hour he remembered yes i don't think tasker jevons ever forgot anything anything likely to be useful to him in his life and he hadn't been with me ten minutes before viola thesiger came in he was saying why the heaven afflicted idiot his author should think it necessary when viola came in she came in and suddenly i made up my mind that she was beautiful i hadn't seen it before i don't know why i saw it now it may have been some turn of her small squarish head that surprised me with subtle tendernesses and curves or more likely it may have been her effect on him i may have seen her with his eyes i don't know i don't know i hardly like to think he saw anything in her i hadn't seen first he stopped talking they looked at each other i introduced him not to have introduced him would have struck him as a slight i ordered tea at once in the hope of hastening his departure he had been curiously silent since she had come in but he didn't go he just sat there saying nothing but looking at her furtively now and again and blinking as if looking at her hurt him whenever she said anything he stared with his mouth a little open breathing heavily she hadn't paid very much attention to him then suddenly as if intrigued by his silence she said who is the heaven afflicted idiot i said ask mr jevons she did jevons didn't answer her he simply looked at her and blinked then he looked away again come i said you might finish what you were going to say i don't know he muttered that i was going to say anything oh yes that thing you sent me why the silly blighter should suppose it's necessary to stick in a storm at sea when it's quite obvious he hasn't seen one he talks about a brig when he means a bark and from the way he navigates her you'd say the wind blew all ways at once in the atlantic i said it might for all i knew and i asked him if he'd ever seen a storm at sea himself it seemed he had he'd been ordered a sea voyage for his health after a spell of printing and his uncle who was a sea captain took him with him to hong kong in his ship and he had been all through the cyclone in the pacific i got him with some difficulty for he had become extremely shy i got him to tell us about it he did and by the time he had finished with us we had all been through a cyclone in the pacific it was too much the little beast could talk almost as well as he wrote a fellow who can write like tasker jevons has no business to talk at all viola left soon after six he had outstayed her i went downstairs with her when i came back to him he was still staring at the doorway she had passed through who's that girl he said i said she was my typist he meditated and brought out as the result do you mind telling me how much she charges you i told him he looked dejected i can't afford her he said presently no i can't possibly afford her not yet 
he paused do you mind giving me her address i thought you said you couldn't afford her i can't not yet but i will afford her i will i give myself another he stopped his mouth fell ajar and i saw his lips moving as he went through some inaudible calculations another six months he hid his face in his hands and ran his fingers through his hair then as if he conceived himself to be unobserved behind this shelter he let himself go and i became the witness of an agony a passion a self-abandoned nakedness to the utter shedding of all reticences and decencies with nothing but those thin hands and that hair between me and it i'll work he said i'll work like a hundred bloody niggers like ten hundred thousand million sweated tailors in a stinking cellar i'll pinch i'll skimp and save i'll deny myself butter i'll wear celluloid collars and sell my dress suit my god i'd sell the coat off my back and the shoes off my feet i'd sell my own mother's body off her deathbed and go without any dinner for nine months to see her again for five minutes just to see her for five minutes five unprintable little minutes that another man wouldn't know what to do with wouldn't use for tying up a bootlace in pause i didn't know it hurt i didn't know a girl's face could land you one like this and her eyes jab you and her voice turn round and round in your stomach like a circular saw that's what it feels like exactly dry up you old geyser yourself i'm getting it not you you'd spout if you'd had to sit tight with all the gas in the shop blazing away under you for the last hour if you can turn it off at the meter turn it i can't no i won't have another cup of tea and i won't get up and clear out i'm going to sit here another five minutes i'm not well i tell you and it relieves me to talk about it i don't care if you don't listen or if you do i'm past caring do you notice that i didn't speak a word to her not one blessed word the whole time i should have choked if i tried to i didn't want to look at her to think of her that's why i told that rotten story just to keep myself going what a blethering idiot she must have thought me what a putrid ass the sea and me and the way she looked at me i said do you mean to say jevons it didn't happen and he groaned oh it happened all right i can't invent things to save my life god it isn't even as if she was pretty i could understand that he grabbed his throat suddenly and began to cough i tried to be kind to him look here i said old chap i'm awfully sorry if it takes you this way but it's no good he turned on me coughing and choking i cannot remember all he said or half the things he called me but it was something like this you snivelling defective cough you septic idiot cough you poisonous and polluted ass cough 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 you scarlet imbecile i have to water down the increasing richness of his epithets you last diminutive purple embryo of an epileptic stock do you suppose i don't know that no good of course it's no good yet i got to wait for another six months and you can take it from me if a fellow knows what he wants and doesn't try to get it doesn't know how to get it in six months and doesn't find out he's no good if you like these words didn't strike me at the time as having any personal application he was to repeat them later on however in circumstances which i defy anybody to have foreseen i cannot recall the precise phases of their remarkable friendship i wasn't present at its earliest stages i had my first intimation of its existence one evening in the winter of nineteen five when he dropped in on me to consult me he said about a rather delicate matter in which i gathered there lurked for his inexperience the most frightful pitfalls of offence that he should come to me in this spirit of was evidence that a certain chastening had been going on in him the delicate matter was this he had given miss thesiger a lot of work the typing of a whole book in fact and he had immense difficulty in getting to this part of it she had refused to take any payment she had got it into her head that he was hard up he had sent her a check three times and three times she had returned it she was as obstinate as a mule about it and now she was saying that she had never meant him to pay her she had done the whole thing out of friendship which of course was very pretty of her but it put him in a beastly position he had never been precisely in that position before and he didn't know what to do about it he didn't want to offend her and yet he didn't see did i how he could let her do it it was he said all the wrong way about according to his notions and for the life of him he didn't know what to do it, it might seem to me incredible that such virgin innocence as his should exist in a world 
where the rules for most sorts of conduct were fairly settled he had lived all his life in an atmosphere of births marriages and deaths and he knew all the rules for the registration of them that was about all he did know and it was the most infernally hard luck to be stumped like this at the very beginning just when he wanted most awfully to do the right thing besides it had knocked him all to bits the sheer prettiness of it he had laid bare for me all the curious intricacies of a soul tortured by its own delicacy there was agony in his eyes if he were to take this kindness from a lady would it in my opinion or would it not be cricket i didn't like to tell him that he had brought his agony on himself by his imprudence in employing a typist when he couldn't afford one so i only said that if i knew the lady he would find her uncommonly hard to move he hadn't any hope he said of moving her but did i think that if he made her a present say the collected works of george meredith it would meet the case i said it would meet the case all right but that in my opinion it would spoil its prettiness if miss thesiger didn't want to be paid in one way she wouldn't at all care about being paid in another perhaps miss thesiger liked being pretty hadn't he better leave it at that anyhow for the present you see i looked on viola and viola's behaviour as infinitely more my concern than his i found myself replying for her as she would have wished me to reply as if i could claim an intenser appreciation of her motives than was his as if she and i were agreed about this question of helping tasker jevons and i were the custodian of her generosity he said he supposed it wouldn't hurt him to leave it at that it wasn't as if it wouldn't be all one in the long run he gave himself three months i supposed he meant to pay her in three weeks later i heard that jevons was actually living up in hampstead in the same house as viola i didn't hear it from viola but from my man pavitt who had it from his sister-in-law and what pavitt came to tell me was that mr jevons had been ill i went up to hampstead that afternoon to see him i found him in a back room at the top of the house sitting by the fire in an easy chair wrapped in a blanket he was as thin as a lath and his face was a bright yellow the very whites of his eyes were yellow i would have said you never saw a more miserable object but that jevons was not miserable he was happy and as far as his devastated condition would allow him he looked happy this face yellow with jaundice was doing its best to smile the smile was a grimace not an affair of the lips at all but of the deep crescent lines drawn at right angles to them still he was smiling in a sort of ecstasy he was smiling at viola who sat in the chair facing him on the other side of the hearth she looked as if she had been there for ages also as if she had been sitting up all night she was smiling too straight at jevons what i saw was the beatitude of his response he tried to smile at me too as i came in but the effort was a failure he wasn't really a bit glad to see me viola got up and left me with him i wasn't to stay with him for more than ten minutes she said it was the first day he had been allowed to sit up i sat with him for fifteen minutes he was lodged as before in one room but its domestic character was disguised by many ingenious devices giving you the idea that it was nothing but his study well there he was haggard and yellow with jaundice and utterly pitiable as to his appearance and surroundings yet he looked at me in positively a sort of triumph as much as to say yes here i am and you with all your superior resources haven't managed half so well and i thought that he not knowing viola so well as i did was suffering from a lamentable delusion he said she had been awfully good to him but it was rather hard luck on him wasn't it that he should have gone and turned this beastly colour i said rather loftily i didn't suppose it mattered to viola what colour he turned what could it matter to her she came in presently and took me down to her sitting-room and gave me tea she owned to having sat up three nights with jevons she couldn't have believed it possible that anybody could be so ill for three days and three nights the poor thing hadn't been able to keep anything down not even a drop of water but to-day she had been feeding him on the whites of eggs beaten up with brandy she seemed to me to be obsessed with jevons's illness and i made her come out with me for ten minutes for a blow on the heath i tried to lead her mind to other things and she listened politely then there was silence and presently i felt her arm slide into mine she had these adorable impulses of confidence funny she said what does jaundice come from i said it generally came from chill she frowned as if she were not satisfied with that explanation and there was another silence then she began again 
would being unhappy very very unhappy give it you i thought i saw how her mind was working and i advised her to put that idea out of her head happiness i said wouldn't be good for jevons she said oh wouldn't it and after prolonged meditation i wonder if he'll stay that funny yellow color all his life i found out from her that he had been living in that top room above hers for three weeks ever since he had finished his book it looked as if he had become frantic when he saw the end of his pretexts and occasions for meeting her and had cast off all prudence and had followed her determined to live under the same roof i looked on it as a madness that possessed him but that it should ever possess her that was inconceivable end of section fifteen of tasker jevons the real story by may sinclair chapter one section sixteen of nineteen sixteen first chapters collection this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org nineteen sixteen first chapters collection by various section sixteen the home and the world by rabindranath tagore chapter one bimala's story mother to-day there comes back to mind the vermilion mark at the parting of your hair the sari which you used to wear with its wide red border and those wonderful eyes of yours full of depth and peace they came at the start of my life's journey like the first streak of dawn giving me golden provision to carry me on my way the sky which gives light is blue and my mother's face was dark but she had the radiance of holiness and her beauty would put to shame all the vanity of the beautiful every one says that i resemble my mother in my childhood i used to resent this it made me angry with my mirror i thought that it was god's unfairness which was wrapped round my limbs that my dark features were not my due but had come to me by some misunderstanding all that remained for me to ask of my god in reparation was that i might grow up to be a model of what woman should be as one reads it in some epic poem when the proposal came for my marriage an astrologer was sent who consulted my palm and said this girl has good signs she will become an ideal wife and all the women who heard it said no wonder for she resembles her mother i was married into a rajah's house when i was a child i was quite familiar with the description of the prince of the fairy story but my husband's face was not of a kind that one's imagination would place in fairyland it was dark even as mine was the feeling of shrinking which i had about my own lack of physical beauty was lifted a little at the same time a touch of regret was left lingering in my heart but when the physical appearance evades the scrutiny of our senses and enters the sanctuary of our hearts then it can forget itself i know from my childhood's experience how devotion is beauty itself in its inner aspect when my mother arranged the different fruits carefully peeled by her own loving hands on the white stone plate and gently waved her fan to drive away the flies while my father sat down to his meals her service would lose itself in a beauty which passed beyond outward forms even in my infancy i could feel its power it transcended all debates or doubts or calculations it was pure music i distinctly remember after my marriage when early in the morning i would cautiously and silently get up and take the dust of my husband's feet without waking him how at such moments i could feel the vermilion mark upon my forehead shining out like the morning star one day he happened to awake and smiled as he asked me what is that bimala what are you doing i can never forget the shame of being detected by him he might possibly have thought that i was trying to earn merit secretly but no no that had nothing to do with merit it was my woman's heart which must worship in order to love 
My father-in-law's house was old in dignity from the days of the Badshahs. Some of its manners were of the Moguls and Pathans, some of its customs of Manu and Parashar. But my husband was absolutely modern. He was the first of the house to go through a college course and take his M.A. degree. His elder brother had died young of drink and had left no children my husband did not drink and was not given to dissipation so foreign to the family was this abstinence that to many it hardly seemed decent purity they imagined was only becoming in those on whom fortune had not smiled it is the moon which has room for stains not the stars my husband's parents had died long ago and his old grandmother was mistress of the house my husband was the apple of her eye the jewel on her bosom and so he never met with much difficulty in overstepping any of the ancient usages when he brought in miss gilby to teach me and be my companion he stuck to his resolve in spite of the poison secreted by all the wagging tongues at home and outside my husband had then just got through his b a examination and was reading for his m a degree so he had to stay in calcutta to attend college he used to write to me almost every day a few lines only and simple words but his bold round handwriting would look up into my face oh so tenderly i kept his letters in a sandalwood box and covered them every day with the flowers i gathered in the garden at that time the prince of the fairy tale had faded like the moon in the morning light i had the prince of my real world enthroned in my heart i was his queen i had my seat by his side but my real joy was that my true place was at his feet since then i have been educated and introduced to the modern age in its own language and therefore these words that i write seem to blush with shame in their prose setting except for my acquaintance with this modern standard of life i should know quite naturally that just as my being born a woman was not in my own hands so the element of devotion in woman's love is not like a hackneyed passage quoted from a romantic poem to be piously written down in round hand in a schoolgirl's copy-book but my husband would not give me any opportunity for worship that was his greatness they are cowards who claim absolute devotion from their wives as their right that is a humiliation for both his love for me seemed to overflow my limits by its flood of wealth and service but my necessity was more for giving than for receiving for love is a vagabond who can make his flowers bloom in the wayside dust better than in the crystal jars kept in the drawing-room my husband could not break completely with the old-time traditions which prevailed in our family it was difficult therefore for us to meet at any hour of the day we pleased i knew exactly the time that he could come to me and therefore our meeting had all the care of loving preparation it was like the rhyming of a poem it had to come through the path of the meter after finishing the day's work and taking my afternoon bath i would do up my hair and renew my vermilion mark and put on my sari carefully crinkled and then bringing back my body and mind from all distractions of household duties i would dedicate it at this special hour with special ceremonies to one individual that time each day with him was short but it was infinite my husband used to say that man and wife are equal in love because of their equal claim on each other i never argued the point with him but my heart said that devotion never stands in the way of true equality it only raises the level of the ground of meeting therefore the joy of the higher equality remains permanent it never slides down to the vulgar level of triviality my beloved it was worthy of you that you never expected worship from me but if you had accepted it you would have done me a real service you showed your love by decorating me by educating me by giving me what i asked for and what i did not 
i have seen what depth of love there was in your eyes when you gazed at me i have known the secret sigh of pain you suppressed in your love for me you love my body as if it were a flower of paradise you love my whole nature as if it had been given you by some rare providence such lavish devotion made me proud to think that the wealth was all my own which drove you to my gate but vanity such as this only checks the flow of free surrender in a woman's love when i sit on the queen's throne and claim homage then the claim only goes on magnifying itself it is never satisfied can there be any real happiness for a woman in merely feeling that she has power over a man to surrender one's pride in devotion is woman's only salvation it comes back to me to-day how in the days of our happiness the fires of envy sprung up all around us that was only natural for had i not stepped into my good fortune by a mere chance and without deserving it but providence does not allow a run of luck to last for ever unless its debt of honour be fully paid day by day through many a long day and thus made secure god may grant us gifts but the merit of being able to take and hold them must be our own alas for the boons that slip through unworthy hands my husband's grandmother and mother were both renowned for their beauty and my widowed sister-in-law was also of a beauty rarely to be seen when in turn fate left them desolate the grandmother vowed she would not insist on having beauty for her remaining grandson when he married only the auspicious marks with which i was endowed gained me an entry into this family otherwise i had no claim to be here in this house of luxury but few of its ladies had received their meed of respect they had however got used to the ways of the family and managed to keep their heads above water buoyed up by their dignity as rawness of an ancient house in spite of their daily tears being drowned in the foam of wine and by the tinkle of the dancing girls anklets was the credit due to me that my husband did not touch liquor nor squander his manhood in the markets of woman's flesh what charm did i know to soothe the wild and wandering mind of men it was my good luck nothing else for fate proved utterly callous to my sister-in-law her festivity died out while yet the evening was early leaving the light of her beauty shining in vain over empty halls burning and burning with no accompanying music his sister-in-law affected a contempt for my husband's modern notions how absurd to keep the family ship laden with all the weight of its time-honoured glory sailing under the colours of his slip of a girl-wife alone often have i felt the lash of scorn a thief who had stolen a husband's love a sham hidden in the shamelessness of her new-fangled finery the many-coloured garments of modern fashion with which my husband loved to adorn me roused jealous wrath is not she ashamed to make a show widow of herself and with her looks too my husband was aware of all this but his gentleness knew no bounds he used to employ me to forgive her i remember i once told him women's minds are so petty so crooked like the feet of chinese women he replied has not the pressure of society cramped them into pettiness and crookedness they are but pawns of the fate which gambles with them what responsibility have they of their own my sister-in-law never failed to get from my husband whatever she wanted he did not stop to consider whether her requests were right or reasonable but what exasperated me most was that she was not grateful for this i had promised my husband that i would not talk back at her but this set me raging all the more inwardly i used to feel that goodness has a limit which if passed somehow seems to make men cowardly shall i tell the whole truth i have often wished that my husband had the manliness to be a little less good my sister-in-law the bararani was still young and had no pretensions to saintliness rather her talk and jest and laugh inclined to be forward the young maids with whom she surrounded herself were also impudent to a degree but there was none to gainsay her for was not this the custom of the house 
it seemed to me that my good fortune in having a stainless husband was a special eyesore to her he however felt more the sorrow of her lot than the defects of her character end of section sixteen first chapter bimala's story from the home and the world by rabindranath tagore Section 17 of 1916, First Chapters Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. 1916, First Chapters Collection by Various. William, Chapter 1 of 17 by booth tarkington william sylvanus baxter paused for a moment of thought in front of the drug store at the corner of washington street and central avenue he had an internal question to settle before he entered the store he wished to allow the young man at the soda fountain no excuse for saying well make up your mind what's it gonna be can't you rudeness of this kind especially in the presence of girls and women was hard to bear and though william sylvanus baxter had borne it upon occasion he had reached an age when he found it intolerable therefore to avoid offering opportunity for anything of the kind he decided upon chocolate and strawberry mixed before approaching the fountain once there however and a large glass of these flavors and diluted ice cream proving merely provocative he said languidly an affectation for he could have disposed of half a dozen with gusto well now i'm here i might as well go one more fill her up again same emerging to the street penniless he bent a fascinated and dramatic gaze upon his reflection in the drug store window and then as he turned his back upon the alluring image his expression altered to one of lofty and uncondescending amusement that was his glance at the passing public from the heights he seemed to bestow upon the world a mysterious derision for william sylvanus baxter was seventeen long years of age and had learned to present the appearance of one who possesses inside information about life and knows all strangers and most acquaintances to be of inferior caste costume and intelligence he lingered upon the corner a while not pressed for time indeed he found many hours of these summer months heavy upon his hands for he had no important occupation unless some intermittent dalliance with a work on geometry anticipatory of the distant autumn might be thought important which is doubtful since he usually went to sleep on the shady side porch at his home with the book in his hand so having nothing to call him elsewhere he lounged before the drug store in the early afternoon sunshine watching the passing to and fro of the lower orders and bourgeoisie of the middle-sized midland city which claimed him so to speak for a native son apparently quite unembarrassed by his presence they went about their business and the only people who looked at him with any attention were pedestrians of color it is true that when the gaze of these fell upon him it was instantly arrested for no colored person could have passed him without a little pang of pleasure and of longing indeed the tropical violence of william sylvanus baxter's tie and the strange brilliancy of his hat might have made it positively unsafe for him to walk at night through the negro quarter of the town and though no man could have sworn to the color of that hat whether it was blue or green yet its color was a saner thing than its shape which was blurred tortured and raffish it might have been the miniature model of a volcano that had blown off its cone and misbehaved disastrously on its lower slopes as well he had the air of wearing it as a matter of course and with careless ease but that was only an air 
it was the apple of his eye for the rest his costume was neutral subordinate and even a little neglected in the matter of a detail or two one pointed flap of his soft collar was held down by a button but the other showed a frayed thread where the button once had been his low patent leather shoes were of a luster not solicitously cherished and there could be no doubt that he needed to get his hair cut while something might have been done too about the individualized hirsute prophecies which had made independent appearances here and there upon his chin he examined these from time to time by the sense of touch passing his hand across his face and allowing his fingertips a slight tapping motion wherever they detected a prophecy thus he fell into a pleasant musing and seemed to forget the crowded street end of william section seventeen of seventeen by booth tarkington section eighteen of nineteen sixteen first chapters collection this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org nineteen sixteen first chapters collection by various the mysterious stranger by mark twain it was in fifteen ninety winter Austria was far away from the world and asleep. It was still the Middle Ages in Austria, and promised to remain so forever. Some even set it back centuries upon centuries, and said that by the mental and spiritual clock it was still the age of belief in Austria. But they meant it as a compliment, not a slur, and it was so taken, and we were all proud of it. I remember it well, although I was only a boy, and I remember, too, the pleasure it gave me. Yes, Austria was far from the world and asleep, and our village was in the middle of that sleep, being in the middle of Austria. It drowsed in peace in the deep privacy of a hilly and woodsy solitude, where news from the world hardly ever came to disturb its dreams, and was infinitely content. At its front flowed the tranquil river, its surface painted with cloud forms, and the reflections of drifting arcs and stone boats. Behind it, rose the woody steeps to the base of the lofty precipice. From the top of the precipice frowned a vast castle, its long stretch of towers and bastions, mailed in vines. Beyond the river, a league to the left, was a tumbled expanse of forest-clothed hills, cloven by winding gorges, where the sun never penetrated, and to the right a precipice overlooked the river, and between it and the hills just spoken of lay a far-reaching plain dotted with little homesteads, nested among orchards and shade-trees. The whole region for leagues around was the hereditary property of a prince, whose servants kept the castle always in perfect condition for occupancy, but neither he nor his family came there oftener than once in five years. When they came, it was as if the lord of the world had arrived, and had brought all the glories of its kingdoms along, and when they went, they left a calm behind which was like the deep sleep which follows an orgy. Eseldorf was a paradise for us boys. We were not overmuch pestered with schooling. Mainly, we were trained to be good Christians, to revere the Virgin, the Church, and the saints above everything. Beyond these matters we were not required to know much, and in fact not allowed to. Knowledge was not good for the common people, and could make them discontented with the lot which God had appointed for them, and God would not endure discontentment with His plans. We had two priests— one of them, Father Adolf, was a very zealous and strenuous priest, much considered. There may have been better priests in some ways than Father Adolf, but there was never one in our commune who was held in more solemn and awful respect. This was because he had absolutely no fear of the devil. He was the only Christian I have ever known of whom that could truly be said. People stood in deep dread of him on that account, for they thought that there must be something supernatural about him, else he could not be so bold and so confident. All men speak in bitter disapproval of the devil, but they do it reverently, not flippantly. But Father Adolf's way was very different. He called him by every name he could lay his tongue to, and it made everyone shudder that heard him, and often he would even speak of him scornfully and scoffingly. 
Then the people crossed themselves and went quickly out of his presence, fearing that something fearful might happen. Father Adolf had actually met Satan face to face more than once, and defied him. This was known to be so. Father Adolf said it himself. He never made any secret of it, but spoke it right out. And that he was speaking true, there was proof in at least one instance, for on that occasion he quarreled with the enemy, and intrepidly threw his bottle at him, and there upon the wall of his study was the ruddy splotch where it struck and broke. But it was Father Peter, the other priest, that we all loved best and were sorriest for. Some people charged him with talking around in conversation that God was all goodness and would find a way to save all his poor human children. It was a horrible thing to say, but there was never any absolute proof that Father Peter said it, and it was out of character for him to say it, too, for he was always good and gentle and truthful. He wasn't charged with saying it in the pulpit, where all the congregation could hear and testify, but only outside, in talk, and it is easy for enemies to manufacture that. Father Peter had an enemy, and a very powerful one, the astrologer who lived in a tumbled old tower up the valley, and put in his nights studying the stars. Everyone knew he could foretell wars and famines, though that was not so hard, for there was always a war, and generally a famine somewhere. But he could also read any man's life through the stars in a big book he had, and find lost property, and everyone in the village except Father Peter stood in awe of him. Even Father Adolf, who had defied the devil, had a wholesome respect for the astrologer when he came through our village wearing his tall pointed hat and his long flowing robe with stars on it, carrying his big book and a staff which was known to have magic power. The bishop himself sometimes listened to the astrologer, it was said, for besides studying the stars and prophesying, the astrologer made a great show of piety, which would impress the bishop, of course. But Father Peter took no stock in the astrologer. He denounced him openly as a charlatan, a fraud with no valuable knowledge of any kind or powers beyond those of an ordinary and rather inferior human being, which naturally made the astrologer hate Father Peter and wish to ruin him. It was the astrologer, as we all believed, who originated the story about Father Peter's shocking remark, and carried it to the bishop. It was said that Father Peter had made the remark to his niece, Margaret, though Margaret denied it and implored the bishop to believe her and spare her old uncle from poverty and disgrace. But the bishop wouldn't listen. He suspended Father Peter indefinitely, though he wouldn't go so far as to excommunicate him on the evidence of only one witness. And now Father Peter had been out a couple of years, and our other priest, Father Adolf, had his flock. Those had been hard years for the old priest and Margaret. They had been favorites, but of course that changed when they came under the shadow of the bishop's frown. Many of their friends fell away entirely, and the rest became cool and distant. Margaret was a lovely girl of eighteen when the trouble came, and she had the best head in the village, and the most in it. She taught the harp and earned all her clothes and pocket-money by her own industry. But her scholars fell off one by one now. She was forgotten when there were dances and parties among the youth of the village. The young fellows stopped coming to the house, all except Wilhelm Meidling, and he could have been spared. She and her uncle were sad and forlorn in their neglect and disgrace, and the sunshine was gone out of their lives. Matters went worse and worse all through the two years. Clothes were wearing out. Bread was harder and harder to get. And now at last the very end was come. Solomon Isaacs had lent all the money he was willing to put on the house, and gave notice that tomorrow he would foreclose. End of section 18 The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain Section 19, Chapter 1 of 1916, First Chapters Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. 1916, First Chapters Collection by Various. Chapter 1. "'Well, now we've done all we can and all I mean to do,' said Alice Hooper, with a pettish accent of fatigue. "'Everything's perfectly comfortable, and if she doesn't like it, we can't help it. I don't know why we make such a fuss.' The speaker threw herself with a gesture of fatigue into a dilapidated basket chair that offered itself. 
it was a spring day and the windows of the old schoolroom in which she and her sister were sitting were open to a back garden untidily kept but full of fruit trees just coming into blossom through their twinkling buds and interlacing branches could be seen gray college walls part of the famous garden front of st cyprian's college oxford there seemed to be a slight bluish mist over the garden and the building a mist starred with patches of white and dazzling green leaf and above all there was an evening sky peaceful and luminous from which a light wind blew towards the two girls sitting by the open window one the elder had a face like a watteau sketch with black velvety eyes hair drawn back from a white forehead delicate little mouth with sharp indentations at the corners and a small chin the other was much more solidly built a girl of seventeen in a plump phase which however an intelligent eye would have read as not likely to last a complexion of red and brown tanned by exercise an expression in her clear eyes which was alternately frank and ironic and an inconvenient mass of golden brown hair we make a fuss my dear said the younger sister because we're bound to make a fuss connie i understand is to pay us a good round sum for her board and lodging so it's only honest she should have a decent room yes but you don't know what she'll call decent said the other rather sulkily she's probably been used to all sorts of silly luxuries why of course considering uncle risborough was supposed to have twenty odd thousand a year we're paupers and she's got to put up with us but we couldn't take her money and do nothing in return nora hooper looked rather sharply at her sister it fell to her in the family to be constantly upholding the small daily traditions of honesty and fair play it was she who championed the servants or insisted young as she was on bills being paid when it would have been more agreeable to buy frocks and go to london for a theatre she was a great power in the house and both her languid incompetent mother and her pretty sister were often afraid of her nora was a home student and had just begun to work seriously for english literature honors alice on the other hand was the domestic and social daughter she helped her mother in the house had a head full of undergraduates and regarded the eights week and commemoration as the shining events of the year both girls were however at one in the uneasy or excited anticipation with which they were looking forward that evening to the arrival of a newcomer who was it seemed to make part of the household for some time their father dr ewan hooper the holder of a recently founded classical readership had once possessed a younger sister of considerable beauty who in the course of an independent and adventurous career had captured by no ignoble arts a widower who happened to be also an earl and a rich man it happened while they were both wintering at florence the girl working at paleography in the ambrosian library while lord risborough occupying a villa in the neighbourhood of the torre san gallo was giving himself to the artistic researches and the cosmopolitan society which suited his health and his tastes he was a dilettante of the old sort incurably in love with living in spite of the loss of his wife and his only son in spite also of an impaired heart in the physical sense and various other drawbacks he came across the bright girl student discovered that she could talk very creditably about manuscripts and illuminations gave her leave to work in his own library where he possessed a few priceless things and presently found her company her soft voice and her eager confiding eyes quite indispensable his elderly sister lady winifred who kept house for him frowned on the business in vain and finally departed in a huff to join another maiden sister lady marcia in an english country menage where for some years she did little but lament the flesh-pots of italy florence the married sister lady langmore wrote reams of plaintive remonstrances which remained unanswered lord risborough married the girl student ella hooper and never regretted it they had one daughter 
to whom they devoted themselves preposterously their friends thought but for twenty years they were three happy people together then virulent influenza complicated with pneumonia carried off the mother during a spring visit to rome and six weeks later lord risborough died of the damaged heart which had held out so long the daughter lady constance bledlow had been herself attacked by the influenza epidemic which had killed her mother and the double blow of her parents deaths coming on a neurasthenic condition had hit her youth rather hard some old friends in rome with the full consent of her guardian the oxford reader had carried her off first to switzerland and then to the riviera for the winter and now in may about a year after the death of her parents she was coming for the first time to make acquaintance with the hooper family with whom according to her father's will she was to make her home till she was twenty-one none of them had ever seen her except on two occasions once at a hotel in london and once some ten years before this date when lord risborough had been dcl'd at the encania as a reward for some valuable gifts which he had made to the bodleian and he his wife and his little girl after they had duly appeared at the all souls luncheon and the official fete in st john's gardens had found their way to the house in holywell and taken tea with the hoopers nora's mind as she and her sister sat waiting for the fly in which mrs hooper had gone to meet her husband's niece at the station ran persistently on her own childish recollections of this visit she sat in the window-sill with her hand behind her chattering to her sister i remember thinking when connie came in here to tea with us what a stuck-up thing you are and i despised her because she couldn't climb the mulberry in the garden and because she hadn't begun latin but all the time i envied her horribly and i expect you did too alice can't you see her black silk stockings and her new hat with those awfully pretty flowers made of feathers she had a silk frock too white very skimp and short and enormously long black legs as thin as sticks and her hair in plaits i felt a thick lump beside her and i didn't like her at all what horrid toads children are she didn't talk to us much but her eyes seemed to be always laughing at us and when she talked italian to her mother i thought she was showing off and i wanted to pinch her for being affected why of course she talked italian said alice who was not much interested in her sister's recollections naturally but that didn't somehow occur to me after all i was only seven i wonder if she's really good-looking said alice slowly glancing as she spoke at the reflection of herself in an old dilapidated mirror which hung on the schoolroom wall the photos are said nora decidedly goodness i wish she'd come and get it over i want to get back to my work and till she comes i can't settle to anything well they'll be here directly i wonder what on earth she'll do with all her money father says she may spend it if she wants to he's trustee but uncle risborough's letter to him said she was to have the income if she wished now only she's not to touch the capital till she's twenty-five it's a good lot isn't it said nora walking about i wonder how many people in oxford have two thousand a year a girl too it's really rather exciting it won't be very nice for us she'll be so different alice's tone was a little sulky and depressed the advent of this girl cousin with her title her good looks her money and her unfair advantages in the way of talking french and italian was only moderately pleasant to the eldest miss hooper what you think she'll snuff us out laughed nora not she oxford's not like london people are not such snobs what a silly thing to say nora as if it wasn't an enormous pull everywhere to have a handle to your name and lots of money well i really think it'll matter less here than anywhere oxford my dear or some of it pursues the good and the beautiful said nora taking a flying leap onto the window-sill again and beginning to poke up some tadpoles in a jar which stood on the window ledge alice did not think it worth while to continue the conversation 
she had little or nothing of nora's belief in the otherworldliness of oxford at this period some thirty odd years ago the invasion of oxford on the north by whole new tribes of citizens had already begun the old days of university exclusiveness in a ring fence were long done with the days of much learning and simple ways when there were only two carriages in oxford that were not doctors carriages when the wives of professors and tutors went out to dinner in chairs drawn by men and no person within the magic circle of the university knew anybody to speak of in the town outside the university indeed at this later moment still more than held its own socially amid the waves of new population that threatened to submerge it and the occasional spectacle of retired generals and colonels the growing number of bromes and victorias in the streets or the rumours of persons with smart or county connections to be found among the rows of new villas spreading up the banbury road were still not sufficiently marked to disturb the essential character of the old and beautiful place but new ways and new manners were creeping in and the young were sensitively aware of them like birds that feel the signs of coming weather alice fell into a brown study she was thinking about a recent dance given at a house in the parks where some of her particular friends had been present and where on the whole she had enjoyed herself greatly nothing is ever perfect and she would have liked it better if herbert price's sister had not past all denying had more partners and a greater success than herself and if herbert price himself had not been just a little casual and inattentive but after all they had had two or three glorious supper dances and he certainly would have kissed her hand while they were sitting out in the garden if she had not made haste to put it out of his reach you never did anything of the kind till you were sure he did not mean to kiss it said conscience i did not give myself away in the least was vanity's angry reply i was perfectly dignified herbert price was a young fellow and tutor a mathematical fellow and therefore alice's father for whom greek was the only study worth the brains of a rational being could not be got to take the smallest interest in him but he was certainly very clever and it was said he was going to get a post at cambridge or something at the treasury which would enable him to marry alice suddenly had a vague vision of her own wedding the beautiful central figure she would certainly look beautiful in her wedding dress bowing so gracefully the bridesmaids behind in her favorite colors white and pale green and the tall man beside her but herbert price was not really tall and not particularly good-looking though he had a rather distinguished hatchet face with a good forehead suppose herbert and vernon and all her other friends were to give up being nice to her as soon as connie bledlow appeared suppose she was going to be altogether cut out and put in the background alice had a kind of uneasy foreboding that herbert price would think a title interesting meanwhile nora having looked through an essay on piers plowman which she was to take to her english literature tutor on the following day went aimlessly upstairs and put her head into connie's room the old house was panelled and its guest room though small and shabby had yet absorbed from its oaken walls and its outlook on the garden and st cyprian's a certain measure of the oxford charm the furniture was extremely simple a large hanging cupboard made by curtaining one of the panelled recesses of the wall a chest of drawers a bed a small dressing-table and glass a carpet that was the remains of one which had originally covered the drawing-room for many years an armchair a writing-table and curtains which having once been blue had now been dyed a serviceable though ugly dark red in nora's eyes it was all comfortable and nice she herself had insisted on having the carpet and curtains redipped so that they really looked almost new and the one mattress on the bed made over she had brought up the armchair and she had gathered the cherry blossoms which stood on the mantelpiece shining against the darkness of the walls she had also hung above it a photograph of watts love and death nora looked at the picture and the flowers 
with a throb of pleasure. Alice never noticed such things. And now, what about the maid? Fancy bringing a maid. Nora's sentiments on the subject were extremely scornful. However, Connie had simply taken it for granted, and she had been housed somehow. Nora climbed up an attic stair and looked into a room, which had a dormer window in the roof, two strips of carpet on the boards, a bed, a washing stand, a painted chest of drawers, a table with an old looking glass, and two chairs. Well, that's all I have, thought Nora defiantly, but a certain hospitable or democratic instinct made her go downstairs again and bring up a small vase of flowers like those in Connie's room and put it on the maid's table. The maid was English, but she had lived a long time abroad with the Risperos. Sounds. Yes, that was the fly stopping at the front door. Nora flew downstairs in a flush of excitement. Alice, too, had come out into the hall, looking shy and uncomfortable. Dr. Hooper emerged from his study. He was a big, loosely built man, with a shock of grizzled hair, spectacles, and a cheerful expression. A tall, slim girl, in a gray dust cloak and a large hat, entered the dark-paneled hall, looking round her. "'Welcome, my dear Connie,' said Dr. Hooper, cordially, taking her hand and kissing her. "'Your train must have been a little late.' Twenty minutes,' said Mrs. Hooper, who had followed her niece into the hall. "'And the drafts in the station, Ewan, were something appalling.' The tone was fretful. It had even a touch of indignation, as though the speaker charged her husband with the drafts. Mrs. Hooper was a woman between forty and fifty, small and plain, except for a pair of rather fine eyes, which in her youth, while her cheeks were still pink, and the obstinate lines of her thin slit mouth and prominent chin were less marked, had beguiled several lovers, you and Hooper at their head. Dr. Hooper took no notice of her complaints. He was saying to his niece, This is Alice, Constance, and Nora. You'll hardly remember each other again after all these years. Oh, yes, I remember quite well, said a clear, high-pitched voice. How do you do? How do you do? and the girl held a hand out to each cousin in turn. She did not offer to kiss either Alice or Nora, but she looked at them steadily, and suddenly Nora was aware of that expression of which she had so vivid, although so childish, a recollection, as though a satiric spirit sat hidden and laughing in the eyes, while the rest of the face was quite grave. "'Come in and have some tea. It's quite ready,' said Alice, throwing open the drawing-room door. Her face had cleared suddenly. It did not seem to her, at least in the shadows of the hall, that her cousin Constance was anything of a beauty. I'm afraid I must look after Annette first. She's much more important than I am. And the girl ran back to where a woman in a blue serge coat and skirt was superintending the carrying in of the luggage. There was a great deal of luggage, and Annette, who wore a rather cross, flushed air, turned round every now and then to look frowningly at the old gable house into which it was being carried, as though she were more than doubtful whether the building would hold the boxes. Yet as houses went in the older parts of Oxford, Medburn House Holywell was roomy. "'Annette, don't do any unpacking till after tea,' cried Lady Constance. "'Just get the boxes carried up and rest a bit. I'll come and help you later.' The maid said nothing. Her lips seemed tightly compressed. She stepped into the hall and spoke peremptorily to the white-capped parlor-maid who stood bewildered among the trunks. Have those boxes, she pointed to four, two large American Saratogas and two smaller trunks, carried up to her ladyship's room. The other two can go into mine. Miss, whispered the agitated maid in Nora's ear, We'll never get any of those boxes up the top stairs, and if we put them four into her ladyship's room, she'll not be able to move. I'll come and see to it, said Nora, snatching up a bag. They've got to go somewhere. Mrs. Hooper repeated that Nora would manage it, and languidly waved her niece towards the drawing room. The girl hesitated, laughed, and finally yielded, seeing that Nora was really in charge. Dr. Hooper led her in, placed an armchair for her beside the tea-table, and stood closely observing her. 
"'You're like your mother,' he said at last, in a low voice. "'At least in some points.' The girl turned away abruptly, as though what he said jarred, and addressed himself to Alice. Poor Annette was very sick. It was a vile crossing. "'Oh, the servants will look after her,' said Alice indifferently. "'Everybody has to look after Annette, or she'll know the reason why,' laughed Lady Constance, removing her black gloves from a very small and slender hand. She was dressed in deep mourning, with crepe still upon her hat and dress, though it was more than a year since her mother's death. Such mourning was not customary in Oxford, and Alice Hooper thought it affected. Mrs. Hooper then made the tea, but the newcomer paid little attention to the cup placed beside her. Her eyes wandered round the group at the tea table. Her uncle, a man of originally strong physique, marred now by the student's stoop, and by weak eyes, tried by years of Greek and German type. Her aunt. What a very odd woman Aunt Ellen is, thought Constance. For all the way from the station, Mrs. Hooper had talked about scarcely anything but her own ailments and the Oxford climate. She told us all about her rheumatisms and the east winds and how she ought to go to Buxton every year, only Uncle Hooper wouldn't take things seriously and she never asked us anything at all about our passage or our night journey and there was a net as yellow as an egg and as cross however dr hooper was soon engaged in making up for his wife's shortcomings he put his niece through many questions as to the year which had elapsed since her parents death her summer in the high alps and her winter at Caen. i never met your friends colonel and mrs king we are not military in Oxford, but they seem, to judge from their letters, to be very nice people, said the professor, his tone quite unconsciously suggesting the slightest shade of patronage. Oh, they're dear, said the girl warmly. They were awfully good to me. Con was very gay, I suppose. We saw a great many people in the afternoons. The kings knew everybody, but I didn't go out in the evenings. You weren't strong enough? I was in mourning, said the girl, looking at him with her large and brilliant eyes. Yes, yes, of course, murmured the reader, not quite understanding why he felt himself a trifle snubbed. He asked a few more questions, and his niece, who seemed to have no shyness, gave a rapid description, as she sipped her tea, of the villa at Caen, in which she had passed the winter months, and of the half-dozen families with whom she and her friends had been mostly thrown. Alice Hooper was secretly thrilled by some of the names which dropped out casually. She always read the accounts in the Queen, or the sketch, of smart society on the Riviera, and it was plain to her that Constance had been dreadfully in it. It would not apparently have been possible to be more in it. She was again conscious of a hot envy of her cousin, which made her unhappy. Also, Connie's good looks were becoming more evident. She had taken off her hat, and all the distinction of her small head, her slender neck, and sloping shoulders was more visible. Her self-possession, too, the ease and vivacity of her gestures. Her manner was that of one accustomed to a large and varied world, who took all things without surprise as they came. Dr. Hooper had felt some emotion and betrayed some in this meeting with his sister's motherless child but the girl's only betrayal of feeling had lain in the sharpness with which she had turned away from her uncle's threatened effusion. And how she looks at us, thought Alice, she looks at us through and through, yet she doesn't stare. But at that moment Alice heard the word prince, and her attention was instantly arrested. We had some Russian neighbors, the newcomer was saying, Prince and Princess Yaroslav, and they had an English party at Christmas. It was great fun. They used to take us out riding into the mountains or into Italy. She paused a moment and then said carelessly, as though to keep up the conversation, there was a Mr. Falloden with them, an undergraduate at Marmion College, I think. Do you know him, Aunt Ellen? She turned towards her aunt. But Mrs. Hooper only looked blank. She was just thinking anxiously that she had forgotten to take her tabloids after lunch because Ewan had hustled her off so much too soon to the station. I don't think we know him, she said vaguely, turning towards Alice. 
we know all about him he was introduced to me once the tone of the eldest miss hooper could scarcely have been colder the eyes of the girl opposite suddenly sparkled into laughter you didn't like him nobody does he gives himself such ridiculous airs does he said constance the information seemed to be of no interest to her she asked for another cup of tea oh falloden of marmion said dr hooper i know him quite well one of the best pupils i have but i understand he's the heir to his old uncle lord dagnall and is going to be enormously rich his father's a millionaire already so of course he'll soon forget his greek a horrid waste he's detested in college alice's small face lit up vindictively there's a whole set of them other people call them the bloods the dons would like to send them all down they won't send falloden down my dear before he gets his first in greats which he will do this summer but this is his last term i never knew any one write better greek iambics than that fellow said the reader pausing in the middle of his cup of tea to murmur certain greek lines to himself they were part of the brilliant copy of verses by which douglas falloden of marmion in a fiercely contested year had finally won the ireland ewan hooper being one of the examiners that's what's so abominable said alice setting her small mouth you don't expect reading men to drink and get into rows drink said constance bledlow raising her eyebrows alice went into details the dons of marmion she said were really frightened by the spread of drinking in college all caused by the bad example of the falloden set she talked fast and angrily and her cousin listened half scornfully but still attentively why don't they keep him in order she said at last we did and she made a little gesture with her hand impatient and masterful as though dismissing the subject and at that moment nora came into the room flushed either with physical exertion or the consciousness of her own virtue she found a place at the tea-table and panting a little demanded to be fed it's hungry work carrying up trunks you didn't exclaimed constance in large-eyed astonishment i say i am sorry why did you i'm sure they were too heavy why didn't annette get a man and sitting up she bent across the table all charmed suddenly and soft distress we did get one but he was a wretched thing i was worth two of him said nora triumphantly you should feel my biceps there and slipping up her loose sleeve she showed an arm at which constance bledlow laughed and her laugh touched her face with something audacious something wild which transformed it i shall take care how i offend you nora nodded over her tea your maid was shocked she said i might as well have been a man it's quite true sighed mrs hooper you always were such a tomboy nora not at all but i wish to develop my muscles that's why i do swedish exercises every morning it's ridiculous how flabby girls are there isn't a girl in my lecture i can't put down if you like i'll teach you my exercises said nora her mouth full of tea cake and her expression half friendly half patronizing connie bledlow did not immediately reply she seemed to be quietly examining nora as she had already examined alice and that odd gleam in the eyes under depths appeared again but at last she said smiling thank you but my muscles are quite strong enough for the only exercise i want you said i might have a horse uncle ewan didn't you she turned eagerly to the master of the house dr hooper looked at his wife with some embarrassment i want you to have anything you wish for in reason my dear connie but your aunt is rather exercised about the proprieties the small dried-up woman behind the tea urn said sharply a girl can't ride alone in oxford she'd be talked about at once lady connie flushed mutinously i could take a groom aunt ellen well i don't approve of it said mrs hooper in the half plaintive tone of one who must speak although no one listens but of course your uncle must decide we'll talk it over my dear connie we'll talk it over said dr hooper cheerfully now wouldn't you like nora to show you to your room the girls went upstairs together nora leading the way 
"'It's an awful squash in your room,' said Nora abruptly. "'I don't know how you'll manage.' "'My fault, I suppose, for bringing so many things. "'But where else could I put them?' Nora nodded gravely, as though considering the excuse. The newcomer suddenly felt herself criticized by this odd schoolgirl, and resented it. The door of the spare room was open, and the girls entered upon a scene of chaos. Annette rose from her knees, showing a brick-red countenance of wrath that strove in vain for any sort of dignity. And again that look of distant laughter came into Lady Connie's eyes. "'My dear Annette, why aren't you having a rest, as I told you? I can do with anything to-night. Well, my lady, if you tell me how you'll get into bed, unless I put some of these things away, I should be obliged, said Annette, with a dark look at Nora. I've asked for a wardrobe for you, and this young lady says there isn't one. There's that hanging cupboard, she pointed witheringly to the curtained recess. Your dresses will be ruined there in a fortnight. And there's that chest of drawers. Your things will have to stay in the trunks as far as I can see, and then you might as well sleep on them. It would give you more room. With which stroke of sarcasm, Annette returned to the angry unpacking of her mistress's bag. I must buy a wardrobe, said Connie, looking round her in perplexity. Never mind, Annette, I can easily buy one. It was now Nora's turn to color. You mustn't do that, she said firmly. Father wouldn't like it. We'll find something. But do you want such a lot of things? She looked at the floor, heaped with every variety of delicate mourning. Black dresses, thick and thin, for morning and afternoon, and black and white or pure white for the evening. And what had happened to the bed? It was already divested of the twilled cotton sheets and Marcella quilt, which were all the Hoopers ever allowed either to themselves or their guests. They had been replaced by sheets of the finest and smoothest linen, embroidered with a crest and monogram in the corners, and by a coverlet of old Italian lace lined with pale blue silk, while the down pillows at the head, with their embroidered and lace-trimmed slips, completed the transformation of what had been a bed, and was now almost a work of art. And the dressing table. Nora went up to it in amazement. It, too, was spread with lace lined with silk, and covered with a toilet set of mother-of-pearl and silver. Every brush and bottle was crested and initialed. The humble-looking glass, which Nora, who was something of a carpenter, had herself mended before her cousin's arrival, was standing on the floor in a corner, and a folding mirror framed in embossed silver had taken its place. "'I say, do you always travel with these things?' The girl stood open-mouthed, half-astonished, half-contemptuous. "'What things?' Nora pointed to the toilet table and the bed. Connie's expression showed an answering astonishment. "'I have had them all my life,' she said stiffly. "'We always took our own linen to hotels and made our rooms nice.' "'I should think you'd be afraid of their being stolen.' Nora took up one of the costly brushes and examined it in wonder. "'Why should I be? They're nothing. They're just like other people's.' With a slight but haughty change of manner, the girl turned away and began to talk Italian to her maid. "'I never saw anything like them,' said Nora stoutly. Constance Bloodlow took no notice. She and Annette were chattering fast, and Nora could not understand a word. She stood by, awkward and superfluous, feeling certain that the maid, who was gesticulating, now towards the ceiling and now towards the floor, was complaining both of her own room and of the kitchen accommodation. Her mistress listened carelessly, occasionally trying to soothe her, and in the middle of the stream of talk, Nora slipped away. "'It's horrid, spending all that money on yourself,' thought the girl of seventeen indignantly, and in Oxford, too, as if anybody wanted such things here. Meanwhile, she was no sooner gone than her cousin sank down on the armchair and broke into a slightly hysterical fit of laughter. "'Can we stand it, Annette?' we've got to try of course you can leave me if you choose and i should like to know how you'd get on then said annette grimly beginning again upon the boxes well of course i shouldn't get on at all but really we might give away a lot of these clothes i shall never want them the speaker looked frowning at the stacks of dresses 
and lingerie annette made no reply but went on busily with her unpacking if the clothes were to be got rid of they were her perquisites she was devoted to constance but she stood on her rights presently a little space was cleared on the floor and constance seeing that it was nearly seven o'clock and the hoopers supped at half past took off her black dress with its crepe and put on a white one high to the throat and long sleeved a french demi-toilette plain and even severe in make but cut by the best dressmaker in nice she looked extraordinarily tall and slim in it and very foreign her maid clasped a long string of opals which was her only ornament about her neck she gave one look at herself in the glass holding herself proudly one might have said arrogantly but as she turned away and so that annette could not see her she raised the opals and held them a moment softly to her lips her mother had habitually worn them then she moved to the window and looked out over the hooper's private garden to the spreading college lawns and the gray front beyond am i really going to stay here a whole year nearly she asked herself half laughing half rebellious then her eye fell upon a medley of photographs snaps from her own camera which had tumbled out of her bag in unpacking the topmost one represented a group of young men and maidens standing under a group of stone pines in a riviera landscape she herself was in front with a tall youth beside her she bent down to look at it i shall come across him i suppose before long and raising herself she stood a while thinking her face alive with an excitement that was half expectation and half angry recollection end of section nineteen lady connie by mrs humphrey ward section twenty of nineteen sixteen first chapters collection this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Fournier, Centerville, Virginia, USA. 1916 First Chapters Collection by Various Section 20 Mr. Britling Sees It Through by H. G. Wells Book 1 Matching's Easy at Ease Chapter the First Mr. Derrick Visits Mr. Britling 1. It was the sixth day of Mr. Derrick's first visit to England, and he was at his acutest perception of differences. He found England in every way gratifying and satisfactory, and more of a contrast with things American than he had ever dared to hope. He had promised himself this visit for many years, but being of a sunny rather than energetic temperament, though he firmly believed himself to be a reservoir of clear-sighted American energy. He had allowed all sorts of things, and more particularly the uncertainties of Miss Mamie Nelson, to keep him back. But now there were no more uncertainties about Miss Mamie Nelson, and Mr. Derrick had come over to England just to convince himself and everybody else that there were other interests in life for him than Mamie. And also... He wanted to see the old country from which his maternal grandmother had sprung. Wasn't there even now in his bedroom in New York a watercolor of Market Saffron Church, where the dear old lady had been confirmed? And generally, he wanted to see Europe. As an interesting sideshow to the excursion, he hoped, in his capacity of the rather underworked and rather over-salaried secretary of the Massachusetts Society for the Study of Contemporary Thought, to discuss certain agreeable possibilities with Mr. Britling, who lived at Matching's Easy. Mr. Derrick was a type of man not uncommon in America. He was very much after the fashion of that clean and pleasant-looking person one sees in the advertisements in American magazines, that agreeable person who smiles and says, Good, it's the Fizzgig brand. Or, yes, it's a Wilkins, and that's the best. Or, my shirt front never rucks, it's a Chesson. But now he was saying, still with the same firm smile, good, it's English. 
He was pleased by every unlikeness to things American, by every item he could hail as characteristic. In the train to London, he had laughed aloud with pleasure at the checkerboard of little fields upon the hills of Cheshire. He had chuckled to find himself in a compartment without a corridor. He had tipped the polite yet kindly guard magnificently, after doubting for a moment whether he ought to tip him at all. And he had gone about his hotel in London saying, Lordy, Lordy, my word, in a kind of ecstasy, verifying the delightful absence of telephone, of steam heat, of any dependent bathroom. At breakfast, the waiter, out of Dickens it seemed, had refused to know what cereals were, and had given him his egg in a china egg cup, such as you see in the pictures in Punch. The Thames, when he sallied out to see it, had been too good to be true, the smallest thing in rivers he had ever seen, and he had had to restrain himself from affecting a marked accent and accosting some passer-by with the question, Say, but is this little wet ditch here the historical River Thames? In America, it must be explained, Mr. Derrick spoke a very good and careful English indeed, but he now found the utmost difficulty in controlling his impulse to use a high-pitched nasal drone and indulge in dry Americanisms and poker metaphors upon all occasions. When people asked him questions, he wanted to say, yep, or sure, words he would no more have used in America than he could have used a bowie knife. But he had a sense of role. He wanted to be visibly and audibly America eyewitnessing. He wanted to be just exactly what he supposed an Englishman would expect him to be. At any rate, his clothes had been made by a strongly American New York tailor, and upon the strength of them, a taxi man had assumed politely but firmly that the shillings on his taximeter were dollars, an incident that helped greatly to sustain the effect of Mr. Derrick, in Mr. Derrick's mind, as something standing out with an almost representative clearness against the English scene. So much so that the taxi man got the dollars because all the time he had been coming over, he had dreaded that it wasn't true. That England was a legend, that London would turn out to be just another thundering great New York, and the English exactly like New Englanders. 2. And now, here he was on the branch line of the little old Great Eastern Railway, on his way to Matching's Easy in Essex, and he was suddenly in the heart of Washington Irving's England. Washington Irving's England. Indeed it was. He couldn't sit still and just peep at it. He had to stand up in the little compartment and stick his large, firm-featured, kindly countenance out of the window as if he greeted it. The country under the June sunshine was neat and bright as an old-world garden, with little fields of corn surrounded by dog-rose hedges, and woods and small rushy pastures of an infinite tidiness. He had seen a real deer park. It had rather tumble-down iron gates between its shield-surmounted pillars, and in the distance, beyond all question, was Bracebridge Hall nestling among great trees. He had seen thatched and timbered cottages, and half a dozen inns with creaking signs. He had seen a fat vicar driving himself along a grassy lane in a governess cart drawn by a fat gray pony. It wasn't like any reality he had ever known. It was like traveling in literature. Mr. Britling's address was the Dower House, and it was, Mr. Britling's note had explained, on the farther edge of the park at Clavering's. Clavering's the very name for some stately home of England. And yet this was only 42 miles from London. Surely it brought things within the suburban range. If Matching's Easy were in America, commuters would live there. But in supposing that, 
Mr. Derrick displayed his ignorance of a fact of the greatest importance to all who would understand England. There is a gap in the suburbs of London. The suburbs of London stretch west and south, and even west by north, but to the northeastward there are no suburbs. Instead, there is Essex. Essex is not a suburban county. It is a characteristic and individualized county which wins the heart. Between dear Essex and the center of things lie two great barriers, the east end of London and Epping Forest. Before a train could get to any villadom with a cargo of season ticket holders, it would have to circle about this rescued woodland and travel for twenty unprofitable miles. And so, once you are away from the main Great Eastern lines, Essex still lives in the peace of the 18th century, and London, the modern Babylon, is, like the stars, just a light in the nocturnal sky. In Matching's Easy, as Mr. Britling presently explained to Mr. Derrick, there are half a dozen old people who have never set eyes on London in their lives, and do not want to. I yeah. Fussin' about that. Mr. Robinson, he went to London, he did. That's how he hurt his foot. Mr. Derrick had learnt at the main line junction that he had to tell the guard to stop the train for matching's easy. It only stopped by request. The thing was getting better and better. And when Mr. Derrick seized his grip and got out of the train, there was just one little old Essex station master and porter and signalman, and everything, holding a red flag in his hand, and talking to Mr. Britling about the cultivation of the sweet peas which glorified the station. And there was the Mr. Britling, who was the only item of business and the greatest expectation in Mr. Derrick's European journey, and he was quite unlike the portraits Mr. Derrick had seen, and quite unmistakably Mr. Britling all the same since there was nobody else upon the platform, and he was advancing with a gesture of welcome. "'Did you ever see such peas, Mr. Dick?' said Mr. Britling by way of introduction. "'My word,' said Mr. Derrick, in a good old farmer hayseed kind of voice. "'Ah, yeah,' said the station-master, in singularly strident tones. "'It be a rare year for sweet peas.' And then he slammed the door of the carriage in a leisurely manner, and did dismissive things with his flag, while the two gentlemen took stock, as people say, of one another. 3. Except in the doubtful instance of Miss Mamie Nelson, Mr. Derrick's habit was good fortune. Pleasant things came to him. Such was his position as the salaried secretary of this society of thoughtful Massachusetts businessmen, to which allusion has been made. Its purpose was to bring itself expeditiously into touch with the best thought of the age. Too busily occupied with practical realities, to follow the thought of the age through all its divagations and into all its recesses, these Massachusetts businessmen had had to consider methods of access more quintessential and nuclear. And they had decided not to hunt out the best thought in its merely germinating stages, but to wait until it had emerged and flowered to some trustworthy recognition, and then, rather than toil through recondite and possibly already reconsidered books and writings generally, to offer an impressive fee to the emerged new thinker, and to invite him to come to them, and to lecture to them, and to have a conference with them, and to tell them simply, competently, and completely at first hand, just all that he was about. To come, in fact, and be himself, in a highly concentrated form. In this way, a number of interesting Europeans had been given very pleasant excursions to America, and the society had been able to form very definite opinions upon their teaching. And Mr. Britling was one of the representative thinkers upon which this society had decided to inform itself. It was to broach this invitation, and to offer him the impressive honorarium by which the society honored not only its guests, but itself, that Mr. Derrick had now come to Matching's Easy. He had already sent Mr. Britling a letter of introduction, 
not indeed intimating his precise purpose, but mentioning merely a desire to know him. And the letter had been so happily phrased, and its writer had left such a memory of pleasant hospitality on Mr. Britling's mind during Mr. Britling's former visit to New York, that it had immediately produced for Mr. Derrick an invitation not merely to come and see him, but to come and stay over the weekend. And here they were shaking hands. Mr. Britling did not look at all as Mr. Derrick had expected him to look. He had expected an Englishman in a country costume of golfing tweeds, like the Englishman in country costume one sees in American illustrated stories. Drooping out of the country costume of golfing tweeds, he had expected to see the mildly unhappy face, pensive even to its drooping mustache, with which Mr. Britling's publisher had for some faulty and unfortunate reason familiarized the American public. Instead of this, Mr. Britling was in a miscellaneous costume, and mildness was the last quality one could attribute to him. His mustache, his hair, his eyebrows bristled. His flaming, freckled face seemed to bristle too. His little hazel eyes came out with a ping and looked at Mr. Derrick. Mr. Britling was one of a large but still remarkable class of people who seem at the mere approach of photography to change their hair, their clothes, their moral natures. No photographer had ever caught a hint of his essential brittlingness and bristlingness. Only the camera could ever induce Mr. Britling to brush his hair, and for the camera alone did he reserve that expression of submissive martyrdom Mr. Derrick knew. And Mr. Derrick was altogether unprepared for a certain casualness of costume that sometimes overtook Mr. Britling. He was wearing now a very old blue flannel blazer, no hat, and a pair of knickerbockers. Not tweed breeches, but tweed knickerbockers, of a remarkable bagginess, and made of one of those virtuous socialistic homespun tweeds that drag out into woolly knots and strings wherever there is attrition. His stockings were worsted and wrinkled, and on his feet were those extraordinary slippers of bright-colored, bast-like interwoven material one buys in the north of France. These were purple with a touch of green. He had, in fact, thought of the necessity of meeting Mr. Derrick at the station at the very last moment, and had come away from his study in the clothes that had happened to him when he got up. His face wore the amiable expression of a wired-haired terrier disposed to be friendly, and it struck Mr. Derrick that for a man of his real intellectual distinction, Mr. Britling was unusually short. For there can be no denying that Mr. Britling was, in a sense, distinguished. The hero and subject of this novel was at its very beginning a distinguished man. He was in the who's who of two continents. In the last few years, he had grown with some rapidity into a writer recognized and welcomed by the more cultivated sections of the American public, and even known to a select circle of British readers. To his American discoverers, he had first appeared as an essayist, a serious essayist, who wrote about aesthetics and oriental thought and national character and poets and painting. He had come through America some years ago as one of those Khan scholars, those promising writers and intelligent men endowed by Auguste Kahn of Paris, who go about the world nowadays in comfort and consideration as the traveling guests of that original philanthropist, to acquire the international spirit. Previously, he had been a critic of art and literature, and a writer of thoughtful third leaders in the London Times. He had begun with a Pembroke Fellowship and a prize poem. He had returned from his world tour to his reflective yet original corner of the Times, and to the production of books about national relationships and social psychology that had brought him rapidly into prominence. His was a naturally irritable mind, which gave him point and passion, and moreover, he had a certain obstinate originality and a generous disposition, so that he was always lively, sometimes spacious, and never vile. He loved to write and talk. He talked about everything. He had ideas about everything. 
he could no more help having ideas about everything than a dog can resist smelling at your heels. He sniffed at the heels of reality. Lots of people found him interesting and stimulating. A few found him seriously exasperating. He had ideas in the utmost profusion about races and empires and social order and political institutions and gardens and automobiles and the future of India and China and aesthetics and America and the education of mankind in general and all that sort of thing. Mr. Derrick had read a very great deal of all this expressed opinionativeness of Mr. Britling. He found it entertaining and stimulating stuff and it was with genuine enthusiasm that he had come over to encounter the man himself. On his way across the Atlantic, and during the intervening days, he had rehearsed this meeting in varying keys, but always on the supposition that Mr. Britling was a large, quiet, thoughtful sort of man, a man who would, as it were, sit in attentive rows like a public meeting and listen. So Mr. Derrick had prepared quite a number of pleasant and attractive openings, and now he felt was the moment for some one of these various, simple, memorable utterances. But in none of these forecasts had he reckoned with either the spontaneous activities of Mr. Britling or with the station master of Matching's Easy. Oblivious of any conversational necessities between Mr. Derrick and Mr. Britling, this official now took charge of Mr. Derrick's grip sack and, falling into line with the two gentlemen as they walked towards the exit gate, resumed what was evidently an interrupted discourse upon sweet peas, originally addressed to Mr. Britling. He was a small elderly man, with a determined-looking face and a sea voice, and it was clear he overestimated the distance of his hearers. Mr. Darling, what's head gardener up at Clavering's, he can't get sweet peas like that, try how he will, tried everything he has, sand ballast he's tried, seed same as me. He came along here only the other day, he did, and he says to me, he says, darned if I can see why a station master should beat a professional garter at his own game, he says, but you do. And in your orf time too, so to speak, he says, I've tried style, he says. Your first visit to England? asked Mr. Britling of his guest. Absolutely, said Mr. Derrick. I says to him, there's one thing you haven't tried, I says. The station master continued raising his voice by a Herculean feat still higher. "'I've got a little car outside here,' said Mr. Britling. "'I'm a couple of miles from the station. "'I says to him, I says, "'Have you tried the vibration of the trains?' "'I says, "'That's what you haven't tried, Mr. Darling. "'That's what you can't try,' I says. "'But you rest assured that that's the secret of my sweet peas,' I says. "'Nothing less and nothing more than the vibration of the trains.' Mr. Derrick's mind was a little confused by the double nature of the conversation, and by the fact that Mr. Britling spoke of a car when he meant an automobile. He handed his ticket mechanically to the station master, who continued to repeat and endorse his anecdote at the top of his voice, as Mr. Britling disposed himself and his guest in the automobile. "'You know you haven't hurt that mudguard, sir, not the slightest bit that matters,' shouted the station master. "'I've been a-looking at it here.' It's my fence that suffered the most, and that's only strained the post a little bit. Shall I put your bag in behind, sir? Mr. Derrick assented, and then, after a momentary hesitation, rewarded the station master's services. Ready? asked Mr. Britling. That's all right, sir, the station master reverberated. With a rather wide curve, Mr. Britling steered his way out of the station into the high road. Four. And now it seemed was the time for Mr. Derrick to make his meditated speeches. But an unexpected complication was to defeat this intention. Mr. Derrick perceived, almost at once, that Mr. Britling was probably driving an automobile for the first, or second, or at the extremist, the third time in his life. The thing became evident when he struggled to get it into the high gear, an attempt that stopped the engine, and it was even more startlingly so when Mr. Britling narrowly missed a collision with a baker's cart at the corner. I pressed the accelerator, he explained afterwards, instead of the brake. One does it first. I missed him by less than a foot. The estimate was a generous one. And after that, Mr. Derrick became too anxious not to distract his host's thoughts 
to persist with his conversational openings. An attentive silence came upon both gentlemen that was broken presently by a sudden outcry from Mr. Britling and a great noise of tormented gears. Damn! cried Mr. Britling. And how the devil? Mr. Derrick perceived that his host was trying to turn the car into a very beautiful gateway, with gatehouses on either side. Then it was manifest that Mr. Britling had abandoned this idea, and then they came to a stop a dozen yards or so along the main road. Missed it, said Mr. Britling, and took his hands off the steering wheel and blew stormily, and then whistled some bars of a fretful air, and became still. Do we go through those ancient gates? asked Mr. Derrick. Mr. Britling looked over his right shoulder, and considered problems of curvature and distance. I think, he said, I will go round outside the park. It will take us a little longer, but it will be simpler than backing and maneuvering here now. These electric starters are remarkably convenient things. Otherwise now, I should have to get down and wind up the engine. After that came a corner, the rounding of which seemed to present few difficulties, until suddenly Mr. Britling cried out, Eh, 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 oh, damn! Then the two gentlemen were sitting side by side in a rather sloping car that had ascended the bank and buried its nose in a hedge of dog rose and honeysuckle, from which two missile thrushes, a blackbird, and a number of sparrows had made a hurried escape. Five. Perhaps, said Mr. Britling without assurance, and after a little peaceful pause, I can reverse out of this. He seemed to feel some explanation was due to Mr. Derrick. You see, at first, it's perfectly simple. One steers round a corner, and then one doesn't put the wheels straight again, and so one keeps on going round, more than one meant to. It's the bicycle habit. The bicycle writes itself. One expects a car to do the same thing. It was my fault. The book explains all this question clearly, but just at the moment I forgot. He reflected and experimented in a way that made the engine scold and fuss. You see, she won't budge for the reverse. She's embedded. Do you mind getting out and turning the wheel back? Then if I reverse, perhaps we'll get a move on. Mr. Derrick descended, and there were considerable efforts. If you just grip the spokes, yes, so. One, two, three. No, well, let's just sit here until somebody comes along to help us. Oh, somebody will come all right. Won't you get up again? And after a reflective moment, Mr. Derrick resumed his seat beside Mr. Britling. Six. The two gentlemen smiled at each other to dispel any suspicion of discontent. My driving leaves something to be desired, said Mr. Britling with an air of frank impartiality. But I have only just got this car for myself, after some years of hired cars. The sort of lazy arrangement where people supply a car, driver, petrol, tires, insurance, and everything at so much a month. It bored me abominably. I can't imagine now how I stood it for so long. They sent me down a succession of compact, scornful boys, who used to go so fast when I wanted to go slow, and slow when I wanted to go fast, and who used to take every corner on the wrong side at top speed, and charge dogs and hens for the sport of it and all sorts of things like that. They would not even let me choose my roads. I should have got myself a car long ago and driven it. If it wasn't for that infernal business with a handle one had to do when the engine stopped. But here, you see, is a reasonably cheap car, with an electric starter. American, I need scarcely say. And here I am, going at my own pace. Mr. Derrick glanced for a moment at the pretty disorder of the hedge in which they were embedded, and smiled and admitted that it was certainly much more agreeable. Before he had finished saying as much, Mr. Britling was talking again. He had a quick and rather jerky way of speaking. He seemed to fire out a thought directly it came into his mind, and he seemed to have a loaded magazine of thoughts in his head. He spoke almost exactly twice as fast as Mr. Derrick, clipping his words much more, using much compacter sentences, and generally cutting his corners, and this put Mr. Derrick off his game. That rapid attack, while the transatlantic interlocutor is deploying, 
is indeed a not infrequent defect of conversations between Englishmen and Americans. It is a source of many misunderstandings. The two conceptions of conversation differ fundamentally. The English are much less disposed to listen than the American. They have not quite the same sense of conversational give and take, and at first are apt to reduce their visitors to the role of auditors, wondering when their turn will begin. Their turn never does begin. Mr. Derrick sat deeply in his slanting seat, with half a face to his celebrated host, and said, Yep, and sure, and that is so, in the dry, grave tones that he believed an Englishman would naturally expect him to use, realizing this only very gradually. Mr. Britling, from his praise of the enterprise that had at last brought a car he could drive within his reach, went on to that favorite topic of all intelligent Englishmen, the adverse criticism of things British. He pointed out that the central position of the brake and gear levers in his automobile made it extremely easy for the American manufacturer to turn it either as a left-handed or a right-handed car, and so adapt it either to the continental or to the British rule of the road. No English cars were so adaptable. We British suffered much from our insular rule of the road, just as we suffered much from our insular weights and measures. But we took a perverse pride in such disadvantages. The inruption of American cars into England was a recent phenomenon. It was another triumph for the tremendous organizing ability of the American mind. They were doing with the automobile what they had done with clocks and watches and rifles. They had standardized and machined wholesale, while the British were still making the things one by one. It was an extraordinary thing that England, which was the originator of the industrial system and the original developer of the division of labor, should have so fallen away from systemic manufacturing. He believed this was largely due to the influence of Oxford and the established church. At this point, Mr. Derrick was moved by an anecdote. It will help illustrate what you are saying, Mr. Brittening, about systemic organization, if I tell you a little incident that happened to a friend of mine in Toledo, where they were setting up a big plant with a view to capturing the entire American and European market in the class of the thousand-dollar car. There's no end to such little incidents, said Mr. Brittling, cutting in without apparent effort. You see, we get it on both sides. Our manufacturer class was, of course, originally an insurgent class. It was a class of distended craftsmen. It had the craftsman natural expertise and natural radicalism. As soon as it prospered and sent its boys to Oxford, it was lost. Our manufacturing class was assimilated in no time to the conservative classes, whose education has always had a Mandarin quality, very, very little of it, and very cold and choice. In America, you have so far had no real conservative class at all, fortunate continent. You cast out your Tories, and you were left with nothing but Whigs and Radicals. But our peculiar bad luck has been to get a sort of revolutionary who was a Tory Mandarin too. Ruskin and Morris, for example, were as reactionary and anti-scientific as the Dukes and the Bishops. Machine haters, science haters, rule of thumbites to the bone. So are our current socialists. They've filled this country with the idea that the ideal automobile ought to be made entirely by the hand labor of traditional craftsmen, quite individually, out of beaten copper, wrought iron, and seasoned oak. All this electric starter business and this electric lighting outfit I have here is perfectly hateful to the English mind. It isn't that we are simply backward in these things. We are antagonistic. The British mind has never really tolerated electricity, at least not that sort of electricity that runs through wires, too slippery and glib for it, associates it with Italians and fluency general, with Volta, Galvani, Marconi, and so on. The proper British electricity is that high-grade, useless, long-sparking stuff you get by turning round a glass machine, stuff we used to call frictional electricity, keep it in Leiden jars. At Clavering's here, they still refuse to have electric bells. There was a row when the Solomonses, who were tenants here for a time, tried to put them in. Mr. Derrick had followed this cascade of remarks with a patient smile 
and a slowly nodding head. "'What you say,' he said, "'forms a very marked contrast indeed with the sort of thing that goes on in America. This friend of mine I was speaking of, the one who is connected with an automobile factory in Toledo, of course, Mr. Britling burst out again, even conservatism isn't an ultimate thing. After all, we and your enterprising friend at Toledo are very much the same blood. The conservatism, I mean, isn't racial, and our earlier energy shows it isn't in the air or in the soil. England has become unenterprising and sluggish, because England has been so prosperous and comfortable. Exactly, said Mr. Derrick. My friend, of whom I was telling you, was a man named Robinson, which indicates pretty clearly that he was of genuine English stock, and if I may say so, quite on your build and complexion. Racially, I should say he was, well, very much what you are. 7. This rally of Mr. Derrick's mind was suddenly interrupted. Mr. Britling stood up, and putting both hands to the sides of his mouth, shouted, Yea! Aia! There! at unseen hearers. After shouting again several times, it became manifest that he had attracted the attention of two willing but deliberate laboring men. They emerged slowly, first as attentive heads from the landscape. With their assistance, the car was restored to the road again. Mr. Derrick assisted manfully, and noted the respect that was given to Mr. Britling and the shillings that fell to the men, with an intelligent detachment. They touched their hats, they called Mr. Britling sir, they examined the car distantly, but kindly. "'Ain't Erdy, not a bit he ain't, not really,' said one encouragingly. And indeed, except for a slight crumpling of the mudguard and the detachment of the wire of one of the headlamps, the automobile was uninjured. Mr. Britling resumed his seat. Mr. Derrick gravely and in silence got up beside him. They started with the usual convulsion, as though something had pricked the vehicle unexpectedly and shamefully behind. And from this point Mr. Britling, driving with meticulous care, got home without further mishap, excepting only that he scraped off some of the metal edge of his footboard against the gatepost of his very agreeable garden. His family welcomed his safe return, visitor and all, with undisguised relief and admiration. A small boy appeared at the corner of the house, then disappeared hastily again. Betty's got back all right at last, they heard him shouting to unseen hearers. 8. Mr. Derrick, though he was a little incommoded by the suppression of his story about Robinson, for when he had begun a thing he liked to finish it, found Mr. Britling's household at once thoroughly British, quite un-American, and a little difficult to follow. It had a quality that at first he could not define at all. Compared with anything he had ever seen in his life before, it struck him as being, he found the word at last, sketchy. For instance, he was introduced to nobody except his hostess, and she was indicated to him by a mere wave of Mr. Britling's hand. That's Edith, he said, and returned at once to his car to put it away. Mrs. Britling was a tall, freckled woman with pretty, bright brown hair and preoccupied brown eyes. She welcomed him with a handshake, and then a wonderful English parlor-maid, she at least was according to expectations, took his gripsack and guided him to his room. Lunch, sir, she said, is outside, and closed the door and left him to that and a towel-covered can of hot water. It was a square-looking, old, red-brick house he had come to, very handsome in a simple Georgian fashion, with a broad lawn before it and great blue cedar trees, and a drive that came frankly up to the front door and then went off with Mr. Britling and the car round to unknown regions at the back. The center of the house was a big, airy hall, oak-paneled, warmed in winter only by one large fireplace, and abounding in doors which he knew opened into the square separate rooms that England favors. 
Bookshelves and stuffed birds comforted the landing outside his bedroom. He descended to find the hall occupied by a small, bright, bristling boy in white flannel shirt and knickerbockers and bare legs and feet. He stood before the vacant open fireplace in an attitude that Mr. Derrick knew instantly was also Mr. Britling's. "'Lunch is in the garden,' the Britling scion proclaimed, "'and I've got to fetch you. "'And I say, is it true? Are you American?' "'Why, surely,' said Mr. Derrick. "'Well, I know some American,' said the boy. "'I learnt it.' "'Tell me some,' said Mr. Derrick smiling still more amiably. Oh, well, God darn you. Ouch. Gee whiz. Soak him, Maud. It's up to you, Duke. Now, where did you learn all that? asked Mr. Derrick, recovering. Out of the Sunday supplement, said the youthful Britling. Why, then you know all about Buster Brown, said Mr. Derrick. He's fine, eh? The Britling child hated Buster Brown. He regarded Buster Brown as a totally unnecessary infant. He detested the way he wore his hair and the peculiar cut of his knickerbockers and him. He thought Buster Brown the one drop of paraffin in the otherwise delicious feast of the Sunday supplement. But he was a diplomatic child. I think I like Happy Hooligan better, he said, and that old Maud. He reflected with joyful eyes, Buster clean forgotten. Every week, he said, she kicks someone. It came to Mr. Derrick as a very pleasant discovery that a British infant could find a common ground with the small people at home in these characteristically American jests. He had never dreamt that the fine wine of Maud and Buster could travel. Maud's a treat, said the youthful Britling, relapsing into his native tongue. Mr. Britling appeared coming to meet them. He was now in a grey flannel suit. He must have jumped into it, and altogether very much tidier. 9. The long, narrow table under the big sycamores between the house and the adapted barn that Mr. Derrick learnt was used for dancing and all that sort of thing, was covered with a blue linen diaper cloth, and that too surprised him. This was his first meal in a private household in England, and for some obscure reasons he had expected something very stiff and formal with spotless napery. He had also expected a very stiff and capable service by implacable parlour-maids, and the whole thing indeed highly genteel. But two cheerful women servants appeared from what was presumably the kitchen direction, wheeling a curious wicker erection, which his small guide informed him was called Aunt Clatter, manifestly deservedly, and which bore on its shelves the substance of the meal. And while the maids at this migratory sideboard carved and opened bottles and so forth, the small boy and a slightly larger brother assisted a little by two young men of no very defined position and relationship, served the company. Mrs. Britling sat at the head of the table and conversed with Mr. Derrick by means of hostess questions and imperfectly accepted answers, while she kept a watchful eye on the proceedings. The composition of the company was a matter of some perplexity to Mr. Derrick. Mr. and Mrs. Britling were at either end of the table. That was plain enough. It was also fairly plain that the two barefooted boys were little Britlings. But beyond this was a cloud of uncertainty. There was a youth of perhaps seventeen, much darker than Britling, but with nose and freckles rather like his, who might be an early son or stepson. He was shock-headed, and with that look about his arms and legs that suggests overnight growth, and there was an unmistakable young German, very pink, with close-cropped fair hair, glasses, and a Panama hat, who was probably the tutor of the younger boys. Mr. Derrick also was wearing his hat. His mind had been filled with an exaggerated idea of the treacheries of the English climate before he left New York. Everyone else was hatless. Finally, before one reached the limits of the explicable, 
There was a pleasant young man with a lot of dark hair and very fine dark blue eyes, whom everyone called Teddy. For him, Mr. Derrick hazarded secretary. But in addition to these normal and understandable presences, there was an entirely mysterious pretty young woman in blue linen who sat and smiled next to Mr. Britling. And there was a rather kindred-looking girl with darker hair on the right of Mr. Derrick, who impressed him at the very outset as being still prettier, and he didn't quite place her at first. Somehow familiar to him. There was a large, irrelevant middle-aged lady in black, with a gold chain and a large nose, between Teddy and the tutor. There was a tall, middle-aged man with an intelligent face, who might be a casual guest. There was an Indian young gentleman, faultlessly dressed up to his brown, soft linen collar and cuffs, and thereafter an uncontrolled outbreak of fine bronze modeling and abundant fuzzy hair. And there was a very erect and attentive baby of a year or less, sitting up in a perambulator and gesticulating cheerfully to everybody. This baby it was that most troubled the orderly mind of Mr. Derrick. The research for its paternity made his conversation with Mrs. Britling almost as disconnected and absent-minded as her conversation with him. It almost certainly wasn't Mrs. Britling's. The girl next to him, or the girl next to Mr. Britling, or the lady in the black, might any of them be married, but if so, where was the spouse? It seemed improbable that they would wheel out a foundling to lunch. Realizing at last that the problem of relationship must be left to solve itself, if he did not want to dissipate and consume his mind entirely, Mr. Derrick turned to his hostess, who was enjoying a brief lull in her administrative duties, and told her what a memorable thing the meeting of Mr. Britling in his own home would be in his life, and how very highly America was coming to esteem Mr. Britling and his essays. He found that with a slight change of person, one of his premeditated openings was entirely serviceable here. And he went on to observe that it was novel and entertaining to find Mr. Britling driving his own automobile and to note that it was an automobile of American manufacture. In America, they had standardized and systemized the making of such things as automobiles to an extent that would, he thought, be almost startling to Europeans. It was certainly startling to the European manufacturers. In illustration of that, he might tell a little story of a friend of his called Robinson, a man who, curiously enough, in general build and appearance, was very reminiscent indeed of Mr. Britling. He had been telling Mr. Britling as much on his way here from the station. His friend was concerned with several others in one of the biggest attacks that had ever been made upon what one might describe in general terms as the thousand-dollar light automobile market. What they said practically was this. This market is a jigsaw puzzle waiting to be put together and made one. We are going to do it. But that was easier to figure out than to do. At the very outset of this attack, he and his associates found themselves up against an unexpected and very difficult proposition. At first, Mrs. Britling had listened to Mr. Derrick with an almost undivided attention. But as he had developed his opening, the feast upon the blue linen table had passed on to a fresh phase that demanded more and more of her directive intelligence. The two little boys peered suddenly at her elbows. "'Shall we take the plates and get the strawberries, Mummy?' they asked simultaneously. Then one of the neat maids in the background had to be called up and instructed in undertones, and Mr. Derrick saw that, for the present, Robinson's illuminating experience was not for her ears. A little baffled, but quite understanding how things were, he turned to his neighbor on his left. The girl really had an extraordinarily pretty smile, and there was something in her soft, bright brown eye, like the movement of some quick little bird. And she was like somebody he knew. Indeed, she was. She was quite ready to be spoken to. I was telling Mrs. Britling, said Mr. Derrick, what a very great privilege I esteem it to meet Mr. Britling in this highly familiar way. You've not met him before? 
I missed him by twenty-four hours when he came through Boston on the last occasion. Just twenty-four hours. It was a matter of very great regret to me. I wish I'd been paid to travel round the world. You must write things like Mr. Britling, and then Mr. Kahn will send you. Don't you think if I promised well? You'd have to write some promissory notes, I think, just to convince him it was all right. The young lady reflected on Mr. Britling's good fortune. He saw India, he saw Japan, he had weeks in Egypt, and he went right across America. Mr. Derrick had already begun on the liner to adapt himself to the hopping inconsecutiveness of English conversation. He made now what he felt was quite a good hop, and dropped his voice to a confidential undertone. It was probably Adam in his first conversation with Eve who discovered the pleasantness of dropping into a confidential undertone beside a pretty ear with a pretty wave of hair above it. "'It was in India, I presume,' murmured Mr. Derrick, "'that Mr. Britling made the acquaintance of the colored gentleman.' "'Colored gentleman?' She gave a swift glance down the table, as though she expected to see something purple with yellow spots. "'Oh, that is one of Mr. Lawrence Carmine's young men.' she explained even more confidentially, and with an air of discussing the silver bowl of roses before him. "'He's a great authority on Indian literature. He belongs to a society for making things pleasant for Indian students in London, and he has them down.' "'And Mr. Lawrence Carmine?' he pursued. Even more intimately and confidentially, she indicated Mr. Carmine, as it seemed by a motion of her eyelash." Mr. Derrick prepared to be even more sotto voce and to plumb a much profounder mystery. His eye rested on the perambulator. He leant a little nearer to the ear, but the strawberries interrupted him. Strawberries, said the young lady, and directed his regard to his left shoulder by a little movement of her head. He found one of the boys with a high-piled plate ready to serve him. And then Mrs. Britling resumed her conversation with him. She was so ignorant, she said, of things American, that she did not even know if they had strawberries there. At any rate, here they were at the crest of the season, and in a very good year, too, and in the rose season, too. It was one of the dearest vanities of English people to think their apples and their roses and their strawberries the best in the world. And their complexions, said Mr. Derrick over a pyramid of fruit, quite manifestly intending a compliment. So that was all right. But the girl on the left of him was speaking across the table to the German tutor, and did not hear what he had said. So that even if it wasn't very neat, it didn't matter. Then he remembered that she was like that old daguerreotype of a cousin of his grandmother's that he had fallen in love with when he was a boy. It was her smile. Of course, of course, and he'd sort of adored that portrait. He felt a curious disposition to tell her as much. "'What makes this visit even more interesting, if possible, to me,' he said to Mrs. Britling, "'than it would otherwise be, is that this Essex country is the country in which my maternal grandmother was raised, and also, long way back, my mother's father's people.' My mother's father's people were very early New England people indeed. Well, no, if I said Mayflower, it wouldn't be true, but it would approximate. They were Essex Hinkinsons. That's what they were. I must be a good third of me at least Essex. My grandmother was an Essex corner. I must confess I've had some thought. Corner? said the young lady at his elbow sharply. I was telling Mrs. Britling I had some thought. But what about those Essex relatives of yours? Well, of finding if they were still about in these parts. Say, I haven't dropped a brick, have I? He looked from one face to another. She's a corner, said Mrs. Britling. Well, said Mr. Derrick, and hesitated for a moment. It was so delightful that one couldn't go on being just discreet. The atmosphere was free and friendly. His intonation disarmed offense. 
and he gave the young lady the full benefit of a quite expressive eye. "'I'm very pleased to meet you, Cousin Corner. How are the old folks at home?' Ten. The bright interest of this consulship helped Mr. Derrick more than anything to get the better of his Robinson anecdote crave, and when presently he found his dialogue with Mr. Britling resumed, he turned at once to this remarkable discovery of his long-lost, and indeed hitherto unsuspected relative. "'It's an American sort of thing to do, I suppose,' he said apologetically. "'But I almost thought of going on, on Monday, to Market Saffron, which was the locality of the Hinkersons, and just looking about at the tombstones in the churchyard for a day or so.' "'Very probably,' said Mr. Britling. "'You'd find something about them in the parish registers. "'Lots of our registers go back three hundred years or more. "'I'll drive you over in my little old car.' "'Oh, I wouldn't put you to that trouble,' said Mr. Derrick hastily. "'It's no trouble. I like the driving. "'What I've had of it. "'And while we're at it, we'll come back by Highborough High Oak "'and look up the corner pedigree. "'They're all over that district still, "'and the road's not really difficult.' It's only a bit of up and down and round about. I couldn't think, Mr. Britling, of putting you to that much trouble. It's no trouble. I want a day off, and I'm dying to take Gladys. Gladys? said Mr. Derrick with sudden hope. That's my name for Lil Carr. I'm dying to take her out for something like a decent run. I've only had her out four times altogether, and I've not got her up yet to forty miles, which I'm told she ought to do easily. We'll consider that settled. For the moment, Mr. Derrick couldn't think of any further excuse. But it was very clear in his mind that something must happen. He wished he knew of somebody who could send a recall telegram from London to prevent him from committing himself to the casual destinies of Mr. Britling's car again. And then another interest became uppermost in his mind. You'd hardly believe me, he said, if I told you that that Miss Corner of yours has a quite extraordinary resemblance to a miniature I've got away there in America of a cousin of my maternal grandmother's. She seems a very pleasant young lady. But Mr. Britling supplied no further information about Miss Corner. It must be very interesting, he said, to come over here and pick up these American families of yours on the monuments and tombstones, you know, of course, that district south of Eversham, where every other church monument bears the stars and stripes, the arms of departed Washingtons. I doubt, though, that you'll still find the name about there, nor will you find many Hinkinsons in Market Saffron. But lots of this country here has five or six hundred-year-old families still flourishing. That's why Essex is so much more genuinely Old England than Surrey, say, or Kent. Round here you'll find corners and fairlies, and then you get capels, and then away down towards Dunham and Braintree, Maynards and Bings. And there are oaks and hornbeams in the park, about claverings that have echoed to the howling of wolves and the clank of men in armor. All the old farms here are moated because of the wolves. Claverings itself is Tudor, and rather fine, too. And the cottages still wear thatch. He reflected. Now, if you went south of London instead of northward, it's all different. You're in a different period, a different society. You're in London suburbs right down to the sea. You'll find no genuine estates left, not of our deep-rooted familiar sort. You'll find millionaires and that sort of people sitting in the old places. Surrey is full of rich stockbrokers, company promoters, bookies, judges, newspaper proprietors sort of people who fence the paths across their parks. And they do something to the old places. I don't know what they do, but instantly the countryside becomes a villadom. And little sub-estates and red-brick villas and art cottages spring up, and a kind of new, hard neatness, and pneumatic tire and automobile spirit advertisements, great glaring boards by the roadside, and all the poor people are inspected and rushed about until they forget who their grandfathers were. They become villa parasites and odd job men, and grow basely rich and buy gramophones. This Essex and yonder Surrey are as different as Russia and Germany, 
but for one American who comes to look at Essex. Twenty go to Goldarming and Guildford and Dorking and Lewes and Canterbury. Those Surrey people are not properly English at all. They are strenuous. You have to get on or get out. They drill their gardeners, lecture very fast on agricultural efficiency, and have miniature rifle ranges in every village. It's a county of new notice boards and barbed wire fences. There's always a policeman round the corner. They dress for dinner. They dress for everything. If a man gets up in the night to look for a burglar, he puts on the correct costume or doesn't go. They've got a special scientific system for urging on their tramps, and they lock up their churches on a weekday. Half their soil is hard chalk or rationalistic sand, only suitable for bunkers and villa foundations, and they play golf in a large, expensive, thorough way because it's the thing to do. Now, here in Essex, we're as lax as the 18th century. We hunt in any old clothes. Our soil is a rich, succulent clay. It becomes semi-fluid in winter, and then we go about in waders shooting duck. All our finger posts have been twisted round by facetious men years ago, and we pool our breeds of hens and pigs. Our roses and oaks are wonderful. That alone shows that this is the real England. If I wanted to play golf, which I don't, being a decent Essex man, I should have to motor ten miles into Hertfordshire, and for rheumatics and longevity, Surrey can't touch us. I want you to be clear on these points, because they really will affect your impressions of this place. This country is a part of the real England, England outside London and outside manufacturers. It's one with Wessex and Mercia and Old Yorkshire, and for the matter of that, with Meath or Lothian. And it's the essential England still. 11. It detracted a little from Mr. Derrick's appreciation of this flow of information that it was taking them away from the rest of the company. He wanted to see more of his newfound cousin, and what the baby and the Bengali gentleman, whom manifestly one mustn't call colored, and the large-nosed lady and all the other inexplicables would get up to. Instead of which Mr. Britling was leading him off alone, with an air of showing him round the premises, and talking too rapidly and variously for a question to be got in edgewise, much less any broaching of the matter that Mr. Derrick had come over to settle. There was quite a lot of rose garden. It made the air delicious, and it was full of great tumbling bushes of roses and of neglected standards, and it had a long pergola of creepers and trailers and a great arbor, and underneath, over the beds everywhere, contrary to all the rules, the blossom of a multitude of pansies and stock and little trailing plants swarmed and crowded and scrimmaged and drilled and fought great mast attacks. And then Mr. Britling talked their way round a red-walled vegetable garden, with an abundance of fruit trees, and through a door into a terraced square that had once been a farmyard outside the converted barn. The barn doors had been replaced by a door-pierced window of glass, and in the middle of the square space a deep tank had been made, full of rainwater, in which Mr. Britling casually remarked that everybody bathed when the weather was hot. Thyme and rosemary and such like sweet-scented things grew on the terrace about the tank, and ten trimmed little trees of arbor vitae stood sentinel. Mr. Derrick was tantalizingly aware that beyond some lilac bushes were his new-found cousin and the kindred young woman in blue, playing tennis with the Indian and another young man, while, whenever it was necessary, the large-nosed lady crossed the stage and brooded soothingly over the perambulator. And Mr. Britling, choosing a seat from which Mr. Derrick just couldn't look comfortably through the green branches at the flying glimpses of pink and blue and white and brown, continued to talk about England and America in relation to each other and everything else under the sun. Presently, through a distant gate, the two small boys were momentarily visible, wheeling small but serviceable bicycles, followed after a little interval by the German tutor. Then an enormous grey cat came slowly across the garden court, 
and sat down to listen respectfully to Mr. Britling. The afternoon sky was an intense blue, with little puffballs of cloud lined out across it. Occasionally, from chance remarks of Mr. Britling's, Mr. Derrick was led to infer that his first impressions as an American visitor were being related to his host, but, as a matter of fact, he was permitted to relate nothing. Mr. Britling did all the talking. He sat beside his guest in spirited and played ideas and reflections like a happy fountain in the sunshine. Mr. Derrick sat comfortably and smoked with quiet appreciation the one after-lunch cigar he allowed himself. At any rate, if he himself felt rather word-bound, the fountain was nimble and entertaining. He listened in a general sort of way to the talk. It was quite impossible to follow it thoroughly, throughout all its chinks and turnings, while his eyes wandered about the garden and went ever and again to the flitting tennis players beyond the green. It was all very gay and comfortable and complete. It was various and delightful without being in the least opulent. That was one of the little secrets America had to learn. It didn't look as though it had been made or bought or cost anything. It looked as though it had happened rather luckily. Mr. Britling's talk became like a wide stream flowing through Mr. Derrick's mind, bearing along momentary impressions and observations, drifting memories of all the crowded English sights and sounds of the last five days, filmy imaginations about ancestral names and pretty cousins, scraps of those prepared conversational openings on Mr. Britling's standing in America, the explanation about the lecture club, the still incompletely forgotten purport of the Robinson anecdote. Nobody planned the British estate system, the British aristocratic system. Nobody planned the confounded constitution. It came about. It was like layer after layer wrapping round an agate. But you see it came about so happily in a way. It so suited the climate and the temperament of our people and our island it was on the whole so cosy that our people settled down into it. You can't help settling down into it. They have already settled down by the days of Queen Anne, and heaven knows if we shall ever really get away again. We're like that little shell, the lingula, that is found in the oldest rocks and lives today. It fitted its easy conditions, and it has never modified since. Why should it? It excretes all its disturbing forces. Our younger sons go away and found colonial empires. Our surplus cottage children emigrate to Australia and Canada and migrate into the towns. It doesn't alter this. 12. Mr. Derrick's eye had come to rest upon the barn, and its expression changed slowly from lazy appreciation to a brightening intelligence. Suddenly, he resolved to say something. He resolved to say it so firmly that he determined to say it even if Mr. Britling went on talking all the time. I suppose, Mr. Britling, he said, this barn here dates from the days of Queen Anne. The walls of the yard here are probably earlier, probably monastic. That grey patch in the corner, for example. The barn itself is Georgian. And here it is still, in this farmyard, here it is still. Mr. Britling was for flying off again, but Mr. Derrick would not listen. He held on like a man who keeps his grip on a lasso. There's one thing I would like to remark about your barn, Mr. Britling, and I might, while I am at it, say the same thing about your farmyard. Mr. Britling was held. What's that? he asked. Well, said Mr. Derrick, the point that strikes me most about all this is that that barn isn't a barn any longer, and that this farmyard isn't a farmyard. There isn't any wheat or chaff or anything of that sort in the barn, and there never will be again. There's just a pianola and a dancing floor. And if a cow came into this farmyard, everybody in the place would be shooing it out again. They'd regard it as a most unnatural object. He had a pleasant sense of talking at last. He kept right on. He had moved to a sweeping generalization. You were so good as to ask me, Mr. Britling, a little while ago, what my first impression of England was. 
Well, Mr. Britling, my first impression of England that seems to me to matter in the least is this, that it looks and feels more like the traditional old England than anyone could possibly have believed, and that in reality it is less like the traditional old England than anyone would ever possibly have imagined. He was carried on even further. He made a tremendous literary epigram. I thought, he said, when I looked out of the train this morning that I had come to the England of Washington Irving, I find it is not even the England of Mrs. Humphrey Ward. End of section 20 End of Mr. Britling Sees It Through Chapter 1 by H. G. Wells Section 21 of 1916 First Chapters Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1916 First Chapters Collection by Various. Section 21 Autre Temps by Edith Wharton. Mrs. Lidcote, as the huge menacing mass of New York defined itself far off across the waters, shrank back into her corner of the deck and sat listening with a kind of unreasoning terror to the steady onward drive of the screws. She had set out on the voyage quietly enough in what she called her reasonable mood, but the week at sea had given her too much time to think of things and had left her too long alone with the past. When she was alone, it was always the past that occupied her. She couldn't get away from it, and she didn't any longer care to. During her long years of exile, she had made her terms with it, had learned to accept the fact that it would always be there, huge, obstructing, encumbering, bigger and more dominant than anything the future could ever conjure up. And at any rate, she was sure of it, she understood it, knew how to reckon with it, she had learned to screen and manage and protect it as one does an afflicted member of one's family. There had never been any danger of her being allowed to forget the past. It looked out at her from the face of every acquaintance. It appeared suddenly in the eyes of strangers when a word enlightened them. Yes, the Mrs. Lidcote, don't you know? It had sprung at her the first day out when across the dining room from the captain's table she had seen Mrs. Lauren Bolger's revolving eyeglass pause and the eye behind it grow as blank as a dropped blind. The next day, of course, the captain had asked, You know your ambassadress, Mrs. Bolger? And she had replied that no, she seldom left Florence and hadn't been to Rome for more than a day since the Bolgers had been sent to Italy. She was so used to these phrases that it cost her no effort to repeat them and the captain had promptly changed the subject. No, she didn't, as a rule, mind the past, because she was used to it and understood it. It was a great concrete fact in her path that she had to walk around every time she moved in any direction. But now, in the light of the unhappy event that had summoned her from Italy, the sudden unanticipated news of her daughter's divorce from Horace Persh and remarriage with Wilbur Barclay, the past, her own poor, miserable past, started up at her with eyes of accusation, became to her disordered fancy like the afflicted relative suddenly breaking away from nurses and keepers and publicly parading the horror and misery she had all the long years so patiently screened and secluded. Yes, there it had stood before her through the agitated weeks since the news had come during her interminable journey from India, where Leela's letter had overtaken her and the feverish halt in her apartment in Florence where she had had to stop and gather up her possessions for a fresh start. There it had stood grinning at her with a new balefulness, which seemed to say, oh, but you've got to look at me now because I'm not only your own past but Leela's present. 
certainly it was a master stroke of those arch ironists of the shears and spindle to duplicate her own story in her daughters mrs lidcote had always somewhat grimly fancied that having so signally failed to be of use to leila in other ways she would at least serve her as a warning she had even abstained from defending herself from making the best of her case had stoically refused to plead extenuating circumstances lest leila's impulsive sympathy should lead to deductions that might react disastrously on her own life and now that very thing had happened and mrs lidcote could hear the whole of new york saying with one voice yes leila's done just what her mother did with such an example what could you expect yet if she had been an example poor woman she had been an awful one she had been she would have supposed of more use as a deterrent than a hundred blameless mothers as incentives for how could any one who had seen anything of her life in the last eighteen years have had the courage to repeat so disastrous an experiment well logic in such cases didn't count example didn't count nothing probably counted but having the same impulses in the blood and that was the dark inheritance she had bestowed upon her daughter leila hadn't consciously copied her she had simply taken after her had been a projection of her own long past rebellion mrs lidcote had deplored when she started that the utopia was a slow steamer and would take eight full days to bring her to her unhappy daughter but now as the moment of reunion approached she would willingly have turned the boat about and fled back to the high seas it was not only because she felt still so unprepared to face what new york had in store for her but because she needed more time to dispose of what the utopia had already given her the past was bad enough but the present and future were worse because they were less comprehensible and because as she grew older surprises and inconsequences troubled her more than the worst certainties there was mrs bolger for instance in the light or rather the darkness of new developments it might really be that mrs bolger had not meant to cut her but had simply failed to recognize her mrs lidcote had arrived at this hypothesis simply by listening to the conversation of the person sitting next to her on deck two lively young women with the latest paris hats on their heads and the latest new york ideas in them these ladies as to whom it would have been impossible for a person with mrs lidcote's old-fashioned categories to determine whether they were married or unmarried nice or horrid or any one or other of the definite things which young women in her youth and her society were conveniently assumed to be had revealed a familiarity with the world of new york that again according to mrs lidcote's tradition should have implied a recognized place in it but in the present fluid state of manners what did anything imply except what their hats implied that no one could tell what was coming next they seemed at any rate to frequent a group of idle and opulent people who executed the same gestures and revolved on the same pivots as mrs lidcote's daughter and her friends their cores matties and mabels seemed at any moment likely to reveal familiar patronymics and once one of the speakers summing up a discussion of which mrs lidcote had missed the beginning had affirmed with headlong confidence leela oh leela's all right could it be her leela the mother had wondered with a sharp thrill of apprehension if only they would mention surnames but their talk leaped elliptically from allusion to allusion their unfinished sentences dangled over bottomless pits of conjecture and they gave their bewildered hearer the impression not so much of talking only of their intimates as of being intimate with every one alive her old friend franklin eyed could have told her perhaps but here was the last day of the voyage and she hadn't yet found courage to ask him great as had been the joy of discovering his name on the passenger list and seeing his friendly bearded face in the throng against the taffrail at cherbourg she had as yet said nothing to him except when they had met of course i'm going out to leila she had said nothing to franklin i because she had always instinctively shrunk from taking him into her confidence she was sure he felt sorry for her sorrier perhaps than any one had ever felt but he had always paid her the supreme tribute of not showing it 
his attitude allowed her to imagine that compassion was not the basis of his feeling for her and it was part of her joy in his friendship that it was the one relation seemingly unconditioned by her state the only one in which she could think and feel and behave like any other woman now however as the problem of new york loomed nearer she began to regret that she had not spoken had not at least questioned him about the hints she had gathered on the way he did not know the two ladies next to her he did not even as a chance know mrs lauren bolger but he knew new york and new york was the sphinx whose riddle she must read or perish almost as the thought passed through her mind his stooping shoulders and grizzled head detached themselves against the blaze of light in the west and he sauntered down the empty deck and dropped into the chair at her side you're expecting the barclays to meet you i suppose he asked it was the first time she had heard any one pronounce her daughter's new name and it occurred to her that her friend who was shy and inarticulate had been trying to say it all the way over and had at last shot it out at her only because he felt it must be now or never i don't know i cabled of course but i believe she's at there at his place somewhere oh barclays yes near lennox isn't it but she's sure to come to town to meet you he said it so easily and naturally that her own constraint was relieved and suddenly before she knew what she meant to do she had burst out she may dislike the idea of seeing people Ide, whose absent short-sighted gaze had been fixed on the slowly gliding water turned in his seat to stare at his companion who leila he said with an incredulous laugh mrs lidcote flushed to her faded hair and grew pale again it took me a long time to get used to it she said his look grew gently commiserating i think you'll find he paused for a word that things are different now altogether easier that's what i've been wondering ever since we started she was determined now to speak she moved nearer so that their arms touched and she could drop her voice to a murmur you see it all came on me in a flash my going off to india and siam on that long trip kept me away from letters for weeks at a time and she didn't want to tell me beforehand oh i understand that poor child you know how good she's always been to me how she's tried to spare me and she knew of course what a state of horror i'd be in she knew i'd rush off to her at once and try to stop it so she never gave me a hint of anything and she even managed to muzzle susie's suffern you know susie is the one of the family who keeps me informed about things at home i don't yet see how she prevented susie's telling me but she did and her first letter the one i got up at bangkok simply said the thing was over the divorce i mean and that the very next day she'd well i suppose there was no use waiting and he seems to have behaved as well as possible to have wanted to marry her as much as who barclay he helped her out i should say so why what do you suppose he interrupted himself he'll be devoted to her i assure you oh of course i'm sure he will he's written me really beautifully but it's a terrible strain on a man's devotion i'm not sure that leila realizes i'd sounded again his little reassuring laugh i'm not sure that you realize they're all right it was the very phrase that the young lady in the next seat had applied to the unknown leila and its recurrence in ide's lips flushed mrs lidcote with fresh courage i wish i knew just what you mean the two young women next to me the ones with the wonderful hats have been talking in the same way what about leila about a leila i fancied it might be mine and about society in general all their friends seem to be divorced some of them seem to announce their engagements before they get their decree one of them her name was mabel as far as i could make out her husband found out that she meant to divorce him by noticing that she wore a new engagement ring well you see leila did everything regularly as the french say i'd rejoined yes but are these people in society the people my neighbors talk about he shrugged his shoulders it would take an arbitration commission a good many sittings to define the boundaries of society nowadays but at any rate they're in new york and i assure you you're not you're farther and farther from it but i've been back there several times to see leila she hesitated and looked away from him 
then she brought out slowly and i've never noticed the least change in in my own case oh he sounded deprecatingly and she trembled with the fear of having gone too far but the hour was past when such scruples could restrain her she must know where she was and where leela was mrs bolger still cuts me she brought out with an embarrassed laugh are you sure you've probably cut her if not now at least in the past and in a cut if you're not first you're nowhere that's what keeps up so many quarrels the word roused mrs lidcote uh, to a renewed sense of realities but the pursues she said the pursues are so strong there are so many of them and they'll all back each other up just as my husband's family did i know what it means to have a clan against one they're stronger than any number of separate friends the pursues will never forgive leela for leaving horace why his mother opposed his marrying her because of of me she tried to get leela to promise that she wouldn't see me when they went to europe on their honeymoon and now she'll say it was my example her companion vaguely stroking his beard mused a moment upon this then he asked with seeming irrelevance what did leela say when you wrote that you were coming she said it wasn't the least necessary but that i'd better come because it was the only way to convince me that it wasn't well then that proves she's not afraid of the purses she breathed a long sigh of remembrance oh just at first you know one never is he laid his hand on hers with a gesture of intelligence and pity you'll see you'll see he said a shadow lengthened down the deck before them and a steward stood there proffering a marconogram oh now i shall know she exclaimed she tore the message open and then let it fall on her knees dropping her hands on it in silence ives enquiry roused her it's all right oh quite right perfectly she can't come but she's sending susie suffern she says susie will explain after another silence she added with a sudden gush of bitterness as if i needed any explanation she felt ide's hesitating glance upon her she's in the country yes prevented last moment longing for you expecting you love from both don't you see the poor darling that she couldn't face it no i don't he waited do you mean to go to her immediately it will be too late to catch a train this evening but i shall take the first to-morrow morning she considered a moment perhaps it's better i need a talk with susie first she's to meet me at the dock and i'll take her straight back to the hotel with me as she developed this plan she had the sense that ide was still thoughtfully even gravely considering her when she ceased he remained silent a moment then he said almost ceremoniously if you talk with miss suffern doesn't last too late may i come and see you when it's over i shall be dining at my club and i'll call you up at about ten if i may i'm off to chicago on business to-morrow morning and it would be a satisfaction to know before i start that your cousin's been able to reassure you as i know she will he spoke with a shy deliberateness that even to mrs lidcote's troubled perceptions sounded a long silenced note of feeling perhaps the breaking down of the barrier of reticence between them had released unsuspected emotions in both the tone of his appeal moved her curiously and loosened the tight strain of her fears oh yes come do come she said rising the huge threat of new york was imminent now dwarfing under long reaches of embattled masonry the great deck she stood on and all the little specks of life it carried one of them drifting nearer took the shape of her maid followed by luggage-laden stewards and signing to her that it was time to go below as they descended to the main deck the throng swept her against mrs lauren bolger's shoulder and she heard the ambassadors call out to some one over the vexed sea of hats so sorry i should have been delighted but i've promised to spend sunday with some friends at lennox end of section twenty one Autre temps. Chapter One by Edith Wharton. Section Twenty Two of Nineteen Sixteen First Chapters Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1916 First Chapters Collection by Various Chapter 1 of The Grizzly King by James Oliver Curwood With the silence and immobility of a great reddish-tinted rock, 
Thor stood, for many minutes, looking out over his domain. He could not see far, for like all grizzlies, his eyes were small and far apart, and his vision was bad. At a distance of a third or a half a mile, he could make out a goat or a mountain sheep, but beyond that his world was a vast sun-filled or night-darkened mystery, through which he ranged mostly by the guidance of sound and smell. It was the sense of smell that held him still and motionless now. Up out of the valley a scent had come to his nostrils that he had never smelled before. It was something that did not belong there, and it stirred him strangely. Vainly his slow-working, brute mind struggled to comprehend it. It was not caribou, for he had killed many caribou. It was not goat. It was not sheep. And it was not the smell of the fat and lazy whistlers sunning themselves on the rocks, for he had eaten hundreds of whistlers. It was a scent that did not enrage him, and neither did it frighten him. He was curious and yet he did not go down to seek it out. Caution held him back. If Thor could have seen distinctly for a mile, or two miles, his eyes would have discovered even less than the wind brought him from down the valley. He stood at the edge of a little plain, with the valley an eighth of a mile below him, and the break over which he had come that afternoon an eighth of a mile above him. The plain was very much like a cup, perhaps an acre in extent, in the green slope of the mountain. It was covered with rich soft grass and June flowers, mountain violets and patches of forget-me-nots, and wild asters and hyacinths, and in the center of it was a fifty-foot spatter of soft mud, which Thor visited frequently when his feet became rock-sore. To the east and the west and the north of him spread out the wonderful panorama of the Canadian Rockies, softened in the golden sunshine of a June afternoon. From up and down the valley, from the breaks between the peaks, and from the little gullies cleft in shale and rock that crept up to the snow lines, came a soft and droning murmur. It was the music of running water. That music was always in the air, for the rivers, the creeks, and the tiny streams gushing down from the snow that lay eternally up near the clouds were never still. There were sweet perfumes as well as music in the air. June and July, the last of spring and the first of summer in the northern mountains, were commingling. The earth was bursting with green. The early flowers were turning the sunny slopes into colored splashes of red and white and purple, and everything that had life was singing. The fat whistlers on their rocks, the pompous little gophers on their mounds, the big bumblebees that buzzed from flower to flower, the hawks in the valley, and the eagles over the peaks. Even Thor was singing in his way, for as he had paddled through the soft mud a few minutes before, he had rumbled curiously, deep down in his great chest, it was not a growl, or a roar, or a snarl. It was the noise he made when he was contented. It was his song. And now, for some mysterious reason, there had suddenly come a change in this wonderful day for him. Motionless, he still sniffed the wind. It puzzled him. It disquieted him, without alarming him. To the new and strange smell that was in the air, he was as keenly sensitive as a child's tongue to the first sharp touch of a drop of brandy. And then, at last, a low and sullen growl came, like a distant roll of thunder, from out of his chest. He was overlord of these domains, and slowly his brain told him that there should be no smell which he could not comprehend, and of which he was not the master. Thor reared up slowly until the whole nine feet of him rested on his haunches, and he sat like a trained dog with his great forefeet, heavy with mud, drooping in front of his chest. For ten years he had lived in these mountains, and never had he smelled that smell. He defied it. He waited for it, while it came stronger and nearer. He did not hide himself 
clean-cut and unafraid, he stood up. He was a monster in size, and his new June coat shone a golden brown in the sun. His forearms were almost as large as a man's body. The three largest of his five knife-like claws were five and a half inches long. In the mud his feet had left tracks that were fifteen inches from tip to tip. He was fat and sleek and powerful. His eyes, no larger than hickory nuts, were eight inches apart. His two upper fangs, sharp as stiletto points, were as long as a man's thumb, and between his great jaws he could crush the neck of a caribou. Thor's life had been free of the presence of man, and he was not ugly. Like most grizzlies, he did not kill for the pleasure of killing. Out of a herd he would take one caribou, and he would eat that caribou to the marrow in the last bone. He was a peaceful king. He had one law. Let me alone, he said, and the voice of that law was in his attitude as he sat on his haunches, sniffing this strange smell. In his massive strength, in his aloneness and his supremacy, the great bear was like the mountains, unrivaled in the valleys as they were in the skies. With the mountains he had come down out of the ages. He was part of them. The history of his race had begun and was dying among them, and they were alike in many ways. Until this day he could not remember when anything had come to question his might and his right, except those of his own kind. With such rivals he had fought, fairly, and more than once to the death. He was ready to fight again, if it came to a question of sovereignty over the ranges which he claimed as his own. Until he was beaten, he was dominator, arbiter, and despot if he chose to be. He was dynast of the rich valleys and the green slopes, and the liege lord of all living things about them. He had won and kept these things openly, without strategy or treachery. He was hated and he was feared, but he was without hatred or fear of his own, and he was honest. Therefore he waited openly for the strange thing that was coming to him from down the valley. As he sat on his haunches, questioning the air with his keen brown nose, something within him was reaching back into dim and bygone generations. Never before had he caught that taint that was in his nostrils. Yet now that it came to him, it did not seem altogether new. He could not place it. He could not picture it. Yet he knew that it was a menace and a threat. For ten minutes he sat, like a carven thing, on his haunches. Then the wind shifted and the scent grew less and less until it was gone altogether. Thor's flat ears lifted a little. He turned his huge head slowly, so that his eyes took in the green slope and the tiny plain. He easily forgot the smell now that the air was clear and sweet again. He dropped on his forefeet and resumed his gopher hunting. There was something of humor in his hunt. Thor weighed a thousand pounds, a mountain gopher is six inches long and weighs six ounces. Yet Thor would dig energetically for an hour, and rejoice at the end by swallowing the fat little gopher like a pill. It was his bonne bouche, the luscious tidbit in the quest of which he spent a third of his spring and summer digging. He found a hole located to his satisfaction, and began throwing out the earth like a huge dog after a rat. He was on the crest of the slope. Once or twice during the next half hour he lifted his head. But he was no longer disturbed by the strange smell that had come to him with the wind. End of section 22. Chapter 1 of the Grizzly King. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 23 of 1916 First Chapters Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1916 First Chapters Collection by Various. Section 23 Happy Valley, a Story of Oregon by Anne Shannon Monroe.
Chapter One at Two Forks. I woke that morning in the gray, dusty little cattle town of Two Forks with the terror of life shaking me like a palsy. My lips and tongue were parchment, a scum ridged my teeth, my whole body was loathsome. I tried to sink into unconsciousness, but my senses were maddeningly alert. I turned over in bed and fixed my gaze on the wallpaper. It was yellowed with age, blistered and cracked. The design, a sickly, greenish vine which wriggled its way around a brown lattice, seemed a drunken, staggering thing. I traced the design to where it began and ended, began and ended, in dizzying reiteration. A cracked blister moved, a small brown bug crept horridly out from underneath. I shivered back into the sleazy bedding and tried frantically to fix my eyes on something less nauseating. There was a spidery washstand, and on it a bowl and pitcher of white enamel, badly scaled. Beside the stand stood a rusty pail, ready for whatever might be emptied into it. I shrank more deeply under the bedding, and my eyes went on another search of the room for something humanly endurable. The pale green window shade was a mass of cracks. The light pitted it like smallpox, and beneath it a coarse lace curtain hung in dejected and slovenly unevenness. I looked to the ceiling. It was stained and streaked from many spillings of water in the room above. A big fat blowfly moved heavily across. A laugh startled me. It came from the lobby outside. I sat up, wide awake, but almost instantly lay down again. My head was too heavy. Anger filled me. It was the ratter's laugh. I would know that laugh in a thousand. A mean, triumphant, I've got you little sneak of a laugh, which was a perfect expression of the hard, cold, tight little wart of a man from whom it emanated. It was all his doing, the three days spree. He had insisted on a drink. I hadn't had a drink for over a week. I had known that if I could only get away from the town to the ranch, where there was no saloon I could hold out, he had insisted, and I had been a fool for the thousandth time. There was a loud banging on the door, then the ratter's voice, Starting! Well, start, I retorted. The triumphant laugh was repeated then. Knocked out? I didn't answer. He waited a minute, then jerked open the door. You've got a half hour, he said sharply and went away. I smelled frying ham and boiling coffee. The odor gagged me. I drew the sheet over my face. There was a second banging on the door. We're starting at once. Come now or don't. Go and be damned. The steps moved away. I was not again disturbed. Sulky, now I lay inert under the bedding. I had defied someone. I felt better. I had defied the ratter. But why couldn't I have defied him three days earlier? The old, weary sickness again filled me. Over and over, it had been the same story. Go where I would, it would always be the same. The thing had caught me first at technical college. I was taking the course in civil engineering, and I was expelled. It had got me again at law school. I was again expelled. I began to study privately in my grandfather's office, and then after six months of going straight there, had to be that confounded party celebrating my 21st birthday with wine and toasts, winding up with a debauch on my part, which had ended things for me. My grandfather had thrown me bodily out of his life. He had given me a ticket to two forks, a scrap of paper calling for a chance at a drawing in a land-selling scheme and one hundred dollars in cash. The old judge's lip had trembled when he hurled these things at me, and his face had purpled. He had been proud of me. I was his only grandson. He didn't think so much of his granddaughters, my sisters. I was named for him, as had been my father. My father had been the first keen disappointment of his life. Drink had killed him before he entered his forties. Then the old man had centered his hopes in me, and I was going the same gait, only faster. He was through with me. He as good as said so the night of the party when I made a fool of myself before his guests. He said it again when he handed me my transportation to this out-of-the-way corner of the West. 
This was his way of getting rid of me. He had no hope. He had expressed none. But he must get rid of me in a way to save his pride. It was generous enough. My grandfather was not a rich man, for he had had us all to bring up and educate according to his rather expensive standard of education, and many of us to bury. I was sorry for him, for if I truly loved anyone on earth, it was he. But I was sorrier for myself, for I didn't want to drink. I wanted to do anything else but drink. Ennis had come in that morning when I was pushing my clothes into a suitcase. Ennis, blue-white, frail of body and big-eyed. She took them all out and repacked smoothly and properly. Billy, she said with a sharpness in her voice, which I knew to be a disguise of her real tenderness, don't you feel too badly about it. You can't help it, really. It's in your blood. It's in all our blood, she went on. And seeing that I was startled, not the drinking, but the scars of it. We can't help the freaky things we do. It's that that makes me so nervous and see things in the dark. I know it's that. And it's that that makes Claire so queer, makes her talk so often of pleasant little things like suicide and going insane, makes her stay in bed for days at a time with hysteria. And as you don't mean no, Billy, Claire doesn't drink, but it's the drink's scars. It's as if someone had taken a hot poker when we were all little babies and sort of seared our brains over. There's the scar, and some things are not in us that are in balance, folks. They're seared out. We're all queer. Not grandfather, I said. I had worshipped my grandfather since the days when I had ridden on his foot before the living room fireplace and afterward, leaning against his knee, had watched the fire's reflection on the brass andirons while he told me wonderful tales. The old brass andirons and my grandfather's massive white-crowned head were inseparably woven into the happy memories of my childhood. My sisters had always been nervous and finicky. My mother had died early. My mother, always a pale, frightened woman, sitting behind closed blinds and looking down the path that led out of our yard to the street, clutching now and then at her chair arms in an attitude of fearful waiting. My grandfather was the one solid rock of pride in my family. No, his father didn't put it on him, but he put it on the rest of us. Billy, I'm older than you, and I can remember a lot that has been kept from you. He drank fearfully in his young days, but he was the kind that can drink and continue clear-headed. It never interfered, but Papa was very different. You don't remember him so well, Billy. He was like Grandma's people, like you, slender and delicate, all nerves and temperament. Grandpa himself taught Papa to drink. Mama said so. Grandpa thought it was the way to do, to get him used to it as he grew up. Then he would always drink like a gentleman. But he was of a different temperament, and he couldn't stand it, Billy, so he went down. How he suffered. I can see him now in delirium tremens, the house all shut up tight and dark to keep people from knowing. Mama always called it being sick. I can see him now, Billy. I would slip past into his room and no one was watching and watch him as he felt his way round the room, moving his long, thin fingers, fingers just like yours, Billy, over the walls, trying to find a way out. He thought he was bound in by thousands of tiny wires, and if he could only get his finger on the right wire and follow it to the end, he could get out. It was tragic, and it was true. He was bound by wires that led back to his father. His own father laid those wires about him and now they've wound on till they've caught you there is no way out unless we could follow them clear back to the beginning there isn't any way billy for he tried so hard and you are just like him but not nearly so strong billy i want you to promise me just one thing don't ever marry let's just die off all that is left of us don't fasten the wires about any one else all at once i understood my sister ennis as I never had before, her sharpness, her cynicism, the unexpected leave-taking of John Hale several years earlier, and her life since then devoted to nerves and my grandfather's household. The understanding brought me out of hot anger to hotter tears. I sat limp on the bed while she finished packing. I promise, I whispered, but I'll make good out west. I took the suitcase from her. I'll go on a ranch and make good, I chokingly whispered. Ennis's face at last softened by a gentle sadness through which glimmered a faint ray of hope now came before me. 
some way that ray of hope came strongest through the chaos of impressions to keep it alive to make it lighten her pinched face and send away all the shadows that had been the ambition that had held me steadfast on the four days trip across the continent had held me on landing at ossing on the long stage ride from the railway station to two forks and then it had all come from meeting the rider i told myself but my inner self told me that that was a lie always i must meet someone it came from the devil of thirst within me i reached over to the old split bottom chair for my coat and drew out my wallet it was empty save for a slip of paper that gave me the title to eighty acres of land ninety miles south of two forks i ran my hand into my trousers pocket and brought out some silver and two gold pieces eighteen dollars and seventy cents again i cursed the ratter and again deep inside i knew that i and not the ratter was to blame i thought back over the past few days from the railway station at ossing we had motored all day and all night crossing two ranges of mountains at daylight we had reached two forks the gray dusty little cattle town at breakfast i met the ratter it developed that he was the man i had come west to see a clerk who would conduct the drawing for the great western improvement company from whom my grandfather in some idle moment had purchased a ticket the company he was told had been given a land grant by the government for service in building a wagon road through the inland empire of oregon they had subdivided this land into tracts ranging from twenty to two hundred acres and the only uncertainty with the ticket holder was which parcel he would draw the drawing had taken place and i had been lucky winning eighty acres it had seemed a good omen and i was in high spirits until i noticed the queer silent smiles of men who stood in little knots about the street corners i made inquiries oh yes the land was there all right yes the title was sound a straight patent from the government to the company i asked no further questions i meant to take a chance and find out what the smiles meant later perhaps they were smiling at my clothes while i smiled at theirs if cowboy land was lazily quiet and dustily uneventful it was at least true to fiction in dress and then i had met the ratter again and being blue became an easy victim again i counted my money i wondered why they had left me that much of what use was eighteen dollars and seventy cents to a man stranded in a dead little cattle town two hundred miles from a railroad it probably would not more than pay my hotel bill if the rumors of prices out west were true unable to stand my own thoughts any longer i got up and washed and dressed and went out into the lobby the hotel keeper old van vader sat in a dilapidated armchair before a rusty heating stove his head hunched down between his shoulders, his long chin sunk between the sharp knuckles of his two hands, his long bleached out sandy mustache curled around his fists like some giant beetle's pincers. I took a vacant chair opposite him. At the same moment, the outside door was pushed open and a big blustering man burst in. A seven-passenger touring car had stopped before the door and other men were getting out we want an extra early dinner we want it damn quick see said the stranger charging up to van vader who had not changed his position hustle man we've got the price he jangled coin alluringly in his pocket van vader lifted his chin just sufficiently to work his jaw i guess you've tied up at the wrong stall his chin went back to his knuckles the stranger opened his eyes wide came close frowned then whirled and strode out damning the country the big car buzzed on down the dusty street van vader again lifted his long chin from his knuckles guess you'll be wantin something to eat boy how'd an egg poached tender set on your stomach he got up and ambled toward the dining room surprised i followed him he tied on his apron and pushing open a swinging door went into the kitchen and poached an egg he also brought me a cup of thick black coffee i drank it all though it was as bitter as only long-standing much boiled coffee can be also i ate the egg and then some way i felt better about the dusty little town and the ratter and myself and the whole world i wanted to see my ranch i'd make good yet i wonder i ventured to old van back in his armchair and his knuckles if i could get a horse and overtake the rat bullpit you want to overtake bullpit he lifted his chin and spoke lazily in an altogether casual tone yes if you think i could manage to keep the right road 
There's just one main traveled road south. I pulled out my watch, a handsome one, my 21st birthday gift from my grandfather. I knew with what precise care his exquisite taste had selected it, but there was no other way. I'm short of cash, but if I could leave this watch with you and get a horse. He again lifted his chin from his knuckles, this time twisting his head on his neck with a gesture of pointing. Saul's eating hay in the corral out back. You'll find a saddle on the fence. I thanked him, but his chin had again sunk between his knuckles and already into his eyes had come a faraway look, such as I have seen in the eyes of a puma blinking in the sun in a park cage as he dreamed of his wilderness home. My words were wasted. When I came around to the door with a horse, a long-legged, lanky buckskin that had never seen curry comb or brush, but had spirit, Van Vader met me with a parcel. You'll need grub. Follow the main road south. About twenty miles out, you'll come to a well-traveled road leading off to the left. It goes to the Q Ranch. Bullpit might stay there tonight. Otherwise, you'll find him on the main road that leads on over Wind Mountain into Happy Valley. If I don't see him, I'll inquire, I answered glibly from my mount. He smiled a queer, slow smile and turned back into the hotel. End of section 23 Happy Valley, A Story of Oregon Chapter 1 at Two Forks by Anne Shannon Monroe Section 24 of 1916 First Chapters Collection This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1916 First Chapters Collection by Various Chapter 1 Prologue Hand Cow the Yellow Rug Woman From the Last Ditch by Will L. Comfort Romney saw the rug before he saw the woman. It was the yellow of India, the yellow you see on the breast of the purple martin and on the inner petals of an emperor rose. The weave of the rug was like no other. Its folds looked heavy like raw silk, yet the fabric itself was thin. It would last a lifetime and then become a priceless gift for the one held most dear. It was soil-proof as a snake's skin. It was either holy or savage. They were on the little river steamer Sung Kiang, a day's passage below Hankow. The woman had boarded that forenoon at Wu Chang. Romney had come through from Nagan King. The yellow rug lay across the knees of the woman. The afternoon was breezy and bright. It was May, and the rice was green along the flats of the southern shore. She was either English or American, Romney reflected, and also that the world was well supplied with pretty women, but not with rugs like that. Just now the woman held out her arms to a missionary's child, a passing boy child of five in sandals. His legs were bare and brown and scratched, his name was Paul, and he was a stoic from much manhandling. He went to her arms in silence, and there was a burning now in Romney's chest. Her voice had been a thirsty, primitive note, like a cry, as if the presence of the child hurt her. The little boy stood erect and silent against her limbs. She lifted the rug and drew it about his waist to hold him close. She was lost to everything else. Romney had fancied her the most exquisite and delicate creature, but this face that he saw now had the plain, earthy passion of a river woman talking to her firstborn, a love of the child's body and face and lips, the love of a woman who loves the very soil of play on her child. Paul had been running the decks for two days, making enough noise to give the missionary the reputation of being a widower. The child was moist from running at this moment, and the woman buried her face in his throat. Romney wished whimsically that he were the missionary so he could come into the picture for the sake of meeting the woman. The child was drawing away. Her dark eyes were 
untellably hungry already paul must have told his name for she was saying such a right name for a noble boy and where are you going to hankow it's like a fairy tale a young man going to hankow to seek his fortune my father does not like me to read fairy tales paul's eyes were full of pictures romney did not hear what she said to that but circled the little deck again thinking of her eyes and voice they went with the yellow rug as romney returned the child pulled back from the woman announcing that's my father and now for the first time romney's eyes and the woman's met the child had pointed his way though the missionary was behind him her look came up with something that seemed to say i beg of you don't disappoint me then romney forgot the peculiarity of that in the sudden sense that she was like the blood sister of some one he had known at the same time flat in his consciousness was the fact that he had not known any such some one she was young but this was not the look of a girl at all the look of a hungry imperious woman who had known love and been denied adult understanding the shoals of cheap illusion passed she was looking beyond him at the real father of paul under his own calm romney was intensely sensitized something had happened to him from her eyes he felt he was out somewhere in the deep waters of life wherein she sailed the shallow problems already put from them all decoration convention and imitation thrust aside the missionary and the little boy had passed and now romney did a very good thing for him and something that he would not have thought possible before this day he drew a chair close to the yellow rug saying may i yes they talked of paul of missionaries of asia travel her manner was easy and genuine her observations wise and humorous but her eyes full of challenge there was tenderness in them and something that for a better name he called deviltry he felt himself in the presence of a big nature whose sweep was from the primitive passions of birth and death of fear and hunger to some consummate and mysterious ambition he could not tell what she wanted and at the same time her thrall was stealing over him preventing him from seeing her the same at different moments he felt that her sweetness could be unfathomable to one she loved she was exquisite in every detail lip nostril finger-tip hair figure voice manner wear all as perfect as the yellow rug yet it was beauty rather than loveliness something to fear about it romney knew in that first hour that he did not challenge her he felt his youth his imperfections the wastes of his past years all that he had fancied good about those years looked questionable now if he had known that he was to meet this woman his life would have been different he had met no one like her she accepted his best with ease and without wonder no man had been able to do that she tossed a crown over the highest of his mental offerings and added a higher one of her own on his favorite subjects yet they were not showing each other their wares she stimulated him as no one had done before and as for her part it was the pleasant passage of an hour an irish woman with an olive skin and dark hair and eyes slender and not too tall her face in profile had the greek essential of beauty but with a hardly imaginable delicacy covering the rigour of that austere line of bone structure she seemed the most conserved creature he had ever met as if every excellence of life had been known to her from a child all love and reverence and protection he suddenly remembered that fury of instinct with which she had kissed the boy paul in the throat something earthy and ample about that sound and deeply grounded like a peasant woman's passion he wondered again and again what she wanted it had nothing to do with money or position romney was sure of this queerly enough the truth did not come to him until later they dined together humorously in the little cabin of the sun kiang 
a burmese tiger had killed her husband i can stand it if i don't stay in one place too long she said looking at the farthest punka it is always with me if i stay at home or any one place many weeks the thoughts seem to pile up so that i cannot breathe they drive me away she had evidently not found before much understanding of this point seemed without hope to make herself clear to him the thoughts of it become heavy in any one place she added so that there is no home i know romney said she looked at him quickly any one might have said it but romney spoke as if he had earned the right and she questioned that the tiger killed my baby too though i was in england she said it apparently with little emotion but romney sensed a slow pounding of agony in her breast like a sea that cannot quiet down i have thought of everything she was saying i have some philosophy i have no foolish sense of this life being all or death being all but oh i was going to take him his little baby as soon as it was born i was at his father's in kent england and to think that a bit of pink paper and the word tiger romney was silent my baby would have been as old as that little boy with the silly missionary father she added why silly i only saw a bent drab man with his particular idea of god silly because he doesn't permit the child to hear fairy stories ah romney found himself regarding her judgment as quite right he thought he was beginning to understand now yet she seemed to live too powerfully in the present hour to be lost altogether in a tragedy of five years ago the look of her eyes had to do with the future not with the past at the same time there was something tremendous in the slow still way she had spoken of her child and its father a magnificent sort of englishman he must have been to hold this woman's life to his they were on deck again the wind had gone down the moon played upon the mists of the rice lands on the southern shore to the north the river was crowded with small boats and the myriad lights of a low-lying city were fused into a dull red glow the woman was thrilling him now with every sentence i am not hugging a grief i see that i gave you that impression perhaps i carry it with me and give it forth from time to time as a matter of habit it is doubtless as interesting as another but it is not true life is too short to try to make most people understand if i care enough to explain i tell a different a more real story you are good to talk to i think i must have been lonely when you came and drew up your chair that startled me pleasantly your doing that at least i knew you weren't common grown-ups men and women adults should dare to be real to each other how chatty i am i like it i do feel the gift of it no i'm not going around the world clinging to an ancient bereavement he was a very good man patient a man's man a tiger hunter it's all in that i was younger five years ago i was so young that i thought for a time my future sufficiently wrapped in his then i had his baby that made a kind of devil of me i had lived those months i found that there was something huge and endless about that experience i am not giving you any cant about motherhood i could smell and taste and see into things as never before i was in a rage when he went away to hunt tigers why he took it as a matter of mere nature as something in the natural course of events that i should bring his child into the world i was growing into a real creature and he could not rise out of the annual tiger ramadan it is a sort of religion with his family and couldn't be broken and then i was smothered in his family when the word was brought a kind of madness came over me sorrow yes there was real sorrow i remembered all his good but the madness had to do with perpetuating him a man who could leave me in that smothering british household it seemed i wanted a child that had nothing to do with him with them what i wanted in those days i wanted with a kind of madness they said it was my grief that killed the little one these things are mysterious and now she laughed softly 
Romney was trying to adjust this story with the earlier talk, but each part destroyed the other. He could as readily believe the first as the final. It dawned upon him that the real truth might lie somewhere between, but there were no tangible forms to grip in this middle distance. He was not inclusive enough to know that she was, for the moment, intensely what she said. In any event, the strange lapses of the tale did not break the enchantment. Don't try to understand, she added gently. No man could understand, at least none but a very great artist. But now, he repeated, Oh, I search and search. I know that travel does not bring me nearer to what I want, but I can't rest long in one place. He left me everything that the world can give, but I can't live long in his houses. Yet what I search for is as likely to come to me at home as here in Asia. What is it you search for? Romney asked. A man, she said. Section 2 Romney lay in his berth after midnight. All that he had known and won heretofore was gathered together, but did not weigh in the balance against Moira Kelvin. No discrepancy stopped the tumultuous striding of his thoughts after her flying image and the multitude of her sentences. She had amplified her story. Here was a woman brave enough to go out and look for her own. She believed she would know him at once. She believed the woman in her would know before he knew. It's not a matter of place, she had repeated. I don't hasten matters by rounding the world every year or two. I know he might just as well cross my own threshold in Ireland or come to one of the late tiger hunters' households in England. Not a matter of place, but the right time. I think when we are both ready he will come surely. It must be he who is not ready. See how the years go. I am older than you, Sir Romney. These are years on the vine now. I am nearing thirty. I am afraid of this waiting. It sometimes makes me feel sour to wait. I don't want to be sour when he comes. I want one more child, one child from him. I learned something of what it means, oh, just the beginning of that mighty mystery. I would kill him if he did not prove the real lover. No more tiger hunters for me. All boyish things would have to be put away by the man I took for my own. He would have to know what it means to be a father. There's something heroic about that that the world doesn't dream of yet. My lover would have to understand that. At least... He would have to know when I told him. God, how few are the lovers in the world. Romney pondered this again and again in his birth, sentence by sentence. Once she had laughed and said, The man I mean, why his romance is greater to him than his life work. And again she had bent forward, whispering her hand upon his knee, Sometimes I feel as if I were strong enough to be the mother of the new race all this on a little river steamer deep in china the rice lands giving away to the hills as they neared han Kao. moira kelvin had but one theme the lover she would sometime know a frail superb woman burning with a dream romney felt that there was stuff in her to endure fire that would wither most women she had the physique for great emotions. He quite believed she was capable of killing the man who failed her. He sensed something of her deadly horror in the mistake she had once made. She was different now from the girl wife of that patient English sportsman. There are analogies in nature about this killing of the male, she had said. Look at the fate of the bee whom the queen crowns king in their flight. The hours had passed magically. It was he who had risen first. He was afraid of the woman, afraid as he had never been before, of some intrinsic lacking of his own. He felt at times that his own presence had nothing to do with her ideal, that she was merely telling her story as she might have done to some woman companion. Then there were other moments of personal relation, as if she felt from the first the power she possessed for him, 
that she was interested in making it greater, that she loved the use of her power in his arousing, even that he might be or become something of this solar being she dreamed of. Always with her was the feeling that she was not interpreting herself exactly, some histrionic weakness, that she was carried away in the ardor of her impulses, that she acted perfectly the moment, but was not exactly that. Romney hated the logic of the male mind that persistently brought him this observation. They were together the next afternoon at Long's Truths, pyramids by the river a little table in the bamboo clumps with the most famous tea of the empire two white butterflies were whirling together persistently near moira kelvin's eyes followed them dreamily romney said they make me think of the states little common kid day butterflies i don't know as i ever saw them before in china they are around the world she answered they are always where i am because i see them always too like bluebirds and always silent like bluebirds i see them and all well-paired things once in ireland in the fall of the year i found a cocoon a very large and different one it was on an old lilac tree near the bedroom window where i slept as a child the silk was grey-brown a filmy weave like a dress my mother wore as i first remember I loved her terribly in that dress. All the moths, I was telling you, I broke the branch and took the cocoon to the room. Then there was a night in the following June when I happened to be home for a few days. It was a misty, windless evening of endless twilight. Great purple mists came up and breathed upon the earth and made it and melted into the holy breath that hung over the grove of copper beeches i am hungry and thirsty to-day sir romney or i would not talk like this sometimes nature maddens me but i was telling you of that june night there was a rustle in the corner and i ran from the little room that house was full of ghosts to me and there seemed no love in the world only loneliness and twilight my heart streaming its torrent upward and outward but seeming to touch no living thing I laughed at myself for being frightened by a little rustle and went back into the room. I saw a great gray moth at the window screen, and then I remembered and ran to the desk where I had left the cocoon. The whole branch had fallen, and I got the picture of the birth of a winged thing there in the shadows. The moth itself was on the screen, a gleaming gray creation with a light of its own about it, the light of the fairy world which i remembered from a child the wings were whirring silently the still strange creature poised for flight in the night and held by this man-made screen at the end of each feathered antenna was a pendant cross i tried to open the screen but it was old like all of the things of that house and i ran to find a servant when i returned the moth was not alone its own had come to it through the twilight answering some cry we are too coarse to hear they were there together a mystic pair of wonderful gray mates one on the outside of the screen one in the room i could not wait for the servant but cut a door in the wire with a rough bronze paper cutter and away they flew together it was her theme all that day romney dwelt in her power she gilded his world he found that his relation to her was that of servitude she commanded imperiously dictating what they should say where they should go what they should eat and drink yet he was glad for this had never happened before it did not occur to him that this mysterious establishment of their relation was fatal to the real romance each minute forged him anew she was great and glowing he did not know that all the old ideals of wooing and winning that the world has come up through were impossible with her vaguely and darkly the hope formed that time might change something that the luck of a white man in asia might come to his aid romney was less the mere crude male than most men he had intuitions visions deep yearnings answered to very little of the leveling dominance of the trade mind but on the very points that he excelled she chose to master him 
it was as if he had been provinced in asia and she had come from all the earth his thought of her to-day was not the thought of yesterday it did not dawn upon him that her changes might not be moodiness or incoherence but the very width of her orbit and splendour of her diffusion there was at longstruth's a chinese boy who served them he seemed to enter into their thought of the little delicacies he had some english which romney chose to use for a time but there came a moment of late afternoon when a matter of service required explicit information and romney administered it in chinese excusing himself as he took his attention for a moment from the woman he turned back to her to find a new interest in her eyes tell me about yourself she said suddenly you must have come to china as a child to speak like that no i have been here only four years three years in india before that my ways have not been interesting since you came they have all been cheapened i see i have wasted my time now that is a good saying thank you sometimes sir romney you are very attractive it is quite true the things that interested men here i mean the americans and english the big exploiters have not held me long though i have worked with them and for them always the different the more hidden things called me until yesterday i thought i was at least doing decently well but i see you have somehow touched the core of things i've been puttering at least it is good not to be considered either wicked or insane she answered i usually draw that i wonder that you like my things sometimes i have even felt myself that i am a little mad the first time that came to me was in england the first year after the tiger it was a summer sunday morning the earth was risen in beauty birds singing as they only sing in the sun mists that follow a night of rain it was a seething of bird song of colour and fragrance just a year after the tiger as i listened the fury of longing that i live with came upon me in high tide and then in the midst of it i heard the sound of church bells from the village it was like a grey cloud an evil odour a catarrhal voice spectres of the english sabbath people stifled me for days after that but i talk and talk and i want your story now see we have been together all day and some of yesterday and you have listened i am not through listening so much of me was asleep before yesterday she smiled swiftly at him you shall not escape now that you are so good see the night is coming everything is here long's truths is worth coming up the river for china is sweeter here and undefiled i would be hideously lonely without you and you have not told me who and what you are why listen i don't often ask a man to talk about himself i get the force of that it's only that what i have is drab and young i would have made it different had i known you were coming sir romney there's a pull about you you do not diminish oh i must know all about you now i hear and obey he said section three romney was a bit taller than necessary with a beaked nose and a head that bowed naturally when he turned from the side and looked up at you smilingly it was a face you were apt to remember the mannerism was so peculiarly his own when he was interested or amused that he did not know of it there was nothing about him unless it was the depth of calmness in his eyes to denote other than a sophisticated white man travelling in a state of comfort if not plenty a clean-faced white-toothed american of twenty-seven a good mouth a good brow straight lean shoulders and a long dark hand nothing striking or exceptional except the beaked nose and possibly the depth of calmness in his eyes something of poise and power in that i came out here seven years ago from california he said a tender-chested young student from palo alto with book sanskrit 
I had a post with an American consul in one of the second towns of Bengal. I used to write letters in Bengali for him. He had a rice brewery on the side and couldn't write English. He used to chew tobacco and promote his business, swearing that rice beer was more delectable than English ale and experimenting in keg-making with the native woods. It hurt him to have to import kegs. The English didn't like him, and he had an incessant war on. It kept him fit, this battling. The East could not smother his energy. But I took other posts and was presently touching the skirts of Mother China. She challenged me more than India had done. I really got the call from her one morning on the Pearl River, a little above Canton. It was a shimmering day, the big rice lands on either side, some rice we saw yesterday, though we're a bit far north. There was a glitter about that day as the sun rose. I seem to remember this now more than then. You always put an atmosphere to your stories, the kind of day or night. Nature means things to you. I knew right there that day that I had left India for good. That was four years ago. China needed me, and I was to spare. All hitherto was mere preparation for a life in the East, more real. You see, the English have everything in India. The higher a man climbs, the more he feels the ordering English hand. It doesn't make any difference if he likes it or not. I was merely carrying a little commercial message up the Pearl River that morning. China touched me, kind of opened up to me then and there the big deviltry, the big cunning, the big beauty in the world, above the dollar sign and the designation of the British pound. I remember the saffron legs of my boatman and his sing-song intonation as he hailed some naked neighbor in a passing junk. I began to get the quality of the voices of the Chinese then, as I had heard the native Bengali three years before, a kind of lust in my heart to know what they were saying, and why they said it. I threw up my job and traveled north. I studied long in Shanghai, long, that is, about two years. Academic Sanskrit didn't help then. I had to get a new neck. I learned the basic Chinese and then began to put on the flourishes of the provinces. I didn't do this with the idea of commanding big money, but I began to make money. You see, I was getting something that only eight or ten Americans have. I wanted more than the language. I wanted the working of the Oriental mind. The only clue to that is religion. I had studied a lot with the Hindu boys in Bengal. That's what they do best. Study, gather in, mull over, meditate, but bolt at the idea of action. I was American enough to want to make some of this study stuff come true but that in India was a valuable period of mental accretion. It wasn't living here in the East that made me, in a sense, familiar with the native mind. It was the sacred writings of China, India, and Palestine. In Shanghai and later in Peking, I hobnobbed with the young literati, a different class from the Indian students, very interesting men who prepare themselves almost cosmically to enter local politics. I saw that China had always pulled me strangely. Meeting the boys here recalled to me how interested I had been in the Chinese students at Palo Alto. It was from a Chinese at college that I began to get a real conception of the historic and esoteric figure of Jesus, the man we make a religion of in the States. Over here, the steady-going literature of the best minds is never far from the utterances of the mystics and the prophets. I met them all from Patanjali to Paracelsus and volumes of magic. The spiritual properties of medicine, studies of the stars that none would scoff at so breezily as the modern astronomers of Europe and America. More or less at this time I was in touch with Americans in China who were making money. I lived a double life, holding fast to the commercial world and keeping secret my enthusiasm for matters of mysticism. This recreation kept me from getting stale and tainted. The white man over here plays a lot, and he drinks too much at his play. 
perhaps i'm getting too diffused in this story but i rather wanted you to understand since i began the idea that drove me to become powerful in the native mind and at the same time to hold a grip on the west i was disinclined to the poverty of the earth and at the same time unwilling to release my grip on certain ideas of heaven you see all real mysticism is out of the east there was only one way to make good on this training and the chinese knows how the hindu doesn't it's to keep god and man separate to keep the left hand for the spirit of things and the right for matter and the world i had a gift in the beginning for these languages i wouldn't have gotten them without that i wouldn't have had the urge without it it was that lust to know what the river men were saying and not only that but to know why they said these things a man might learn chinese in a certain number of months but he can't learn the feel of the people without a call to them finding that i had mastered something i proceeded to forget it that means that the processes began to work automatically i had learned to think in chinese that's the truth so much so that the english and american training i had known began to take on the same sense of distance and novelty that they would from the standpoint of a cosmopolitan chinese for instance you and the yellow rug even before you spoke appeared to me in a kind of haze of romance he smiled at her romney was himself for the first time in her presence because he saw that his story was making her inclined to him pleasantly meanwhile he added i had ceased to be a boy in certain ways and i had come into a bodily health and strength that i never knew as a boy i had learned to wait and i had learned how to laugh that is much moira kelvin said then romney realized perhaps it was something of premonition that what he said was not quite as exact as it would have been before meeting her perhaps it is too much he replied quickly i would have said it without qualification before before yesterday i only mean in men matters perhaps i have learned how to wait and how to laugh all over again in the things that are nearer the heart i was only talking about the pressures that the world put on a man perhaps i have not put away boyish things that pertain to a man's relation with women his woman that's an arcanum to me arcanums call you don't they sir romney she asked he saw the gleam of her eyes and teeth in the purple dusk something as they call you i think i have never known the sheer excitement of a human presence such as you have brought to me it's because i can lose myself in you china has a new atmosphere when i'm with you i am interested i like your praise her voice came lingeringly to him you are not so young as i thought she went on and yet you are young you are still preparing and yet you have passed the multitudes of men oh so far presently i began to see the new birth of china it became clearer and clearer as i learned more of the native mind now that i think of it this new birth which is not yet consummated is like the grey glistening moth of your irish house that lay in the desk through the long winter all that the usual white man sees even now is the weathered rusty chrysalis of the old but i see the wings they are still pinned the body is moist and craving but it looks great and good to me i met some of the young men who are ready to give their lives for it a kind of inspired group of young men like hugo's group that nearly became famous and there is one american whom i was honored to meet oh just recently my story is rapidly getting up to date this american a hunchback and a prophet has given himself to old mother china he dreams about the peace that is ahead for the world and his dreams are straight as the hammer to the anvil because he has no sentiment knows all about war even the cleansing of war has written a textbook on military tactics which is the biggest and newest thing in american and british camps yet a dreamer about peace her face was close to his in the dusk a yearning in her eyes that shook his heart a chill went through him because this yearning was not for him he saw that he had touched her in the centre of her mysterious being saw that a man with a dream was more to her than any man's action tell me more she whispered 
nifton bend have you too heard of him not until now is that the hunchback's name yes i only saw him for about ten minutes it was in peking a year ago the strangest saddest and longest face in the world it looks up at you for he is maimed i could not speak when he first looked up at me something leaped in my chest i wanted to put my arms about him and lead him to a chair it wouldn't do to tell that impulse only to a woman the name of nifton bend was repeating in my mind it was in a room of a native professor's house in the congru section of peking there were students about but all became hushed with the hunchback's presence cushions were brought and we sat down around him i remembered his name in connection with the military textbook now that came with a jump he was young and yet long ago i had read another book of his which until he was here before me i had not related to the author of the textbook it was during the college days in california when that other book came to me and i loved the chinese setting the book itself i did not remember it was half a story half a fairy tale but from it the spirit of china had come to me something related to the emerging of the great gray moth this was only the beginning of recollections i had heard this man spoken of as the spirit of young china as the organizer and leader of the new chinese army as a repressor of the japanese influence this frail and broken body seemed in the extravagance of my thoughts of that moment to hold the future of the empire i saw him somehow as the embodiment of the depth and genius of the yellow race they called him the general he was looking at me with a dead expressionless gaze an instant before his eyes had been burning and there had been a smile on the woman mouth of him only the pale angular jaw and the narrow temples had not changed i was startled at his look his head made me think of a wolfhound that long ironed head it was not until normal consciousness and the smile returned that i realized that his lapse of expression meant that he was seeing into me that i had been appraised body and soul romney talked coldly now he felt the entire passion of the woman turned from his own story that he had touched something that took her farther from himself if nearer to her dream he caught a glimpse of what it would mean to hold the heart of this woman in all its power it was like romney to make as much as possible now of the opposing influence yet he hurried through nifton ben's eyes were lingering warmly upon me again i felt zeal for service under him but i was tied up for the time being yes it was as if i had found a master in coming into his presence i had touched the inner circle he spoke of china and japan a low uninflected english and then of america how he had left her because there was no play of his powers in america how the states seemed to him tranced in trifles yet how he loved the states presently he said that we were destined to meet again and i knew that the audience was finished where is he now moira kelvin asked in peking at least he is never far from the centre of things and that is peking they were silent some time and then the woman spoke you have told me a story of yourself by talking about china and another man take me back to the hotel sir romney i will see you to-morrow come to me at noon if you like it has been a good day thanks to you i am glad to know you better and better it sounds cold but perhaps some time you will know what that means i am a little mad to-night i seem to feel old china in her new birth moist and craving like the big gray moth her mate not yet come and this hunchback whom you are destined to meet again section four it was a whirlwind fortnight at hankow romney was game rather big game for a questing beauty a wing around the world his soul had been asleep to her kind of magic she touched him awake his education and many attitudes towards life were torn down and rebuilt there was a furious lover in the man and serious weaknesses that had never been tested before 
though he did not acknowledge and perhaps was not aware of the fact he had been in his own way a terrific worker the passions of his life in a single day had been turned from his tasks to morira kelvin she had to be a rather splendid creature to take gracefully the full tumult from such a man's heart but this was her genius romney's woman matters heretofore had been sundry and discursive she took his all and was not filled no other pressure could be brought to bear upon a man to make him greater to make him surpass himself than an encounter with a woman who could contain him at his highest force and still have an aching void to spare moira kelvin was thirty years old in full bloom trusting nothing under the sun but her own heart whether it was mania or the excellence of her evolution her conviction remained upstanding that there was one man somewhere who could fully awaken her she was without laws and without fears but she would have considered it the most vulgar form of failure to give herself to a man who called her only in part she was in the height of her power and modern enough to wish to know a man well before she revealed to him more than the usual arts of woman her one great mistake had been made at the end of girlhood in the case of the tiger hunter she held her body and her beauty even more sacred now because of that failure yet she looked into the faces of men everywhere any man brave enough could have his chance romney made the most of his for hours on their last day together romney could not speak he looked long into her face from time to time until it turned into a mist before his eyes or other shadowy faces passed before it he could see nothing beyond her but his own death and he knew enough to realize there could not be much help in that considering his present frame of mind they were at long's truths a sultry evening she was tender and tyrannical in turn we are not enemies she said i have been no more to you than you have called i know you are not holding that ancient balderdash that i lured you on i have never from the first day kept from you my conviction that the one had not been found in sir romney and yet you were more to me than i thought at first why not take the full honour of that now you are going away he said dully it is a mercy to you though i am not merciful if you were a fool like most men you would think me a devil i suppose men who are not big enough to make good with a woman call her a devil or a vampire she laughed he shook his head he had lost his sense of humour for the time i'm not making any mistake about you i have been away about world matters like most men the women we meet usually call us to be less than we are rather than more men have made women that way she said quickly the way doesn't matter that's what happens or at least men think so and fail to get on the ground where even an average woman is at her best but it's not generalities for me i perceived myself lost in you i loved from the first the great open nature which you drew from mates in everything your whole creativeness lost in the one subject your whole power and reason for being love when i came to you i seemed to come into my own country i did not seek you i was happy enough in the old i looked bleak and blind to myself before your coming oh i praise you right enough only it's hard damned hard to give up you will be tremendous for some woman she whispered let me tell you there was one day when i rocked before you to think i could diminish after that he said slowly his voice chilled her you have said it all sir romney we did not seek this thing at least i had no wish to hurt you i do not play in these great matters some have thought otherwise but i do not play you would not have known me an hour if you had not been worth knowing i have ceased to be worth knowing then only to-day that is not kind sir romney you are less than yourself to say that we have been much together if you are hurt by this it is because you are less than i think you are hurt i mean enduringly hurt of course now but constructively you will not die perhaps you will not break training seriously 
listen do you think i fail to know what will happen to you if you make the best of this you will be a greater lover for some other woman she will have to be a greater woman to call you you will know her more in the first hour because of these days with me you will be less apt to make the one hideous mistake which men and women make in the world that of choosing the wrong mate you will be a quester because of these days with me there's something precious about that if there is but one woman in the world for me as you say there is but one man for you then why is it that i want you so this is your initiation mine was more sordid and revolting with the tiger hunter i am your awakener you think i am everything because i am older deeper in the world of love demanding so much thinking so much of these things remember this there is no such thing as the triangle among real people mark the woman as common-minded who is in doubt between two men whom she knows well all shuffling and experimenting is the cause of misery in the world the higher the soul of a man or woman the more essential is the voice the hand of one any key will fit common locks as for you you were held in your work all the natural fury of you was compressed in the gray and the silence of mere men things you were like a sleeping prince sir romney i but break the enchantment and look into your face as your eyes open and say sorrowfully no it is not he and pass on moira calvin you pass on you would not want me to take less than i dream of but i love you i never said it before i have no place to put this great thing that you have called it doesn't come back to me it's got all of me it leaves me so much less than alive when you pass on he smiled at her sounds weak and pleady i don't mean it that way i want nothing of pity of course pity that would be obscene i'm not making a picture of the heart bereft this is no doom song to a gracious lady only knowing you is an insult to the rest of the world her slim hand darted out to him for a moment his voice choked the touch of her was like a greater self he was tortured with a vision of what it would mean to have all of this woman to command her tenderness utterly her bestowals the full deep look of woman to man the night and day presence the child she dreamed of this woman lovely as a golden cloud he trembled and his head turned away her face came around to his romney she whispered it isn't nearly so easy as it would be if you were less a man oh don't you see that i would have had the heart of a girl and pitied you and thought it love you're enough to make that except for the life i learned in england now it's the one covenant why the man i want i'll do the winning i would bring the fight to him nothing could stand between us i could be saint or wanton you don't know me you would not want half of me you could only want that part of me you are able to command perhaps as that hunchback said to you we shall meet again i feel that you are a big fellow brave and quiet and generous that you have the stuff to make a lover the real lover must be a bit of a mystic and you have that but not now and i must go on see how i have stayed romney stared hard at her a moment and then beyond it was all black a depth of bamboo clumps like a jungle over her bent left shoulder he saw his end in that blackness she was light and power and beauty and art a group of waiting girls that were playing the vigna behind the lattice by the bank of the river it was like the slow song of nightingales the scent of roses passed between them like a spirit hand her face was nearer the warm scent of her was in his nostrils and power came to him that he had not known at all that day romney spoke don't think of me as holding you i love you too much for that how easy to say that after once it is spoken i have nothing but praise and gladness to give you yes you have stayed that i might be with you that i might have my full chance i know what you mean by its being worth death and what a man he would be to command your heart once even and live on afterward 
no i wouldn't hold you i wouldn't cry out i would hold you by sheer love for me but i am not great enough for that i would cry out if you came to my arms but they are not magnetic enough i have had my chance i know what a woman is forgive me if i disagree about there being another for me i'm afraid there isn't because i've known you his voice became very soft you'll feel it he added you'll feel it following you around a man's love for you mine i win to know what i know tonight and when you find him know that i drink his health i could do that devoutly i've had your baggage taken to the boat the launch will call here for you in a few minutes i think i think you are not a woman at all but an immortal you see i cannot suffer thinking of you that way romney yes romney no one is watching i would not care if they were put your head a moment on my breast ah and now upon my knee dear boy romney i am blind i almost hate to go don't let me stay will you ah kiss me once lips ice cold once it's just passion romney i hate myself don't let me stay tonight once they were standing she had not spoken for long the launch was waiting i want something that you have on something of yours he managed to say steadily she unfastened her cloak gave it to him to hold took off the waist she wore a bit of gold rose chiffon that he could cover in his palm then she put on her cloak again he helped her into the launch her bowed head turned to him a moment and she covered her eyes the launch sputtered away romney went back to the seat near the bamboo thicket the scent of roses wavered past and the music of the vina came in to him romney drank once he raised his head it was her steamer passing down the river hours afterwards he was drinking there alone toward morning long's truth himself came and sat down but the american did not speak neither was he drunk in the least end of section 24 chapter 1 prologue hand cow the yellow rug woman from the last ditch by will l comfort Section 25 of 1916, First Chapters Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryce By. 1916, First Chapters Collection by Various. Section 25, Anne's Wedding by Isla M. Mullins. "'Wedding finery, girls, wedding finery!' cried Anne Carter, tripping up the front steps with a lightness that told of supple, much-used muscles in her tall, well-rounded figure, and with sparkling eyes that proclaimed unmistakably sudden climax and womanly happiness. Her sisters, May and Jean, May and Jean as she come to call the two inseparables, girls of nineteen and twenty, sprang at once from the step where they sat talking and cried, "'Stop, Anne, and tell us about it.' The radiant girl fluttered aloft a letter bearing English stamping and addressed in a bold, even handwriting, which the other girls had no trouble in identifying, while the dancing feet paused long enough for her to turn and cry again. Wedding finery! I must get at it! I have never let myself think about it even, for fear it would just run away with me, and I would forget to eat, then vanish into thin air before the time really came. And a playfully tragic shadow dominated the sparkling gray-blue eyes for an instant only to release them again to the highlights of joy. Oh, girls, hurry! We must begin this minute. Where's mother? She flew on then through the broad hallway with all the impetuosity of a child of ten, this young maiden of twenty-two with a gleaming ring on the engagement finger and matronly dreams swaying her thoughts full four years. For Anne Carter and Donald Thornton had really loved each other since she was fifteen and he seventeen, but it had taken them several years to find it out, which was all the better for both, and then there had been four years more during which Donald had been working his way up in his father's business, an international one, 
including England and America in its activities. I don't want father to have to support me, don't you know, when I marry, he had said to Anne. Of course, the home is waiting for us, and father longing to have you there, but, well, when I set up an establishment, even if father is there, I don't want him to meet the bills. And so Anne had waited patiently until Donald had made good in the business world and was able to do his part in maintaining the ancestral home of his English mother, with titled antecedents in adequate style and dignity. This had been much more easily and quickly accomplished because all the youth's training had been with reference to the business he was to assume. This training had included two years in a little Alabama town at a college near his American grandparents, for his father had been of the South and he wished the boy to know and love it. There is a strongest bond between the two, and love and loyalty to his father had spurred the young man onto rapid grasp of the business almost as urgently as the sweet call across the water from the southern girl to whom he had plighted his faith. Now word had come from him that a date must be set as early as possible for the marriage. Anne found mother without difficulty, for this tale belongs to a period when mothers were always easily found. Her serene face, full of the home repose of two decades ago, bent above a bit of sewing in her own room, and was instantly lifted, smiling and ready at Anne's step. One revealing glance between the two, and throwing her lithe figure at mother's feet like the little girl of years before, Anne hid the beaming face in her lap and handed up the letter for mother to read. Somehow there are no words for her message now, and there had never been any secrets between this daughter of the heart and mother instead, who lived under the same roof as members of what had come to be playfully known as the Blossom Shop family. It was in a sense a composite family, but the varying elements were so homogeneous that the pretty title fitted admirably. Mr. Carter, a widower with two girls nine and eleven, and May, had married Mrs. Gray, a widow with one small girl, Jean, of eight, who had, just before the marriage, been healed by skillful surgeons of congenital blindness. Mrs. Gray and little Jean, named Eugene for her father, had supported themselves for years before on Mrs. Gray's old home place next door to the Carters by packing and setting to northern markets flowers from their ample garden, and they had then first termed the old home the Blossom Shop. The place was finally devastated by fire, and an accident to an old truck as their household things were hurriedly moved had revealed a lost will which restored to Jean the fortunate denied her father and brought her into contact with the unknown northern relatives of her father, to whom she and her mother became greatly attached, in spite of strong previous prejudice on both sides. Then the marriage followed, which united mother and child with their dearest friends, the Carters. Anne's letter from Donald was at last read by mother and daughter together. The young cheek pressed close against the older one, and it revealed the fact that some jolly good things had come along unexpectedly in the business, and made immediate plans possible for Donald, and wouldn't Anne please hurry those mysterious preparations brides seemed to have to make and set a day in early spring? It was then just at the close of the Christmas holiday time, a brief space in which to prepare a young southern girl, who thought little about fashions, to present herself in the midst of an old English family and claim a place among them. No wonder she had fluttered bewilderingly when the long-looked-for moment really came and it was only the mother instead who could have so quickly turned her thought into orderly, though still joyful lines. The entire trousseau was not planned on the spot, as was first threatened, but there was a going over of many things between the two, which was a profitable and very precious preliminary. The holiday time meant that May was at home from a Midwest university, where she was taking a course in modern language, for this great university stamping and finishing of the thorough schooling which she had taken in the home college, Jean Carter Gray, the Carter had been inserted when the families combined. Her inseparable companion had not gone with her, for she was taking a year rest before entering a New England college, that her education might be topped off, she would have said, in the native land of her forefathers. Dr. Merton, Uncle Doctor, as the girls had come to call him, and his wife, Jean's Aunt Martha, were there as they always were for Christmas, and last but not least, in some respects, was Merton Gray Carter, the young son of the house, a sturdy boy, some eight years old. He could make more noise than all the rest put together, he would have said himself, and he certainly was not to be left out in any reckoning. So there was a big family council possible, and Anne at once decided there must be tea at the Blossom Shop. This material Blossom Shop, 
which had been built on the site of Mrs. Carter's old home, was a picturesque low building of East Indian architecture, whose sloping roof dropped from its high apex and deep graceful curves to cover generously the broad veranda all around its side, with an upward tilt of the roof again at the quaint pillars. Within there was a wide fireplace for chilly days, the broad chimney on the inner wall for being highly ornamental. The rafters were exposed, the walls were sealed with beautiful southern pine, and deep window ledges were filled with growing indoor plants, while marichelineal roses covered the exterior with riotous bloom and fragrance. The whole family, including Uncle Doctor and Aunt Martha, had given great interest and study to the planning of the building, intended as a playhouse for the growing children, with tennis court and croquet grounds in the rear, and the result was a beautiful and artistic building within and without, which they all loved. It was always the place for joyful events, especially surprise revelations, so when May and Jean plied Anne again with questions, she only put a finger to her lips and gaily announced, Tea in the Blossom Shop, girls, which might mean anything delightful and mysterious. Then she went next for Mammy Sue, and the old colored nurse who had been mother to her and May for a number of years before their father had married Mrs. Gray, and engaged her to come and wait upon the table at tea, instead of the young colored maid who usually performed that service. "'It's for something very special, Mammy Sue,' cried the girl with delighted insinuation, and Mammy Sue was more flattered to be wanted there than had she been bidden to a feast of the highest of the land. "'Bring Uncle Sam, too,' Anne called back, as she started away from the cab into the house again. "'He can pour the water,' she added, knowing that he must have some part in it. Uncle Sam, an old servant of Mrs. Carter, was Mammy Sue's husband of late years, and the two were devoted to all the children of the combined families. Their light, their joy, all they knew of earthly hope and expectation was bound up in them chillin'. As Mr. Carter came in from business, tall, somewhat commanding, with the reserve of the older fatherhood upon him, he too was met by Anne with tea in the blossom shop, father. But eyes which would not seize their sparkle, though lips were very demure, made the father search his daughter's face keenly, while his heart gave a quick startled throb. The thought of Anne's going so far away to make her home was an ever-present regret. He asked no question at the end, but she, with a quick response of tears for something in his face, threw her arms around his neck. That was all between the two, but it told him the news in volumes besides. With the blazing log on the hearth, lighting up the sealed walls, exposing arching rafters, beautifully carved interior chimney and growing window plants and vines, the simplest tea in the blossom shop was always a pretty affair, and this time the table was made gay with quickly improvised favors. Little rolls of Christmas green tissue, ribbon tied in white, each with a clear label marked secret. Well, said Uncle Doctor, who can eat with a secret hanging fire like that? and he set an example which the rest immediately followed, by opening his roll at once to find a small dainty card upon which was written in Anne's clear hand. You are cordially invited to attend the wedding of Anne Carter and Donald Thornton on May 1st, 18... Really, the Mertons, including Merton Gray, were the only ones to be greatly surprised, though Anne's father looked up with a gentle objecting shake of the head over the early date set. Merton Gray said promptly with boyish indignation, who says so? I don't believe it. Is it true, mother? Well, son, she smiled back with determined cheer. I don't think any of us are quite prepared to believe it, but a letter that came this afternoon said some very decisive things. Anne shan't go away across the ocean to live if she does get married. I'm going to run off with her myself before Donald comes for her, said Merton Gray in bragging childish futility against an inevitable. Everybody laughed, and Anne said, Oh, I'll tell you what will happen, Merton Gray. I'm going to pack you in one of my trunks and run off with you. A very pleasing prospect that Merton Gray would like nothing better than such a lark, and in his imagination, holes were already in the top of the trunk for him to breathe through. But he looked up at mother, and then at father, and his bright face was uncertain, then at Anne again, and he did want to be with her always. There was a special bond between him and Anne, she had saved his life, somehow, he had in mind, though she always said with a shadow in her eyes, No, I almost lost it for you by leaving you in your carriage to run downhill into the creek. It was Donald's big dog Rex that saved you. Just how that was did not matter much. 
but Merton Gray knew that Anne had always loved him in a way she did no one else. He did not dream, however, that she had whispered to herself over him many and many a time, my first baby, vaguely knowing that through him she came into womanhood after a terrible travail of anguish and remorse for heedless neglect when he had been left to her care, and only a merciful providence prevented his rolling down the wooded slope back of their home into the swift running creek after spring rains. Uncle Doctor had a special tie with Anne, too, on account of her badness as a child, both agreed, in accordance with the theory that like attracts like, the doctor always added. He sat now, looking earnestly at the girl, as though he could not or not believe that she was so soon to be married and leave them, while Mammy Sue, waiting on a table in a freshly starched dress and white apron and spotless head handkerchief, crumpled suddenly so she could hardly stand, and Uncle Sam, moving around feebly, but proudly to pour the water, shook his head mournfully. Aunt Martha, quick to see that the little announcement party was in a fair way to fall into gloom, came to the rescue by exclaiming, Another blossom shop wedding! It is eight years since ours took place here! And the doctor, reminded of that happy event, the crowning one in his life after years of fruitless longing for Miss Martha Gray, the seemingly unattainable New England spinster, put selfishness out of the way and made merry in a fashion of which he only was capable. When supper was over, Anne went to the kitchen and told the news of her coming marriage to the housemaid and the cook and the cook's daughter, Cahaba, a colored girl who had grown up with the girls and whom Aunt Martha had educated in a southern college for colored girls. She was now teaching in the town, but was always at the Carters to help in any way she could out of school hours. Anne knew they were all very interested to hear what had been going on in the Blossom Shop, and she could not deny them the pleasure of sharing her glad expectations. So she told them all, and the hilarity with which it was received here fully made up for any lack of enthusiasm from the family. Oh, Miss Anne, is you really going to be married? And go way off across the ocean? added another. I tell you, that's fine. I bet there won't be another girl in this town while it does that. This last was from the cook, who had no idea what going across the ocean meant, but it was something few folks did that she ever heard about, and, of course, it was something grand. Cahaba did not speak, but her eyes, like big black beads, danced with the inspiration of a sudden hope. She was of the genuine negro type, black as coal, but slender a figure, alert, resourceful, and with a remarkable gift for mimicry. When Anne left, she followed into the hall and whispered, Let me go along as lady's maid. Sure enough, returned Anne, stopping. But what about the teaching? I'll learn more and teach better some day, said Cahaba promptly. We'll see laughed Anne as she went on, and, thinking it over as she went, she decided that it would be fine, sure enough. Kaba was so sensible and so gentle and really refined with her schooling, but it was not a matter that held her thought just then with any seriousness. Next day, Saturday, she was in a pantry a moment hunting a tea cake, an old girlish habit. The pantry had an open window on the rear porch, and she heard Kaba's voice in eloquent discourse to somebody. Peeping out, she saw it was the housemaid who was listener. "'You just ought to see Miss Anne's beau,' she was saying. "'He don't look any more like the young fellows around here than a thoroughbred horse does like some rack of bones belonging to poor white trash. He's quality, sure enough. I knew that when I used to see him playing tennis and croquet over there in the blossom shop yard, and he was so straight and looked so high, his head always up, and then so gentlemanly to Miss Anne, though they did fuss something terrible after a while.' Sometimes they'd act just like they didn't know the other was on the earth, but just the same I knew they were watching each other out the corners of their eyes. Then they made a trip across the ocean together. The doctor and Miss Martha took Miss Anne, and he went along at the same time to see his father, and they went to his house and saw his mother's portrait hanging over the mantel in a velvet dress and lace as fine as cobwebs around her throat and hands just like life. And Miss Anne says it does seem like she's there all the time. Mr. Donald and his father love her so. After all that... I just knew they was as sure to marry as tomorrow was to come. When he came back the next year to go to school again, they both seemed so grown up, and Miss Anne was singing to him something beautiful, for you know she's one of those primer donners at singing, and he called on her in the parlor, and they was mighty good friends, I tell you. But Miss Anne says they wasn't thinking about being engaged till long after he went home the last time. I don't know what they was thinking about then. It beats me for he was handsome as a picture by this time, and Miss Anne was growing pretty and pretty every day. But this here love business, there ain't no telling about. 
Anne listened in smiling fascination to this account of her love affair, and the glowing descriptions of Donald especially held her to the spot while tea cakes were forgotten. Cahaba's graphic tongue then turned to the present, and she began strutting about the porch. I tell you, me and Miss Anne are going to be big folks. We won't be speaking to niggers like you when we come home on visits. Why, Miss Anne will be having a cloth of gold dress, and will be trimmed in diamonds all around the bottom and the low neck and the teeny short sleeves, which will show those lovely arms of hers. Then, of course, she'll be having a white satin and will be embroidered in silver, not just tinsel, but real silver, and beautiful pearls as big as butter beans. Then, oh, how we'll train, while she swept across the porch with an imaginary train of prodigious length following her. And I will be putting them all on her, for I'm to go with her as her lady's maid. Then she'll have one of them crowns made of gold and diamonds on her head. You see, in England there are kings and queens, and folks like Miss Anne, that's where quality wears crowns every day. With the advantage of education, she could impress her untutored hearer to the nth degree. Anne, listening, was convulsed by this time, and she exclaimed inwardly, Oh, Cahaba, no amount of schooling can tone down your imagination. Then she slipped away to laugh over it with her mother, Aunt Martha, May, and Jean. With the listening maid taking in and passing on every word from Cahaba, Anne became queen of the household indeed, treated with wonderful deference by servants and with a tender holding close from her loved ones, who were so soon to lose her. End of Section 25 Chapter 1 of Anne's Wedding by Isla M. Mullins.